three GPP side as well as in impact side, and in dash IF for the last uh, 2009. First, yep. we met in a, a Starbucks. I will come back to this one. <laughs> a Starbucks uh, in south of uh, San Francisco in Soma area with Mike Luby actually and John Simmons discussing we want to do the standardization on Dash. So he's going to talk about Dash. As you guys know, Dash uh, this year won an Emmy Award. This is the 10 years of formal standardization or the publications of the first Dash specification. So it's really nice occasion. Thank you very much. Thank Thomas. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm waiting until the slideshow up. Here they are. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope you had a good sleep. Mine was short because I'm chat like I needed to prepare the slide, so uh, I might fall asleep during the day. Hopefully not during the talk. Uh, neither should you. Okay, so um, I was asked by Alex. Uh, thank you for the organization, Alex and Ali, for giving an introduction to MPEG Dash based on this Emmy tutorial. So I pulled together slides, and as always, I have way too many slides that would fit into 33 minutes, but you get the slides and you can always come back. Uh, you have to ask if you want to do it interactive. You can ask me questions in between, so then we just skip some slides, so let's keep it um, as, as informal as possible. Uh, what I have prepared is basically giving a bit of a chronicle uh, matters and anecdotes from how this ha happened, and if you can do this, you know you're getting old, so uh, that's kind of the, the downside of this. I have looked a bit in the core principle of Dash, and basically, I don't think they have been written down anywhere, but uh, basically, what was the idea and what, what still is the idea behind this and, and kind of other design aspects. Um, and then um, I want to look a bit forward what's happening. We have a fifth edition coming out of the MPEG Dash standard, and we're doing in Dash F guidelines V5 that are aligned with this, but different. We have tools. What's next to come uh, quickly on Dash deployments, and uh, thank you at the end. Okay, let's move. Um, so I have my chocolate. I used this uh, 10 years ago. Uh, there's a story behind this. I don't have time to tell it, but if you want to know, come back to this. So a bit of a historical um, background. So basically what was the case in 20, uh, before 2012 or before 29, that there was a starting point of having some proprietary um, solutions uh, to adapt to streaming, but they're all like fragmented. So there was something coming from Adobe, something from Microsoft. Uh, there was uh, also in standards things started, and then basically MPEG tried to um, consolidate this and had a CFP, and basically have a standardized delivery format for adapt to streaming. And the idea was really to provide confidence uh, to the market because it was already. Uh, foreseen that um, this is going to be used in, in different uh, consumer electronic products in different networks and so on. So the confidence to have something like this was basically given by moving into a standardized formats away from uh, several proprietary islands. Okay, so history. Um, and so there was a meeting in 2010 uh, in Dresden which basically finalized the CFP for MPEG Dash. But many people were not there or they were on the way because there was uh, an eruption of a volcano. I don't know if anybody's able to pronounce, I'm not. Uh, and so that basically issued the CFP. And uh, what you see is what was impacted below by the volcano so nobody could travel. Then for the upcoming meeting, the, CF, uh, the uh, proposals were expected and a, a large group of people, which you see here, uh, submitted jointly a proposal that was initially developed in 3GPP um, and then basically found that it was the baseline for what was uh, then later called MPEG Dash. And in the course of one year, and I counted back and I was really surprised when looking at all the pictures, I, I think we met uh, more than 12 times in different places in the world, always for at least one week. Um, and so the first one was basically we issued, I believe, CD um, out of Geneva, out of the first meeting, or it was at, at Guangzhou. But then we had three GP and ad hoc meetings in between, like every month um, in different places, as you can see here. So I think pictures say more than uh, these, these, uh, these names here. Um, and as you see, that was a lot of hard work, right? So this was, for example, in Paris, you see even working in, in the garden. A couple of familiar faces here. Uh, this was the meeting, I believe, in Guangzhou. Um, and 
Um, what you can see also, there's always a different cuisine. So you get used to very different type of food when you travel through the world. There was a 3GPP meeting in Barcelona. We also watched uh, the FC Barcelona. Um, then there were a couple of meetings in Asia, um, and you see, again, exceptionally interesting food. There was a really hard meeting in San Diego uh, at the Cliff House, uh, and I believe the other one is in Berlin at the HHI. Uh, we had a Geneva meeting, and as you can see, also uh, quite intense. Um, and that is the, the final meeting in Torino, um, and what is interesting, for example, Yuri's fashion here, quite interesting. Uh, we had a long table. I think that was the longest table ever. The problem is I was sitting on the tramway, so I had to move all the time when the tram was moving by, because otherwise I would have been hit. Anyways, a couple of uh, anecdotes and memories from, from these meetings. Uh, what was basically the result of this, that we got two specifications out. One was uh, in 3GP. Uh, a technical specification and the impact part one, which is uh, referred to as DASH. And since then, uh, five editions of the DASH part one had been completed. The, the last one, I come back to this later. There's eight parts in the standards, and it's adopted by many outside organizations being referenced as the technology for distribution. What I put along with this, a personal warning, I, I don't recommend to ever repeat a process like this. I don't believe it's, it's sane. It doesn't make sense to travel every month. <laughs> Uh, the pandemic has shown that you can do it differently. So I think we can still work jointly, but we don't have to meet every month in different corners of the world. Um, there is a long list of editions and parts, which you see here, um, that was compiled by Young Kwan recently. Um, you would find um, the different part ones. I added the years when they were published, and you also see the editors. And Probably you find quite many familiar names and faces here in the room. Let me check who is on the list here. Uh, raise your hand. Yeah, I see at least six, seven, eight. Um, so a lot of contribution from many people. Um, I also would like to um, refer to a couple of other remarkable people, standards development, who are not on this list. Sean, Dave Singer. Mark Watson from Netflix and Mike Luby, uh, Harry Pals and Paul Hicks, we did a lot of work on the XML all the time. Uh, Harry passed away a couple of years, unfortunately. Vakar did a lot of work on conformance. And then there were colleagues from DBB uh, and OIPF who early contributed also to make sure that the standards converges. Um, there was a huge amount of Korean people who basically uh, made dash dash, otherwise we would talk about mesh, but for some reasons which I don't understand, but May US people understand, Koreans didn't want to have it called mesh. Kilroy is in the list here. He was a spec editor for something. You will find him, I'm sure. Now here for the dash, for the, 30, for the part three, I believe, he's in, in the list. Uh, Young Kwan and Leonardo, who basically led the projects, and many more, I sure forgot uh, several. Uh, okay, so this is the same slide in uh, nice pictures. I forgot to remove it, so. Okay, so that is all about the anecdotes. Let me check. Anything to add? Iraj, Christian, Mike. Good, let's move. So some fundamentals um, of Dash. So what I, what I put together is here, a list of points uh, which I believe we always use when somebody comes with a new proposal. Uh, the police comes, the, dash, the donor dash police, and basically says, are you fulfilling all of this, right? And if not, go home and work better. So, it, uh, but it, it's, it's something that seems to help in order to basically um, make sure that what we do is stays friendly and, and implementable. So the first thing is, making sure whatever is do is friendly to CDNs and caches. Because from day one, we basically understood that building on CDNs and HTTP delivery is key to basically uh, ensure that you can broadly deploy and get access to as many devices as possible. Uh, keep the server stateless, and that was a significant change in the, uh, back then when streaming was changed from stateless service, uh, from stateful service from RTSP to stateless. 
Um, that means that all of the logic is implemented in the client, so you have client-driven algorithms that create a session and basically then also um, have significant amount of uh, differentiation logic. Um, what we also try is to keep the manifest traffic as small as possible, which means keep the size small and keep the update frequency small. Um, we basically try to completely avoid to defining anything on the uh, encapsulation. So we're carrying ISO-BMFF initially and recently um, it's basically inherited uh, CMF, which is by, by per se compatible with, with the dash segment formats. It was just not uh, early enough documented. So then it's a concept of late binding. I will show this later. Uh, a significant other uh, development that we were not understanding when the specification on standard was initially done, but which is now very important, is to make it work with HTML5 and MSE. Um, so a lot of efforts went into the development of reference tools and production tools around JavaScript and HTML5. Uh, Daniel had a talk yesterday. Very instrumental was Will uh, in moving this forward and making sure that this happens. Um, the conversion with HLS through CMF is very important and everything should work at the same time for life and on demand. So I, I, I believe these are a couple of principles we're trying to uh, maintain and have maintained over, over the years um, that helps to keep this uh, scoped and focused. So a bit more on these issues. So CDN friendly, you have seen this picture probably a uh, hundred times, but it, it's still very uh, much accurate. It, it shows that you have this CDN-friendly approach with stateless servers, and the client, and, or UE here it's called, takes um, the logic in order to combine um, the different pieces and files that are uploaded. And these files are the, what is called, referred to as segments. These segments are downloaded through HTTP, that is the initial design nowadays, uh, there's other transport protocols through broadcast, multicast, HTTP3. Uh, all of those can deliver objects and files, but the, the whole idea is to have uh, yeah, units and entities of files, uh, smaller pieces of files that describe a timeline, and you can uh, access and, and download those individually. Um, let me see. Okay. So I'm moving forward. Uh, this is also an old, old slide, but it's always good to understand as well. So what is specified? Specified are the formats. Uh, not specified is the client. There's a reference client that basically has um, an access part doing all of the functions for downloading. Uh, and then there is a, a downstream functionality, the media engines that basically uh, then can um, decode and render what is downloaded media. There's a data model here that is applied and it basically sh goes into two dimensions. One is a uh, vertical dimension uh, that covers more or less uh, what um, media is offered. So you can offer video, audio uh, in different languages. There can be multiple codecs. I have a bit more later on this. Uh, each of those can be offered in different variants, uh, representations, typically in different bit rates. Um, and then you have a sequential functionality that you basically can uh, add period after period, allowing to splice content that is independently generated, uh, that might come from different networks, from different servers. Um, a typical example is obviously when you do something like add insertion, where you have a main program and you get content generated from elsewhere. So this specific parts are mapped into a dash data model and expressed in XML. Um, I will not read XML, obviously, uh, but what you can see here is that the, the data model is represented in the XML from a level of what is called a MPD, media presentation description, and breaks down then through the periods, adaptation sets, representations, and smaller units, um, the units, the smallest units for accessibility are segments, but even those can be subdivided. Um, okay, so a bit of a, an idea for the dash manifest for life, so a bit of text here, but what, what was some of the design aspects here? Well, there's an issue for reducing latency um, and, and basically also reduction of the segment duration without losing scalability. Um, but um, interesting comparison to HLS, and that was known back then from day one. HLS basically, um, in the manifest, always just documents what is available on the server and only provides information on what is on the past. 
So basically, only when a segment is, the segments are published and then documented in the manifest. Uh, that has basic consequences. Um, you need to basically always ask for a new manifest before you download a segment. And then you basically download a full manifest uh, for each segment. That can grow over time due to lists. The manifest needs to be parsed and processed at every request. And for every new segment, you also need to write a new manifest on the server. So Dash, the MPD is expressing this differently. It basically says, um, I give information of the past and also permits that something will be true also in the future. Um, and if you basically use it properly, you can mitigate basically all of the above. You can reduce the uplink traffic. You don't have to write on the server. Only in unforeseen uh, events, basically, you need to do um, some functions. There are a couple of functionalities that support this. Um, I come back to this um, in a bit. So we have two segment addressing, uh, several segment addressing modes. There's a list mode that is basically a replication with HLS does. We not recommend to use it for the purpose of not growing the manifest because if you have a 24 seven, that list can get very long. There's an obviously tricks to move the list somewhere else, but much easier is to keep uh, something like this template here where you just keep um, the ability that there is a, an agreement that you increase the numbers by one for every segment. Um, and you also have an agreement on the duration of the segment. And that basically is used by server and client to produce content and to request content. Um, so th th there's a bit of a model here that is uh, quite detailed to explain. But let me just uh, spend uh, 30 seconds on this one. So basically, you get an MPD. Uh, is published and you promise something which is a uh, minimum update period. And as long as the MPD is on the server, um, it basically holds. Then a client downloads the MPD at a specific point in time and uses this as the information. So when the client downloads, it basically at a specific point in time, it understands that this MPD is valid for now and also for the minimum update period into the future in terms of media time. So it does some computation and it figures out, ah, I know that segment one, two, three, and four will be produced or are produced. And it also understands that only segment one and two are produced and available on the server. Segment three will come at a later time and segment four will come yet at a later time. So that promise is given and the server obviously needs to make sure to fulfill these promises. Otherwise, the client does construction of URLs that are actually never being produced. And if you move forward, you can now basically start playback. There's a suggested presentation delay. You can also do it on a client. You have a playout schedule. And then over time, basically, these promises get valid and you request segments. And then you have also a time shift buffer. So some of these promises also now are removed. The segments are no longer available so or not promised. So they're removed. So the client takes care of this. And then there's a specific, and, and then basically there's another um, validation by the client to check is what I'm doing still correct? Because you were only promised up to a certain point in time. Client rechecks and figures out the MPD is still the same, so it knows my promises hold also for the future. So you're basically just revalidating that the MPD hasn't changed. And if this has happened, not happened, you continue going with this pattern. If it has changed, you get a new MPD, and that MPD is then processed. And you might, for example, know, ah, oh, I'm getting to the end. So I'm, I'm running towards the end of the period. So this is basically the principle of moving this forward. Um, and so the advantage is that you, you'd never have to write a new MPD unless you have to do something uh, on the server and change it. And the client basically just revalidates, is it still the same? And if this is the running in sync, there's also an advanced client that basically now uses um, what is called the inbound events. And you can add an MPD validity expiration here that is expressed in this uh, environment. And then you also have, together with this, typically the segment timeline processing. So this is a slide here you can digest for yourself later. But here, you even reduce the, um, the request frequency for MPDs because you now rely that somebody inbound in the stream tells you when something has changed or the validity of your MPD expires. So now clients basically parse the segments in band and basically get this notification. Um, the benefit is to reduce the amount of traffic even further, but obviously it requires a client to do some parsing of the segments and not all clients implement this. So um, 
it's, it's something that we have different deployments and we're aware of this. Some people criticize that there are multiple options, but I believe that was just a choice that was taken. Um, kindly enough also, I'm using some slides from uh, Nicola. Thank you very much, they're very nice. We also have started to have hybrid manifest. Uh, interestingly, you can run numbers and segment timeline in parallel. The advantage is um, that you have very often alignment issues between audio and video. So if you use a segment timeline, it might grow significantly. So there is a benefit to basically run uh, one media type on numbers, the other one on segment timeline. Um, and that has been proven to reduce the size of the manifest significantly as well. Uh, we have one other method, which is uh, the on-demand addressing that allows basically to use byte range requests quite quickly. Uh, that was instrumental also. Mike Louie uh, and Mark Watson did a lot of work of optimizing then request scaling for this purpose because you have a lot of information at the client which you can use to map out your requests. There's the functionality of late binding which allows you to basically uh, offer different uh, pieces of content individually and the client can combine without having to do multiplexing on the server. Also very cache friendly. Um, obviously increases the amount of requests that you have to send by the fa typically two because two media but it's uh, significantly better off uh, from a cache management point of view. And then there is a detailed multi-track model that is described that basically allows you to offer in one MPD different content options so you basically can say this is my left or right go my home in a way um, and then you can offer this in different codecs you can offer this in different languages uh, in different representations. So there's a full model defined that is uh, then moved forward. Okay, so I have a bit of details in the, on the timing model across period. In the interest of time, I'm gonna skip most of this, but basically what I'm saying is um, a sequ we had for a long time some discussion sequence of periods, um, how exactly is this working? And we have tried to solve this over the last edition in order to make sure there's a very explicit uh, requirement on how you can sequence periods but the basic idea is that periods are the master timeline of the MPD and the media just needs to be um, mapped into this master timeline. That results in overlaps and potential gaps at period boundaries. Uh, we worked a lot with our DashGS implementations for example to make sure that we can overcome these issues but also that we can offer content that basically meets these boundary conditions well. Um, and so you need to understand, for example, how an MSC works, what you can overwrite, how you can uh, compensate gaps, how you can basically compensate overlaps, and I believe that has made it into the fifth edition. Um, so there's some restrictions now, as I said, that comes later. So a quick overview of what we do in the fifth edition. Um, there is uh, here now a, a couple of points, and I only will talk about three. The rest I refer to uh, Daniel, Zach, Iraj, Alex, and I, you can talk to them. There's a dash profile for CMF content. There's a concept of referred to as resynchronization. Um, then there's MPD patching. I believe Daniel talked about this yesterday already. There's a client processing model for event streams. We have done extensions for robustness, for content protection and robustness uh, levels in, uh, in, in output protection. And then there's some bandwidth signaling as well. The dash profile for CMF content. So what it does, it basically documents the obvious and it basically says that how the dash uh, MPD functionalities and segment formats relate to CMF. So it maps a CMF header to an initialization segment, it maps segments, it maps fragments, and so on and so on. So what you see here in this data model, you have the dash concepts here and above you have the CMF objects. And so it, it documents and you have a profile which basically ensures for the for the client that this is the truth and you can basically now operate on your CMF logic in the device if you have a CMF uh, media pipeline implemented they can use a dash access client and basically operate uh, straightforward. So this constraint document the obvious but we also have constrained the signaling for example making sure that what is in the in the ISO BMFF CMF uh, container format is just replicated onto the MPD so that there's no contradiction to those requirements. Um, there is requirements and how you can basically map this into timing sequences. And also beyond what CMF specifies is how you can have multi-period CMF content being, um, being spliced. So there's some details here. Um, what basically we know is by doing this, we have done the work to make this MSC and DashJS compatible. 
as a functionality referred to as resync, the basic idea here is to document what is uh, done in chunking, in low latency chunking into the manifest and give the client an idea that this is a chunked content and they have some resynchronization opportunities in the middle of the, the segments. And you might use this for different purposes, for example, uh, you might use this for faster access, you might use this if you have error conditions for switching and so on and so on. Um, so in, it basically um, gives you this uh, distance of resync points, uh, basically the duration of the segments. And there's different variants of this. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into the details. This is the compact uh, dash MPD representation. You just have a, an element that goes on top of the regular representation to give you more internal information about what you find in this segments. Um, here are a couple of use cases from uh, low latency stream with fast access, faster channel acquisition, and so on. There's updates to content protection in the fifth edition uh, to add robustness levels and to do a compact presentation by referencing. Uh, so you can talk to Alex about this one. Fifth edition, quick dash AF. So going back into anecdotes, after the dash specification MPEG was completed, um, there was a desire to how can we help to move this into the markets. And the, the question is, what do we need? So in MPEG, there were development of reference tools. So we wanted to basically make sure that we address the urgent needs of the industry. So the, the first real work was to define a small subset of profile and make sure that this profile gets deployable, implemented, we have all the test material. And a lot of members committed to this and that basically was the foundation of this and it's continuously worked as to promote the adoption of MPEG Dash as an industry standard. So you see, um, this has grown to work with a lot of uh, outside organizations as basically the shopping point, uh, the uh, consulting point for organizations. And we have uh, many members, we are uh, very excited to add more members at any point in time. Um, we operate in a pretty uh, lean, agile, and flexible and open manner um, with predominantly calls. We have meetings typically once or twice a year. That was cancer due pandemic. We have an in-top group. It's not called technical group, but it's interoperability because we're not writing specifications per se. We're trying to support interoperability. This is in different task forces uh, for different aspects. Some of the task force leaders are here as well. We also do a promotion working group and Ali and Christian are leading the ac academic track which keeps also contact to the academics. One of the work right now happening is the development of a, uh, the, the next version of guidelines. So we've published guidelines in a single document which got pretty unmanageable. So we basically decided to go to V5. It's a multi-part document to also make sure that we can uh, publish more agile. What is documented in this interoperability guidelines is basically mostly the interoperability between a server and a client. There's a couple of other specifications in Dash, so that's the IOP guidelines here. And we basically uh, refer quite significantly to what is the reference playback platform MSC and CTA Wave. Um, and then uh, we basically have an application client through Dash.js as a reference model. So there's many other clients, but the reference is Dash.js. We also have specifications, uh, uh, ad chunk specifications, for example, on a backend content protection exchange interface. We have an interest interface, Rufal is here. He's leading this. So basically, how can you interest consistently content into a, um, an MPD generation workflow and into a CDN? Um, and we, we heavily rely on CMF, as said. So there's 12 parts now. Um, of these 12 parts, five are already on our web page. Uh, four of them are well prepared and should be published shortly. The other uh, need to basically be uh, advanced. They also rely on the fifth edition to some extent. So quite some, some work. Um, there's some highlights coming out of this. One was the low latency chunking. Uh, you have seen this before. I think this was core to document these guidelines. Uh, what it basically allows you to access the segments earlier than they are fully published using chunking, um, CMF chunking here on the content generation. You use HTTP chunking in the delivery and you inform the clients um, that you basically can access the content earlier. And this animation from Will shows it perfectly the basic idea is to reduce the latency by 
avoiding full publication of segments all the time, but working on smaller chunks. The benefit is that the whole system still stays cache friendly because on caches you leave the larger objects so you don't uh, operate on the smaller objects. There was quite some supporting work in the dash being done on this. I spoke about this before, no details here. And I talked about these advantages of chunk segments for low latency. And if I would have time, then I would have shown you this uh, great demo, but uh, maybe we take this into a break from Will, uh, because Erich tells me I have five minutes, uh, but I only have a few slides left. Um, the second major work was to document an ad insertion architecture. SAC from Hulu was quite helpful on doing all of this. And one of the key issues was really to identifying what are the building blocks, where are interfaces, and also how you can do on a server side um, splicing of content such that it has minimum impact to the playback of the Dash client. Um, the, the main effort is really that you can generate, for example, ad content independent of the main content, and there's a simple operation in the middle that just basically adds these uh, ads into this uh, live work stream without having to change any of the encoded data. So it's a pure manipulation of the manifest without any change um, of, of the segments. That also keeps, uh, for example, delivery networks transparent. There's other highlights uh, of V5 um, that are listed here, and I leave this for the offline digestion. Um, and what I also would like to point to is obviously that you do more than just these guidelines. A significant amount of work in DashAF goes into building reference and conformance tools with efforts and quite some sponsoring from DashAF, um, which, is, um, which doesn't come for granted. So again, I invite people to join us in moving forward with these efforts. M remarkably, as I said, the DashJS reference client, uh, we also have a, a significant amount of test vector databases. We're trying to also migrate and, and move this into the CMF uh, content workflows together with CTA Wave. And we have just commissioned a huge project for uh, having a validator update together with multiple organizations as well in order for uh, content providers to validate their content against Dash, CMF, DVB Dash conformance, and so on and so on. We find this is very important because that really allows independent content generation from clients. You don't have to interrupt with the clients. You can basically use the validator to ensure that the content is correct. Dash chess by numbers, just an idea. It's a huge project, and um, it's, it's great that this is moving along and is used so significantly. Um, Daniel has spoken about this yesterday. What's next? Okay, a couple of highlights uh, here. Uh, and again, I will be brief and quick. Uh, we have developing an MPEG amendment one to the fifth edition that has a couple of bullet points. Alternative MPD events, nonlinear playback, addressable resource index tracks, and dash period events. And in dash F, we have a couple of aspects moving forward as well. Uh, content steering, uh, addressable research representation, server-guided ad insertion, uh, server-based watermarking, dash and WebRTC streaming. And we also get input and collaboration with external organizations being documented here. Again, in the interest of time, I skipped the details. I'm just highlighting here. The ARI track is basically a metadata track that allows you to send live along with the media, but in a separate track, information about size, duration, quality of, um, of generated chunks and segments. And that allows a client to basically make use of this information in the request scheduling because you know ahead of time how large the chunk will be, uh, what is the quality, and so on and so on. So it's basically uh, a metadata track coming along with this, but it documents uh, not just a single track, it documents multiple tracks, um, and it's built into a workflow to make it also low latency, uh, documented here. We're also looking into what is called addressable recent representations that allows to switch back and forth into low latency uh, chunked uh, modes with large segments. So what you do is you create smaller, uh, one representation with smaller segments and m more frequent IDR frames. And by doing so, you can basically switch out of and into uh, these recent representations for faster tuning, faster down switching, and potentially also faster up switching. There's work on content steering. Um, this is aligned with HLS. Will Law uh, and SAC have driven this 
uh, also in the, in the interop with uh, HLS. Uh, we are, uh, have been looking at server-guided ad insertion, and basically the idea is to use the same architecture we have been using for server uh, side ad insertion, and basically move some principal logics into the into the clients to do the replacement. Oh, I thought I'm, I'm switched off because the, the clock went to zero. I'm almost done. Uh, there is uh, just news published that we have been working on a WebRTC project, and I refer to the news and I also refer to the presentation, post the presentation of Julia and others tomorrow. Now it's today in the afternoon. And here's another couple of selected presentations I wanted to basically just highlight um, during the week. There are more, but what you see is there's quite a lot of efforts around this larger interoperability. Um, wrap up. Um, this is just short, and I, anyways, I don't have enough time, but we had some discussion in Dash F, and basically what we are hearing and seeing is Dash has matured to a, a way that it's broadly adopted in the market, and it uh, is available for large scale. So there's a very mature baseline uh, technology can be used for live, on-demand, ad insertion. So all of the major use cases are tracked. Uh, it's continuously to be a collaborative effort. So there's not a single sponsor. So that's also what, what should be a message. So you cannot expect that everything comes just to you and um, you get it. So you, we ask you to contribute either by joining membership and supporting development of tools. Uh, we also coordinate with other STOs, quite some effort. Uh, but they're still full of ideas of, uh, of innovation, um, client implementations, new server data, with all the work going into immersive media, and so on and so on. So we invite you to join us in Dash AF. And I want to thank a lot of people who have provided me slides and input for um, this presentation, but also for the collaborative work of the last 10, 12 years uh, was very exciting. I have just a few on those here, um, and I hope I meet many of you also in a couple of weeks uh, at the NAB. Thank you so much. Good. Thank, Thank you. Much. All right. Thanks, Thomas. Okay, we continue with our next uh, keynote. Where's my speaker? Oh, here we go. Come on over here. Madeline, uh, she is the chair for ATSC. She's going to give us an update on ATSC 3.0. And uh, we are really lucky to have you have her here. And she's also a member of the steering committee for my live video. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you. How's the audio, okay? Good? Well, I love being face-to-face. -face. Um, I almost showed up with my pajama bottoms on just as a joke, but I figured that wouldn't be funny, so I didn't do that. Uh, my name's Madeline Noland. I'm the uh, president of the Advanced Television Systems Committee, ATSC, and uh, I was very pleased when um, Alex and the MHV group asked me to come and give a quick update on what is going on with ATSC 3.0 particularly with respect to the deployment, as well as with what's going on uh, around the globe with this standard. Um, and so without further ado, I'll get started. Um, so quickly, we'll have a quick look at the overview. What are the features and benefits? We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, because I think it's pretty out there in the world these days. But uh, the US deployment update, I think, might be of, of great interest. And then the global deployment update, I think, is also going to be potentially of, of great interest to this group. So the quick uh, summary, um, when I first was 
introducing ATSC 3.0. It took like a full day boot camp to do it. Um, then my friend John Taylor said, I need you to introduce ATSC 3.0 in 10 minutes or less. Well, now I've got it down to one slide. So um, the physical layer, the RF layer, it's the flexible and currently it's the world's most efficient one-to-many data delivery standard over the air. Um, and it has a, a lot of opportunities for different kinds of modulation and coding group um, configurations. So it, it's designed to allow broadcasters to do just about any type of business model they want to do within their RF band. The transport, it's the world's first uh, television broadcast system that is based on IP. And we're actually very pleased about that decision, um, which came very early in the process, watching the entire world, including our cable operator partners, going completely IP um, on their transport systems. Video, of course, is much improved, and we'll spend a little bit more time on that, given, given that this is mile-high video. Um, Ultra-high definition, HDR, wide color gamut, high frame rate, scalable coding. Um, all of this is by H.265, but as I mentioned, the standard was designed to be evolvable, and we were already working on VVC uh, as an addition to the standard. The audio is immersive um, personalization. We're using Dolby AC4 as well as MPEG-H. Um, personalization, voice boost, extra audio tracks for dialogue and languages, um, very, very flexible audio system. And the applications, again, um, thinking about what do we want to do as far as making sure this is an interoperable standard with other data delivery systems, we decided to go 100% W3C. Um, so the off-the-shelf browser can run the interactivity of the ATSC 3.0 system. And for the specialty items that are television-centric, like if the application wanted to ask the television if the captions were turned on, or if parental, guidance, parental restrictions are turned on, or if there's an emergency message coming in, those kinds of things were done via WebSocket APIs outside of this, the browser standard. Accessibility was extremely important and always is. Um, new capabilities for the visual and hearing impaired audiences, including closed sign language opportunities, multiple audio tracks in different languages, uh, digital video services, um, in terms of descriptive video services, rather. So there's a lot of new uh, capabilities on the accessible front. Advanced emergency messaging is a large one. Uh, we think it's very important not only for the public service aspect of what television broadcasters do, but also with the MVPD partners who work closely with television broadcasters to rebroadcast um, this kind of content, having that advanced emergency messaging. So it's not just a text crawl at the bottom that says there's a big storm coming, or as we say in Boston, a wicked big storm coming. Um, it would say, here's the evacuation map. Here is where the shelter is. Here is what happened afterwards. Um, so the advanced emergency messaging system is very deep and capable for making sure that everybody has the information they need. And as I mentioned, the evolvability was built in from the beginning with clever um, signaling design to make sure that instead of doing what this is, which is a completely non-backward compatible system, in the future we'll be able to bring new services online while maintaining the older services for the legacy receivers, which is why we're busy saying, hey, let's add BBC. And later on, we're going to add other things. We're already adding CMAF, which Thomas talked about in the previous discussion. Um, so uh, we're very pleased with that as well. A little bit more about the video, because we are here at Mile High Video. Um, as I mentioned, currently resolutions up to 3840-2160. As we discuss VVC, we're also discussing 8K. Um, we will see what kind of applications that that has. But uh, I did have a couple of really interesting conversations when I was at CES. Uh, one of which was that you can send virtual reality content in an 8K frame. Kind of interesting. That might be a possible use case that um, the ATSC membership will study. Spatial scalability is part of the hybrid OTA, OTT aspect of ATSC 3.0. Not only could you send the base layer and the enhancement layer over the air, but you could also consider sending the base layer over the air and an enhancement layer over the top. High frame rate, as I mentioned, um, you'll notice that 120 over 1.001. Um, we fought about whether or not we were going to drop fractional frame rates. All I can say is we really tried. <laughs> um, however, there they are still um, due to the notion of how much legacy and archival content there is out there and how hard it is to fix that frame rate to be integer based um, without uh, damaging the content. So, 
We also have temporal sublayering, which allows backward compatibility with high frame rate and uh, 60 frames per second, and also temporal filtering for optimizing the standard frame rate and high frame rate pictures um, for both modern and legacy devices that are re rendering the pictures. High dynamic range, of course. Uh, we had our own personal discussions. Um, everybody called it the HDR wars, if you will. Um, however, I think that in ATSC, bo having both PQ and HLG in there made a lot of sense. Obviously, SDR is used. And um, SLHDR1 from, um, is also there as a backward compatible solution when you want to send SDR pictures, but you want HDR to be presented on those devices that understand it. And of course, there's many metadata systems for PQ. Um, th that, that is definitely a broad palette of Dolby Vision and HDR10, HDR10+, and the list goes on a bit. And wide color gamut, you really can't have um, excellent HDR without wide color gamut. Um, and honestly, to me, this HDR and wide color gamut are probably the most important aspects of the video upgrade. Yes, the spatial resolution is important, but it's those two aspects that really make it pop. And with the broadcasters needing to simulcast the old system and the new system without any extra spectrum, let's just say that we're a little bit bandwidth challenged. And so looking at HDR and wide color gamut as a way of Im immediately improving the video uh, is extremely attractive. So as I mentioned, BBC is being added to ATSC 3.0 right now. I noticed that our S41 chair um, in charge of the video work is here in the audience. Uh, so thank you, Alan, for all the work that's going on there. So what, why are we doing this? This is a non-backward compatible voluntary transition, at least in the US. So the bottom line is it had better be good. What is in it for the consumer, for example? So certainly more content. Uh, the increased efficiency increases the number of services that you can do. Better TV, uh, we do all the, um, many, many of our members have done market research. What do consumers really care about? The fact is they really care about pictures and sound and the rest of it they sort of care about, but this is the most important thing. So absolutely enhanced experiences with the interactivity, um, TV for everyone, certainly a, a key piece. Um, bridging the di digital divide has been something that came front and center that we weren't actually expecting so much. The pandemic brought that into the laser focus where all of a sudden we have millions of school children who don't have broadband and need it now. They need the content right now. And so distance education came online very, very quickly uh, using the ATSC 1.0 and 3.0 systems. So certainly saving lives and property, people care very much about that, personalized experiences, and mobility. Um, I think that mobility is something that's of great interest, uh, particularly in the automotive vertical here in this country, but direct to mobile phones is of great interest in other countries. So what is it, what's in it for the broadcasters and the industry as a whole? Um, I had the pleasure of uh, taking a class at uh, the Tuck School in uh, Dartmouth, New Hampshire uh, several years ago. And it was a class on case studies about what's going on with business. And, the ans and, and one of the things that stuck in my mind is that if you're bringing in a new technology, the entire ecosystem from top to bottom has to benefit. If there's a broken link in the chain anywhere, the technology is probably going to fail. Um, and one of the interesting uh, examples they gave was flat roll tires, where you could actually get a flat and you could still drive. And the car, the tire companies were happy and the car companies were happy and the consumers loved it. But the garages had to buy a $5,000 piece of equipment to fix a tire that someone was going to expect to have fixed for 40 bucks, because that's how much it costs to change a tire. And the garages said, I'm not going to do that. So suddenly people are out with flat roll tires and they actually do get a flat and it does need to be fixed and they can't find any place to fix it. So the whole ecosystem is really obviously important for any kind of new technology. And you think about what we have here, well we certainly have more inventory. If we have more services, then we have more advertising inventory and hopefully we have more money. Targeted content, um, as the cable uh, industry knows and the broadcasters through the cable industry know and obviously through streaming, targeted advertising is a good business model. Um, it is better than mass market advertising in many cases. There are new verticals. So again, looking at ways to monetize the spectrum, monetize the system, monetize your non-recoverable engineering efforts and your capex to do this upgrade, there's this concept of data casting which opens up new business opportunities. People are talking about smart agriculture, they're talking about digital signage, automotive applications, firmware uh, up updates. 
I think that one of the interesting things someone once said to me was that Facebook was kind of interested because every time they update their Facebook phone application, the cost of actually sending that data packet to all the phones is pretty high. And it's the same data packet that needs to go to millions of devices. So a one-to-many transmission system might be a better choice. Um, new tools for content creators. So the content creative, creative community, HDR, wide color gamut, the high frame rate, I cannot wait to see hockey in high frame rate. I mean, really, it's gonna be terrific. Um, future proofing, this is another big one. It's like, how many times do we have to do a non-backward compatible upgrade where we're worried about simulcasting and all this stuff? Uh, let's just do it this, I won't say one last time because that's probably very, very ambitious, but let's get something that's a little bit more flexible and resilient and not brittle to change. And lastly, OTA, OTT hybrid. Um, I think the consumers these days, they don't care where the content comes from. They're, they're watching it on their device, whether it came in over cable or over broadcast or over the internet or over satellite or whatever. Um, they want to have their integrated experience. So the OTT, OTA hybrid capabilities are definitely part of it. Um, and you know, thinking about the way some of, some of the countries in the world are considering this, this, this television, one of the things that the folks in Jamaica said, which really struck home with for me, was that, said, you know, this mass media is really important for our cultural unity. This is the way the people across the island understand each other. This is what we do to keep our, our people together. And he said, you know, if we let our television broadcast system atrophy and be a dinosaur and be the oldest kind of technology there is, what is that saying about how we feel about our own culture? We need to make sure that these cultural unifying technologies are modern and capable of keeping up with what people expect and continue to be as important as they always have been. So those were all really interesting in industry benefits. So what's going on in the US? Um, in the US, we are currently covering over 50% of US households. 82% coverage is expected by the end of this year. There are hundreds of services, hundreds of stations online um, already, and the rollout continues. This map is already out of date. The light blue ones are ones where the applications have already been filed with the FCC, and there's at least six others that I found yesterday that I didn't get a chance to put into this map, so it goes along quickly. The other thing that I think is interesting is the television marketplace. Again, in a voluntary transition, we've got to get people out there with television sets. And we were very pleased that three million sets sold in 2021, and the expectation is that there's going to be an inflection point in 2024, and in 2025, basically 75% of, of TVs sold will have 3.0. And I think it's important to point out that these numbers are about television sets, the big screen. We're not talking about set-top boxes and dongles and whatnot. So we've got Sony, Samsung, LG with more than 70 television models already, ranging all the way down to $600, which is actually pretty good for a brand new technology. And Hisense joined the group at CES this year uh, with a terrific display. And we're seeing the dongles coming on market now. This, uh, the one in the center there, the, um, the dongle is a $60 unit. There's also white label boxes and, and a bunch of other things that are coming, and these costs range from $60 to $300. So we're not yet down to the $40 converter box, but uh, it's going really quickly. And hey, smartphones, why not, right? So here's a prototype, um, the Mark I phone by One Media and Sankey Labs, and it's, it's intended as a proof of concept reference device for countries and organizations that are thinking about this use case with 3.0. So there's also the cable operators and the redistribution. Um, ATSC 3.0 is not yet available on cable. The cable operators are carrying the 1.0 signals at the time, at this time. And business discussions are ongoing. Um, I think the main thing to talk about here is that while there's certainly technical challenges, um, these are all details that can be sorted out. I think the biggest challenge for uh, ATSC 3.0 over cable is probably gonna be the business discussions. Um, which are always the biggest challenge when it comes to carriage of content on cable. Um, but I think the bottom line, and this is something that my friend Steve Watkins from Charter Communications said years ago um, at an SCTE conference, if the broadcasters are doing something that consumers like, then the cable operators will want to carry it. And so one of the things that I think is extremely important in 2022 and 2023 is to see what the broadcasters are actually going to do with these new tools. 
Um, you know, we have some interactivity out there. We're going to see some stunting this year probably with 4K UHD. We certainly saw the Olympic coverage in 4K HDR. Um, and so I think that that's going to be incumbent on the broadcasters to have something out there compelling that the cable operators say, now I understand where the business op proposition is. And uh, I think that is coming. Around the world, Korea de deployed in 2017. And they're pretty much covering all of their major cities. 75, 80% of the population has ATSC 3.0. Their killer app was UHD. I think they're still actually broadcasting in SDR. They wanted 4K because that's what they wanted in time for the 2018 Olympics. And they succeeded in that. And Jamaica has adopted ATSC 3.0. Uh, both Korea and Jamaica are government mandated uh, switchovers. And the first station went live in Jamaica in January of 2022. Um, so we congratulate Television Jamaica for, for that launch, and the other broadcasters in Jamaica are working now to, to get it implemented. Um, business trip to Jamaica, right? Good idea. I like it. We should, we should definitely get launches in Honolulu and places like that. Um, so what's going on in Brazil? So Brazil has launched a TV 3.0 project. Um, they want to upgrade to a second generation digital television broadcasting system. They put out a call for proposals and many organizations responded to that call for proposals. Um, they're looking at it in six different layers, physical layer, transport, audio, video, captions, etc. They have made some decisions. Um, they have chosen Route Dash as their transport system over IP. Um, which is something that uh, is based on Dash, which Thomas introduced or, or talked about at the last talk. Um, they've also chosen the ATSC IC, I, IMSC1 system for captions um, and MPEG-H audio, which we're also using. And they also chose the ATSC Advanced Emergency Messaging System. And they're still working on the physical layer and application coding uh, pieces. But we're very excited about that. And then the other country that's really actively exploring ATSC 3.0 is India. Um, again, each country has its own use cases, and in the case of India, they want broadcast to a phone. I don't know how many people here would know how many, what percent of the Indian population owns a television set? Anybody think it's 25% or more? Yeah, you guys are smart. 7%. They're all watching TV on their phones, all of them. And the cricket match comes along, the India Premier League, and everybody's watching the same content at the same time in a unicast on their phone. So this is something of high interest not only to the broadcaster to be able to reach people where they're watching TV, but it's also of interest to the MNOs who would like to get some of this traffic off of their already congested network. 1.2 billion cell phones and growing is a lot. So they're working on that. We have a proof of concept going on in Bangalore and a technical demo in Delhi. And there's a lot of effort going into helping India understand what the system can do and adapting it to their needs should they choose to adopt it. And there's more. It looks like I need to hurry a little bit. Um, Canada is expected to issue experimental licenses. Um, Mexico is interested primarily in distance education. Um, Honduras seems to be emerging some for, from some really massive political unrest and, and might be interested soon. And ATSC 3.0 is also being added to the International Telecommunications ITUR documents so that lots of countries can explore what the system is and does. Um, so a lot of countries think about, well, what do I want to do with this and why would I do it? And so there's, so there's a lot of considerations for countries as they think about whether or not to adopt a new television system, whether it be ATSC 3.0 or something else. Um, and in the interest of time, I will move through these and uh, ask if there are any questions from the audience about what's going on with ATSC 3.0 these days. Yasser. Okay. Hi. Hi, Madeline. Is this thing on? Okay. Uh, there we go. Okay. So uh, just, just in general, thank you for your presentation. Um, I did have a couple of questions uh, uh, in terms of personalized experiences and what should we see in ATSC 3.0 with respect to that and how that is different than, you know, targeted types of applications that are coming on and, um, and how this works in a broadcast environment. Yeah, excellent. So personalized experiences um, will rely heavily on the OTA, OTT hybrid piece 
So if the television, so, so consider that you might have an application running on the television in the background as part of your OTA experience. And maybe you're watching football, like I tend to do, and an ad comes up and says, hey, we're showing you trucks. Are you interested in trucks or are you interested in cars? And I say, cars. Okay, now the app knows that much about me, and it can actually access the internet using the broadband connection of a smart TV to say this person is interested in cars, not trucks. Please do an ad splice. Um, so the hybrid piece is critically important for the most rich experiences with that. Um, and I think that the, the other thing that's important about that is that there's a lot of personalization you can do without the internet connection. For example, the voice boost, you can say, well, you know, I can't hear the damn dialogue over the car's noise and the crowd noise, and so I want to turn the dialogue up. And that's something you can do without an internet connection. Um, certainly the targeted advertising, I think, is going to be an important piece from a business perspective. Um, and the broadcasters are currently working with a number of different types of applications. Um, certainly local news, you know, you, you tune, do you remember back in the day when you tuned into the local news and you sat there and you waited for the weather? Waiting for the weather, waiting for the weather, and then they'd tease you about the weather and do something else and then they'd actually give you the weather. So it's like, hey, bring up the weather right now, go. Um, what are the stories that I missed? Catch up television, those kinds of things seem to be getting traction. And you know, looking at, for example, HBB TV in Europe, which is taking off now on a commercial basis, we can learn a lot of lessons about what are the actual killer apps in the application world and can learn a lot from that. Um, so I don't know if I've answered your question, Yasser. I don't know if it was more of a technical question or... No, I, I think that was a good explanation. Yeah. Thanks, Madeline. Thanks, Yasser. Thank you. So his question is about collaboration between ATSC 3.0 and HBB TV and DVB. Um, what's interesting is, is that DVB T2 and ATSC 3.0 are really similar standards. Um, they both have extremely high efficiency. They both have interactive coding um, capabilities like HBB TV for the DVB system and the ATSC interactivity system. Um, the HBB TV and the ATSC 3.0 system are also very similar, both based on uh, web W3C technologies. They opted to modify the browser for the extra things, whereas ATSC opted for the WebSocket APIs. But what's really interesting is seeing how the marketplace is embracing this. So you get companies like FinCons out of Italy who says, what do you want your app to do? And we will push a button to push it out as an HBB TV app or an ATSC 3.0 app. What do you want? So there's a lot of collaboration going on there. Um, I'm also really looking forward to IEEE BMSB in Spain in June, where myself and Emily Dubbs from DVB will be able to speak together um, about what's going on in the world. But you know, my personal, my personal hope is that there's a lot of convergence in our future between not just those two, but between the four major DTT systems. Because if broadcasters want to have kind of a global presence and a global uh, importance, I think we need to be more like the W3C and the 3GPP, which are basically international standards. I can take my phone and I can go to India and it just works. Now, I'm not necessarily going to take my 75 inch television on a plane and expect it to work, but you know, if we do direct to mobile with broadcast, it better work ubiquitously across the world, right? So, ATSC has been having a lot of conversations about that. And anybody here remember FOB TV? Yes, we have one. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> so FOB TV was, a, was an attempt to create a world standard for DTT. Um, that attempt did not get very far. And I think the reason why is because there's not enough in the eco ecosystem business incentives to change everything, to make a worldwide standard. Why would China throw out DTMB and put in ATSC 3.0? And why would the US do the opposite, right? There's no, no incentive for it. But you look at the low-hanging fruit, DVBI. ATSC3 and DVBI, these are things that we can work on. Look at the video codex. We're all busy adopting HEVC and VVC. Why do we all have to write our own spec, right? So I think there's low-hanging fruit, and I think that's where ATSC membership is starting to think about it. And the idea would be to find the opportunities for convergence that are doable and work our way through that. And maybe ultimately the end game is a single system, but we'll see. 
Madeline, thank you. Hi, Thomas. You talked about DVBI. I'm wondering if ATSC has some similar project, because I, I still, I mean, I was involved in the ATSC development. I still feel what we did in DVBI is different, because DVBI is a, an internet-centric service layer, and then the transport is basically can come through the internet or through broadcast and so on. So does ATSC have something similar, or is everything connected to the terrestrial distribution? Yeah, so to, to Ali's point, um, personally, speaking for myself, um, I'd much rather piggyback on DVBI for, for the types of things that it does. Um, I mean, we do have an electronic service guide which can be delivered over the air. Um, we do use root dash, we're adding CMAF. But where DVBI has this sort of ubiquitous metadata concept where you can do search and discovery, why wouldn't ATSC be among those things that can be announced using the DVBI standard? Yeah. That to me is really compelling. The low latency dash aspects of DVBI, we should reference that. You know, and, and obviously there's all the technical details. You've been in all the standards meetings, Thomas. You know it's not so simple as that. But um, I think that uh, DVB, DVBI is an extremely interesting standard and my hope is that ATSC membership will pay close attention to it. Finding another transport shouldn't be a problem. The question is just can you decouple ATC metadata from uh, and put it into a DVBI concept. But uh, that's nice. I mean, if you think about this, I, I, it's great. I mean, we do the same now for 5G broadcast, unicast, connecting it to DVBI, basically separating the service layer from the transport. And I, I, it's not yet clear whether this is going to fly, but it's an attempt to basically just make sure that you don't have to invent a service layer for every transport system, so that doesn't make sense. Yeah, speaking for myself and, and not the ATSC membership necessarily yet, completely agree. That, there, that, that, that to me is one of the most ready opportunities for this kind of convergence. Hello. I have a question on, uh, on ATSC's, uh, uh, ATSC versus cable and satellite, not only terrestrial. And I'm looking at it from a DVB plus HPV TV point of view. So in Europe, you know, DVB uh, compliant uh, receivers, either satellite, terrestrial, or cable, as uh, they add an uh, HPV TV compliant uh, browser on the system, it instantly becomes a hybrid uh, solution. And uh, take any channel, say German ZDF, if you get their signal either from satellite or from terrestrial or from cable, you will get this additional HPV TV component and you will be able to access their OTT content on the same set, all the TV set top boxes. Looking at ATSC 3.0, uh, I thought it was terrestrial completely, but you made a comment that cable is not there yet. So I'm trying to understand when or how it can make into cable and also satellite uh, set up box at some point, but if the transport is changing, then does it mean that the current set up boxes cannot really do ATSC 3.0 at all? That they have to change? That brings a huge legacy problem. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if you envision that an ATSC 3.0 signal will come into, for example, a cable head end, um, you could envision that the cable head end can decode that signal, can decide what of it it wants to forward on to its set top boxes and do that. Um, and the set-top box is, let's say, for example, the content is Ultra HD, HDR. Well, the set-top box needs to be capable of rendering that. If you've got one of the older boxes, it can't do it. And similar to the, to the broadcast infrastructure, are they even capable of sending UHD, HDR content over their whole distribution plant? Um, some of our friends from the Ultra HD forum are here who worry about, you know, we can, we can capture all this beautiful content in a camera and we can display it all on a screen, but what about all the hops in between? Um, and so I think uh, there's work to be done in that area. Um, and of course, I think that the, the, the landscape in the U.S. is more complicated than in, in Europe because with DVB you have DVBS, DVBC, DVBT, um, DVBI, and HBB TV, and all of that includes the terminal specifications, right? But here in the U.S. we've got ATSC, SCTE, the CTA, and, and all the alphabet soup in between. So it's a question of coordinating this kind of effort in the US, but I think every country is different in that respect. Um, eventually we'll get there, but as I mentioned in one of my other slides, from a technical point of view, these are all very doable and solvable questions. I think the real work at hand is between the broadcasters and the MVPDs 
with respect to the business opportunity. You might remember um, the 100th playing of the Masters Golf at, in St. Louis a few years ago, and CBS put that in UHD HDR over DirecTV. You had to have a special box, it was a special premium subscription and all these other things, but they were able to do it. So these are the kinds of sort of baby steps in the direction that we're gonna go, and I think it will take some time. But, uh, you know, as Steve said, if customers like it, there's your incentive. And that's why people want to sit down at the business table and have a conversation about how to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Very quickly, Rafael. Hello, Madeleine. Thank Hi, you Rafael. for your presentation. I just wanted to ask, yesterday there was a talk by Michael Luby on Raptor Q, and he mentioned that it was uh, in ATSC3. Uh, I've worked a bit with this technology. I know it has a very strong. Could you elaborate a bit on how this is uh, used in ATSC 3.0? Yeah, so Raptor Q is one of the forward error correction um, uh, uh, technologies that's in ATSC 3.0. Um, now in the early days, I'm not sure how much it's being implemented. I think people are in the process of please get pictures and sound up so that it works and looks great and the captions work and they look great and we start getting into the business things. Um, but I think that Raptor Q is one of the most interesting things, particularly in the data casting space. So the notion that I need to send a firmware update and I need to make darn sure that all the bits get there. So my thought is, is that when, when they start to get into those kinds of non-real-time file delivery, um, particularly for critical use cases, that that's when Raptor Q is going to shine. That's my guess. Yep. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. And we continue with the next session. Yes, and welcome to the next session already, just before the break and the poster session that will be combined later on. And we have our first session on video coding and I would appreciate if the speaker of the first presentation, so it will be you, yeah. I will, I'm trying to load the slides for you. Yes. And we are Jot. Jot, Carrie, about video codec licensing landscape. You have a clicker, or I can use the arrows. It must be somewhere here, but I cannot see it now. Ah, here it there is, and you have a timer here. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll try to catch up on a little bit of time here. I'm Judd Carey, uh, formerly from Cable Labs and now at a small startup called Gridmetrics. You can see it at gridmetrics.io. Um, usually, I, 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 at a technical conference like this, I, I start off with the Monty Python saying of, and now for something completely different. Because I'm a lawyer speaking at the technology forums here, this is more on licensing, uh, patents, patent pools, things like that. So it's a little bit different than some of the other presentations. One thing that, I, that I'll say before I start um, on the last two uh, presentations, one on Dash, um, there was a Dash patent pool that was offered by MPEG-LA. Uh, that was announced maybe three years ago. Um, Cable Labs was actually a member of that patent pool, and there were a smattering of other companies that were members of that patent pool as well. But that patent pool, as some patent pools do, it, it kind of failed. There weren't enough licensors, enough patent owners, uh, to make that a benefit. Where you get a benefit from a patent pool is really where there's you know hundreds, if not thousands of licensors and it's a one-stop shop you get a license from all those thousand licensors so um, that patent pool no longer exists uh, the other announcement that uh, was about January I think I mean, this last month is there is an ATSC 3.0 uh, patent pool that was announced by MPEG LA so that you know has just been announced these patent pools sometimes take a while to get uh, up and off the ground and, and into commercial success so we'll see where that one goes as well uh, two announcements um, one is this this is uh, of course my own uh, comments this was derived from a paper that uh, Carter Ellsroth at the DVB and I uh, wrote and most of this was Carter's presentation but I he didn't come out to this so I'm presenting it here um, the other thing is, is, on some of the licenses I'll talk about, you really need to go to the website. Go to their website. That's the definitive legal document that prevails. So speaking as a lawyer, um, you've got to go look at the actual license. 
So a couple different topics we'll talk about here very quickly. Um, Carter used the word potted. I had to go look that up. I said a potted history of licensed video uh, codecs. Potted, I guess, means a summary. Uh, Carter's more of a Francophile and went to school at Oxford and Cambridge and uh, uses words like that. Um, next, we'll talk about what the, we, we were doing for the VVC. Um, and I'll touch on a little bit on AVS-3 and their licensing and AV-1. So just a little bit of history here. Um, patent pools, like I said, is, is really beneficial when there's a lot of owners. So what happens is a lot of owners of patents get together. They pick or choose a, a licensing administrator. Um, implementers then go to that licensing administrator as a one-stop shop. Instead of going to a hundred different licensors, you can go to one place, get that license. Uh, it's very convenient uh, for the implementers, so they pay a royalty to that administrator. The administrator monitors compliance. Sometimes that means maybe bringing a lawsuit. Um, they collect the fee and they pay those royalties to the owners. And then the owners, of course, can use that money to go do further research and development and in areas of, of their business. Part of the history here um, actually did involve Cable Labs. Um, back in the day, uh, Cable Labs was converting from analog to digital. And of course, we needed a compression system. Um, so we, we came up with MPEG-2. Uh, we, Cable Labs helped finish those specifications. We went to our board, said we're going to use MPEG-2. The board is, of Cable Labs is the CEOs of the cable industry. They said, oh, well, that all sounds well and good, but are there any patents on MPEG-2? <laughs> we said, well, let's go find out. And we did something that was kind of odd at the time. I don't think you would do this today, but we actually went, go, we went looking for patent owners. So we actually did a landscape analysis. We, found what we thought were probably the likely owners of MPEG-2 patents. We knocked on their door and said, hey, do you want, do you want a penny per codec or whatever the, the license fee was? And of course, most people back in the day, they didn't really monetize their patents back then. This was the late 90s. And they said, well, sure, if you want to give me, put that in my back pocket, that's fine. But we organized all the patent owners of what we thought were the essential patent owners anyways and put together a, a pool. And that's where we actually spun off MPEG-LA. Uh, the MPEG LA stands for licensing administrator. Um, so, anyway, the MPEG 2 is actually one of the most successful patent pools that, that has ever existed. It, it's just now starting to um, uh, f maybe kind of sunset, basically, because most of the patents in that pool are starting to expire, so there's not much left there. But it does give you this one stop shop for licensing. Uh, we went through the, the heavy lift of going to a Department of Justice uh, letter approval that, to get approval for the concept really of a patent pool that where you had only the essential patents you had a regulatory environment and um, you you knew it was only the essential patents that were in there not non-essential patents but this whole process at the department of justice we worked out with them uh, and it's now kind of standard for patent pools fast forward to several different codec generations later of course now you hit onto hevc well, when we did MPEG-2, MPEG-LA was kind of the only game in town. Uh, now you hit HEVC, and of course there, there's a, another patent pool administrator, HEVC Advance. There's MPEG-LA, uh, that Velos cropped up, um, and then there's a lot of people who are not participating in any standard pool, which is their option. You, you don't have to participate in a standard uh, in a patent pool. Um, but this kind of emerged as a... Um, uh, kind of a, a mess for the licensing landscape. Who do you go to? Which one? What if you paid one? Do you have to pay the other? Um, and then, you know, it's ever changing as well here too. There's only, uh, this is kind of a little bit of a dated slide because uh, under Velos Media, Qualcomm is no longer in Velos and Panasonic, I think, is also in HEVC Advance now. So they're in both, I think, MPEG LA as well. So it got to be a, kind of a mess for HEVC. So for VVC, when that came out, this is when um, we started MCIF, Media Coding Industry Forum. Um, and one of the first tasks for the, uh, what we called the IP ecosystem working group was to see if, can we make this a better la licensing landscape? Uh, we saw what happened to HEVC, could we do something different? And this is where, you know, Carter and I have worked historically on these um, patent pools. Um, over in the DVB and I have in, in with MPEG-LA. Um, we said, well, could we, 
kind of jumpstart the process and what we called um, patent pool fostering. Can we get kind of dog and pony shows together with the licensing administrators doing some presentations to the licensing owners and um, see if we can kind of whittle the list down instead of you know four or five patent administrators. Maybe you can whittle this down to one, ideally, or maybe at least just a couple. So that's what we did. Um, the Media Coding Industry Forum uh, set forth uh, a, a program to foster these, this patent pool. Um, we came up with some operating rules um, and participation based on a, a well-founded or a potentially essential, a well-founded belief that you have a potentially essential patent. Because if you think about it, you need to have a, a, an essential patent to be able to sit in the room and kind of decide who you're going to use as an administrator. You can't have flies on the wall just sitting there. They don't have any interest in it. There's antitrust concerns if, if you had that situation. So we, it was just a, a, a well-founded belief that you had a potentially essential patent. They participated. Uh, we said that we were going to have this under confidentiality. There was no written agreement, but it was kind of a, a gentleman's agreement that it was confidential. Um, we decided that if you were going to pick any one patent administrator, patent pool administrator, it would have to be by two-thirds of a supermajority, a two-thirds supermajority. Um, and then we let also um, non-MCIF members could join in this effort as well. Uh, that was part of the non-discrimination and antitrust concerns. Uh, but we kind of set forth all of these uh, parameters. And then we paraded the candidate uh, patent pool administrators uh, in front of the patent owners, had lots of good discussions, many of them at two or three in the morning for some people and reasonable times for others because it was all across the world. Um, and what we came up with eventually was that there was identified two strong patent pool administrators. So I, there's a partial success there. I don't think we got to one patent pool administrator for VVC. Um, two patent pool administrators have announced pools, uh, both Access Advance and MPEG LA. We actually had five candidates total, so we whittled that at least down to, to two. But it was a really good experience. It was, it was, it was uh, good participation. Nine of the ten, top ten contributors to VVC were in this conversation. We had a really good mix of not only licensors, but licensees. Uh, we had non-implementers, we had um, most of the major patent pool administrators. We had a good um, distribution across the world. Um, China and, and, and Korea have really come up as, as you participate in the sta uh, standards bodies. You see that China, of course, is, is very participatory in a lot of these standards bodies now, so we had a good representation from them as well. Um, but it was overall, I think, a, a good effort. It, it didn't work out. At down to one uh, patent pool administrator, but it was, it was fairly good. So here's what they came out with. Again, I, I have the links here on um, each of these slides here to go look at the actual license itself. Um, but what MPEG LA came out with, typical MPEG LA licensing structure, very simple um, and let's say at least cheaper than other alternatives. So what they came up with is basically 20 cents per unit. Uh, that's for the decoders. And that's for hardware or any paid software. So it does include software codecs. And then they also, also had for a free codec, it was five cents per unit. And that's after your first million devices. So if you're a, you know, a smaller royalty-free software um, company that sells under a million units, uh, you wouldn't pay a royalty. And then on the uh, access advanced side, again, you can go look at the chart. They have a lot of different um, charts uh, that they came up with, a lot of different ways to slice and dice the royalty. But one of the unique things they, they did come up with is um, a licensing program that would bridge, what they call it, bridge back to HEVC. So you could take a composite HEVC license and a VVC license at the same time, um, and effectively, you know, if you were to pay those fees separately, uh, you end up with a 45% decrease. Now, it is an increase for over HEVC collectively, but the idea is that potentially going forward, as you put in new codecs, you know, whatever's after VVC, you could do the next one and the next one and the next one. You could put in all of those codecs into your device if you want to for, all, for the same price. This is how um, Dolby has been licensing uh, their audio codecs for, for us quite some time, and they kind of transfer this over to the VVC, HEVC, 
market. So I thought that was an innovation that, that came out of this effort as well. And I'm not going to read all of this, but you can see that, because it's hard to read, um, you can see that the, the prices here range from you know, around 50 cents, and this is just for VVC. This is not the composite license. If you were only to license VVC and you were in compliance and you were taking the trademark, they, you get a discount if you're going to uh, post the Access Advanced trademark. Um, for a mobile device, it's around 50 cents. For other devices, it ranges anyway from 25 cents up to about a dollar. Um, then you go to 4K and it's $1.50. Um, so they have these different ranges. They have different uh, regional uh, distribution or, you know, around the world, regional different licenses. So they break out everything um, in a much more elaborate fashion. Go, go to their website, though, for the details. So just to touch on, um, I think somebody mentioned China. What is China doing these days? Well, of course, they came up um, with uh, AV1 or a AVS1. Um, and they also used a, a licensing structure that was a patent pool. Um, they are now coming up with AVS3. And at least the discussions that Carter has had, I know, um, they are going down the path of probably doing a patent pool um, with caps and, and looking at the patent pool model because that seems to work pretty well to collect all of those licensors into one license. That's what we think they'll be doing for AV, AVS3. Then on AV1, that one, this one kind of brings up some um, different uh, licensing issues. AV1 based their uh, licensing model off of the W3C IPR policy. W3C, of course, is royalty free. Um, there's no charge. It's, it's, uh, you, everybody agrees to a kind of a, what I call a no-gun saloon. You, you, nobody sues anybody. It's all royalty free. There's no charge. Um, but one, one necessary part of that is the licensee must also make a royalty-free commitment. So again, I, it's a no-gun saloon. I'm not going to shoot you, but you can't shoot me. So it's every, if you're a licensee or the licensor, uh, you got to make your claim, your patent available on a royalty-free basis. So this really does set up a nice ecosystem. Uh, for a ro if that's actually your goal is a royalty-free licensing ecostructure. Um, but some, some owners who have a very large or robust licensing revenue model have kind of object, objected to this. So um, others have pulled out or have called the AV1 licensing model not um, reasonable for some of these standards bodies. So some of the standards bodies are looking at adopting AV1, um, DVB being one of them. Uh, should we consider this as an optional codec? Uh, and there's been objections raised by some, some folks. Um, yeah, so what, what, what has happened in this ecosystem is Sysvel has done a patent pool around AV1. I mean, sure, the, the creators of AV1 want that to be royalty free, and the participants in AOM, Alliance for Open Media, want that to be royalty free, but that doesn't prevent anybody else from coming out and announcing, yeah, you think it's royalty free, but I know there's these licensors that did not participate in AOM, and they want their fair share of patent royalties. So they set up another patent pool outside of AOM, and, and they are offering a license as well. Um, not much the AOM folks can do about it, um, but you can find more on that license as well at, at the Cisco website for AV1. Um, last two codecs here that are kind of evolving. Um, the other way to to try to get a royalty-free approach here is uh, what EVC did, Essential Video Codec. One thing you can do is you can look to expired patents. You know, once a patent expires, there's no, you don't have to pay a royalty anymore. That's kind of the quid pro quo for a patent. You, you disclose to the world what your technology is, and yes, you get a monopoly on that for a limited period. In the US, it's 20 years. But once that 20 years runs, that's dedicated to the public. So you could use all that public information to uh, derive a codec, and that's kind of what Samsung, Huawei, and Qualcomm have tried to do with EVC. Um, so they came up with a baseline that's arguably royalty-free. Again, others could beg, beg to differ and come up with a, a patent or a patent pool and say, no, I have essential patents in that. Um, and then they have some various tools that you can add on to that that are um, maybe desirable that you have to, would have to pay for. Um, the other one is uh, LCEVC, Low Complexity Enhanced Video Coding. Um, and they announced some terms um, just recently, last May, 
Uh, it's uh, free for integration and chipsets. And then um, they actually took a kind of a different approach. They went after the service operators uh, based on your service size, you know, per subscriber, per user of one cent with a cap. A, di a different licensing model than a per device fee. Um, so that's, that's really a, a quick overview of where I think um, the licensing stands. Uh, again, it's kind of a now for some, something completely different. <laughs> if there's any lawyers in the room or, or questions on uh, licensing, I'll take those. And maybe I caught up a little bit of time. Thank you. I, I guess we have one time for one question. Yes, one please only, and the rest we take in the break. Yes. Come to the microphone, please. We need to go. Oh, I cannot hear you. Yeah, I can't hear. We can't hear. Very good. Just a quick comment, and then really learned a lot from your presentation. Thank you. Just one comment after the V1 royalty free license, because you put a slide mentioning the CISFO. And there's no, uh, for this we can discuss offline, but just uh, want to add one more information that the AOM, on the official AOM webpage, the Alliance of Open Media, which is the organization behind AV1, mm -hmm. they have a specific addressing regarding their perspective um, for the CISVO patent pool. So if you add that, it's just because it's on the official website, that would be more complete. That's yeah. just my comment. Yeah, I would suggest you go to their website, AOM's website as well, because they do have comments on, on the CISPEL patent That's pool. it. Thank yep. you. Good. Thank you. All right. Good Thanks. Again. And let's move on to the next speaker. Thank you. And she's already coming up. Uh, and I guess this was a very good introduction about the next two talks already, because they are on the actual standards. And one of that is VVC, and Jan He from Alibaba will give us an update on VVC standard and its applications. The floor is yours. Do you have a timer here? Try oh. to stay within the limit. 15. 15. Oh. Okay. Um, okay. This is the blue one? The, the blue one? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So yeah, good morning everybody. Uh, thanks Christian for the introduction. I'm here uh, on behalf of my co-authors, um, Ben Brass, Matthias Wing, Jens Ohm, and also G Gary Sullivan. Uh, they couldn't be here, unfortunately. Okay, so. Uh, so here, uh, I'll probably be preaching to the choir by saying that VVC is the latest and the greatest uh, joint standards between ITUT, VCAG, and ISO IEC MPEG. Um, the first target of VVC was uh, coding efficiency as usual. Uh, we have targeted a 50% bit rate savings at the same quality compared to its predecessor, which is uh, 265 HEVC. And uh, we'll see that we achieved that. Uh, the second main goal of VVC was to uh, cover as many applications efficiently as possible. Uh, that's what we call versatility. So we cover uh, screen content coding, we cover 360 video coding, uh, we have a um, uh, layer scalability in the first version, uh, we have provided uh, ad adaptive resolution change functionality, gradual decoder refresh, as well as uh, a number of um, parallel processing capabilities. So VVC version one was finalized uh, in July 2020, and a lot has happened since then. So that, those would be the main aspects of today's talk. Uh, the first one we'll, uh, aspect we'll cover is the early deployment of VVC. Uh, we have a lot of deployment efforts. Uh, we'll have two examples highlighted. Uh, the first one is uh, HHI open source uh, VB Inc. and VB Deck. And the second one is a uh, deployment by my employer, Alibaba, uh, at Yuku, our streaming service. Uh, we, the JVET has been uh, working on extending VVC. Uh, we have uh, recently finalized version two, which covers hybrid rate, hybrid depth applications. 
And uh, the uh, last but definitely not the least, uh, we continue to push forward with coding efficiency improvements. And we'll cover two tracks there. Uh, one is on a conventional uh, methodology using a uh, reference software we call ECM, Enhanced Compression Model. And uh, we have also actively been working on neural network-based video coding. So we'll quickly look at that as well. So VVC, as we said, uh, can achieve quite a significant uh, bit rate reduction. Uh, we've been, uh, this has been verified with our verification testing efforts. Um, so on the bar chart here, we have uh, different categories of content uh, for SDR, UHD at UHD resolution. Uh, the VTM uh, compared to HM can achieve a 43% bit rate reduction. And using the VV Inc. Uh, open source software, uh, we can achieve 50% bit rate reduction. Uh, for UHD uh, uh, HDR at UHD resolution, uh, we can achieve right around 50%, uh, depending on the HLG or PQ, we achieved 49 to 52% bit rate reduction. And uh, for also, other contents, we look at HD uh, SDR, uh, which, where we achieved a 49% uh, bit rate reduction, 360, astonishing re uh, uh, reduction above 50%, uh, depending on the projection format you're using. And uh, uh, for conversation, low delay applications, uh, there's more constraint. So VVC achieved somewhat lower, uh, between 35 uh, percent for conversation and 38 percent for gaming content, but I would say still very respectful bit rate reduction. Oh, I forgot to say that these are documented in the document uh, 2020, number 2020, at uh, different meetings, so please go and look them up if you uh, want to know more detail. Uh, early deployment, uh, Gary Sullivan has a very good uh, documentation of uh, various efforts. Uh, so that is our uh, document number 21 of the JVET document. The latest one was Y0021. Uh, we see a number of good uh, things happening. Uh, public source, uh, we have uh, certainly VTM, we have a, a multi-threaded decoder from Interdigital. Uh, HHI's uh, VV Inc. and VV Deck, and the Bitstream Analyzer from FAU. Uh, we have also some non-open source, um, but software implementation decoder. Uh, a lot of them are focused on mobile platforms because they're very important platform uh, nowadays. And we're also very happy to see that uh, MediaTek, uh, as of la late, late last year, announced their first uh, VVC-capable chipset uh, supporting up to 8K 120 frames per second. Uh, more uh, that you can find in Y0021, uh, some encoder products and services. Um, I won't read through all of them. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, the uh, Alibaba Yuku deployment uh, in a little bit. Uh, on the application standards front, uh, we're very happy to hear that ATSC 3 is now looking at VVC, um, and um, happy to report that SBTVD recently selected VC, VVC to, for the upcoming TV 3.1, uh, sorry, 3.0 uh, broadcasting standard in Brazil. And uh, DVB recently also added VVC to its uh, toolbox. And we also have um, Bitstream analyzers and conforming conformance testing um, uh, captured in this document. So a uh, little bit more on the VV, uh, VV Inc. Uh, and VV Deck. Uh, I have to say personally, you know, I'm very happy to see them coming up because this is the first open source effort uh, by someone, a uh, major organization who actually participated and know intimately about the development of VVC. So very efficient implementation coming right after VVC was finalized. That, that was very exciting. And also the copyright uh, is uh, under uh, BSD license, a very friendly license. Uh, recently they announced the web player. Uh, there is going to be a talk in the vi video coding sessions too, uh, VVC in the cloud and browser playback. It works, so please pay attention to that when it comes up. 
Uh, and VVIN and VVDEC uh, don't, aren't just standalone components. They are uh, in enabled in a VVC open source tool chain. So uh, the encapsulation is available in MP4, uh, TS, uh, Dash, and HLS. Uh, you can use VBDEC uh, embedded in FFmpeg. Uh, the playback is also available in uh, FFmpeg a fork. Um, and this is all captured in great detail by uh, Adam's uh, op uh, ACM open access article. Uh, so please uh, read that up uh, for more details. Uh, now we're moving on to a recent uh, uh, deployment of uh, VVC-based streaming at uh, Yuku. For people who are not familiar with the name, it is a major streaming service provider in China. It's wholly owned by my employer, Alibaba. Um, it is a pretty um, big uh, streaming service, hundreds of millions of customers and uh, tens of thousands of uh, content. And, um, the deployment is based on a, uh, Ali266, which is a software-based VV, VVC encoder and decoder implementation developed by my team. Uh, I, we have uh, previously a number of uh, JVET contributions on the capabilities, so I won't read through them. i only call out one thing. Uh, we recently um, participated in the MSU codec competition using Ali266. And in the subjective uh, track, uh, MSU reported that uh, uh, VVC can achieve 71% bit rate reduction compared to X265 at very slow preset uh, at the same subjective quality. So this really showcases the capability of v VVC in terms of bringing you uh, the same subject quality at significantly lower cost. So our deployment uh, included, of course, embedding a, uh, Ali266 in decoder in the uh, Yuku player, uh, using the encoder on the cloud to encode, as well as uh, system level modifications to support the end-to-end -end delivery. So some uh, deployment statistics. Uh, we did a trial deployment late last year. Uh, we formally deployed uh, starting January this year. Uh, so far, we've reached 22 Android models uh, with uh, MediaTek, Qualcomm, or high silicon chipsets. Uh, the contents that we deployed are mainly uh, trending movies, pop popular reality TV shows, and so on. And the coded bit rate at our current deployment is uh, between 35 to 40 percent bit rate reduction compared to the HVC coded content. Uh, some uh, numbers here, uh, so, so far in two months time, we recorded uh, 438,000 uh, uh, plays. Uh, total users we reached was above uh, 200,000, and the play time per view and per user is uh, about 13 minutes and 29 minutes, respectively, uh, on par with HEVC. Uh, to our knowledge, this is uh, the first VVC-based uh, streaming to uh, uh, customer and customer at scale. So some user experience observations that we have made. Uh, first, you know, people care. This is a software-based decoding. How does it look? Uh, so we, uh, the average decoding time we recorded for 1080p is 8 milliseconds. So uh, stability is uh, quite high uh, at 99.95%. Uh, successful play of uh, VVC was actually slightly higher than HEVC, 99.98 uh, versus 99.92. And we look, um, we were very happy to see that uh, everything else being equal, same video quality, same content, same device, same network environment. We saw that VVC play stall was actually half of uh, HEVC play stall. Uh, and uh, we look at the reasons uh, and we eventually uh, attributed this to the significant rate reduction uh, due to VVC. Uh, last time when we presented our uh, deployment efforts in JVET, people asked about uh, uh, battery consumption. So here are some numbers. Uh, in 90 minutes from a fully charged phone, VVC uh, software base uh, consumed 15% of uh, uh, battery, uh, and HVC, which is hardware-based, consume 9% battery, so 
6% more due to software. And, uh, but we're still able to play 10 hours uh, nonstop from a fully charged phone. And uh, we uh, look at this uh, from a bandwidth saving perspective uh, in the 10 hours, uh, you could save one gigabyte of data transmission by using DVC, which is uh, quite uh, significant. And uh, generally, uh, our conclusion is that VVC reduces bandwidth cost and also improves user experience. So I have a um, um, uh, demo video for you here. Uh, I'm going to play it. Uh, left hand side is um, uh, left hand side is the HDC, I think. Uh, right hand side is VVC, or the other way around because subject quality looks the same. Um, and uh, I. I uh, encourage you to go to this link uh, if you want to look on your own. There are uh, some uploaded video there for you to look in MP4 format, MP4 format. and also I have a YouTube app um, on my mobile device. If you are interested, I'll be more than happy to show you. So uh, uh, moving on to what's happening in JVET, uh, we recently finalized version two covering mainly high bit rate, high bit depth extension. Uh, we defined a number of new profiles for 12 and 16 bit video content in different chroma formats. Uh, we finalized the spec uh, in January uh, this year. Um, and the sister, pro, uh, sister standards uh, called VSEI, versatile SEI standard, also reached FDIS status in January. It included a number of new, uh, two new SEI uh, messages and also SEI previously uh, developed in the context of uh, HEVC and ABC. Uh, exploration, we continue to look for more coding efficiency. Uh, this slide shows you the uh, conventional method. Uh, so we follow the conventional framework, improve coding tools in major functional blocks of a hybrid coding framework. Um, and I won't go through all of them, uh, no time for that uh, in today's talk, but I encourage you to look, look up our uh, algorithm div uh, description document. It has all the details. The document number is 2025. And, uh, the uh, uh, bar chart here shows you that we can achieve 16% uh, bit rate reduction for uh, Luma. Uh, this is uh, just one year into the effort, uh, starting from EC ECM1 to ECM4 uh, at the current moment. Uh, Chroma is at uh, 20 to 21% bit rate reduction. And uh, there is some uh, complexity increase. Uh, Runtime is uh, four to five times that of uh, VTM. Uh, neural network uh, video coding, certainly uh, that is a very important topic. Uh, we've looked at uh, this uh, from the perspective of, of individual tools as well as end-to-end -end approach. And for individual tool, uh, there is the uh, scatter plot. Uh, uh, so if you focus on, for example, the loop filter, you can see that you can get up to 10% uh, uh, bit rate reduction from uh, using neural network based uh, loop filter. And uh, another thing that we've looked at uh, is how to ca characterize the performance gain versus computation complexity. Uh, that's one main aspect that we looked at. Also, can you actually get subjective quality gain using neural network-based technology? And uh, we followed, you know, in the environment of COVID, certainly we have to do remote expert viewing. We can't gather in the same room. Uh, that we have a uh, methodology uh, captured by AG5, and uh, we have been able to show that indeed you are starting to see subjective uh, quality benefits using neural network based technology. And uh, in terms of the development environment, aside from PyTorch and TensorFlow, we're also starting to have our own uh, uh, library called Saddle. Uh, it is a fixed point implementation of uh, neural network uh, tools, and that is very important for video coding, as people know very well. Uh, so wrapping up the talk, uh, we look at uh, verification testing results 
confirmed that BBC can indeed save 50 percent uh, over HEVC for a number of applications and video content. Uh, the deployment is starting to take off. Uh, we have efficient open source implementation as well as a first uh, try, uh, deployment of uh, VBC based streaming. Uh, this uh, extension effort just finalized version two with hybrid rate, hybrid depths, and uh, more SEI messages in VSEI standard. Uh, we look at our compression uh, quest for more compression efficiency. Uh, very happy to report that we have gained 16% um, in just a short year and uh, achieving higher gain for Chroma and also neural network it can provide us another 10% on top of uh, what we can get from conventional coding tools. So that is uh, it and thank you very much. Thank you. I guess we also have time for one question. Is there one? Alex, you want to ask a question? Great. Please. Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you for uh, having an actual codex shootout. That's a, uh, that's a rare thing. Uh, can you please share what is the bitrate ladder that, uh, that you can achieve uh, for something equivalent to regular HVC, uh, a regular HVC ladder? Oh, um, the bitrate ladder being the, the streaming, the adaptive yeah. streaming aspect? Yes. Oh, I think, uh, yeah, I think you, first of all, are probably asking a level of detail that I cannot answer right now. I probably need to contact my Yuku uh, colleagues and get numbers for you. Um, I know that we haven't looked at, we haven't even tried to do VVC for lower resolution. Uh, we, the VVC deployment, the VVC based coding is only for 720p and up. So 720p, 1080p for now. Um, bit rates, I, I'll look up and let you know. But I believe uh, some of them uh, really is content uh, dependent. So I can look that up and let you know offline. Thank you. So if you can post it to the Malhai vi uh, video uh, Slack channel, that would be awesome. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, Snapchat? Uh, no. Uh. <laughs> Slack, Slack channel. My oh, okay. video on the video devs. Uh, okay. Slack. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll uh, learn how to do it. Yeah. Sure. I think Thomas has one. Yeah, I know uh, it's late, but I, uh, Jan, thank you. I have a question. We're working on system standards on VBC and in DVB and in CMAF. There's a public open discussion of one issue adaptive resolution change, because it seems that VVC allows us to do adaptive resolution change for every frame, right? And so the systems people say, we cannot handle this, so we need to fix the output resolution because our display management is very complex. So we're not sure whether we just constrain it and say it's always the same output resolution, but then you need to basically switch off a tool, or if you have discussed this in the standardization, yeah what we should do about that one. And, and we have this open discussion and don't know how to resolve. We can also take it offline, but it would be good that JVID people let us know how should we implement this in systems. So there's some really open questions. Thank you. Yeah, okay, I'll take a uh, stab at answering that and uh, hopefully it makes sense, um, but if it doesn't, uh, we, we can take this offline. Um, the VVC spec tells you what is the maximum resolution you're going to encounter for the whole sequence. Right, so any adaptive resolution change can only, you know, clamp it down, right? You can go from 1080 to 720. You can not go, you know, to 4K if the resolution tells you up to 1080. So, so that caps it. And the way we look at this is, uh, I think from system level, just care about that maxim maximum, right? In a stream, you may be going down briefly, but really the main thing is from your point of view, the maximum. And briefly going down is for to combat rapid uh, bandwidth changes. Uh, I think really more for conversational, like if you have video conferencing, you know, suddenly somebody joins with very bad connection or whatever, you know, allows you to adapt quickly. And the tool itself, from my pers perspective, being a coding tool person, you know, it tells you how to reference uh, make use of a reference frame that has a different resolution, right? So from that point of view, for system uh, people, I would even consider it almost transparent, right? Definitely don't turn it off, please. I 
think let's save this discussion for offline. Thank you yeah. again. Jan here, thank you very much. And we move on. And if you can stay one more for one more talk uh, given by Ryan. Uh, about the coding tool research for next generation AUM coding standard. And again, you have the timer here. Just try to stay on time. Thank you. Do you see it or not? Okay. Okay. Do you hear me okay? Okay, cool. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Lee. I'm currently working with uh, Facebook as a uh, uh, codex specialist. At the same time, I'm also working as a co-chair of the AOM test uh, uh, subgroup. So uh, as you might be aware, like everyone is the uh, first generation of uh, royalty-free video coding standard developed by uh, uh, Alliance for Open Media. Since it was uh, released in uh, 2018, we have seen great adoption in the industry. <clears throat> Over the past few years, uh, major service providers such as uh, YouTube and uh, Netflix already start to streaming the AV1 encoding content. On the device side, we also see major hardware vendors already announced the support um, for AV1 decoding in their CPU, GPU, and uh, set-top box and uh, mobile SOCs. So while well, we're seeing like uh, everyone ramping up, uh, at the same time, AOM already started uh, to discuss the process for developing the next generation uh, coding standard after everyone. So the actual work started uh, from late uh, 2020. So the development will be divided into two phases. The first phase will be a uh, research and exploration phase, mainly focused on study all the proposed coding tools without considering the actual specification. So the second phase will be focused on integrating all the uh, coding to candidates and create the final uh, specification. So for today, I want to take this opportunity to provide a very high level overview of the coding to research for the, for the next generation UM coding standard. Um, so basically we'll, um, talk a little bit about the different uh, working groups within AOM and the uh, current uh, coding to evaluation process and uh, AOM common test conditions, and also some very early view of a uh, few of the coding to candidates. So uh, in, the, in the research phase, multiple, coding, uh, multiple working groups have already been created. The Kodak Working Group will be the main forum to review and discuss all the coding to proposals from the member companies. So we already uh, uh, started uh, using the uh, LibAOM codebase as a starting codebase, and the uh, software coordinators are assigned to maintain the code. So under the uh, CWG, there is also the testing subgroup, which is basically responsible for defining all the common test conditions, implement all the test infrastructures and uh, conduct regular tests. And uh, we also created a, a software implementation working group. This is the first time in the video coding uh, standard development history. So this, this group not only focuses on help the proponent to identify the areas that is very challenging for software implementation and provide feedbacks for them to optimize and improve the, uh, uh, their uh, proposals, at the same time, this group is also responsible for developing a production-ready software encoder implementation quickly after the specification is finalized. So the current code base will be based on the open source SVT AV1 uh, code base. And the group right now is focusing on further optimize the AV1 implementation to adding all more kind of uh, missing features and uh, improve its uh, overall performance and, uh, and the quality. Um, at the same time, the uh, focus group can be created based on request to, to study a specific uh, areas. And also, um, recently, we also created a volumetric visual media working group focused on coding of the immersive and uh, volumetric media type used in the uh, uh, AR, VR, uh, autonomous driving, and uh, 3D mapping, those type of applications. Um, so in terms of the uh, coding tool evaluation process, this is mainly uh, happened in the Kodak working group. 
So all the member uh, companies, when they have their proposal, they need to provide a detailed proposal document with algorithm description and the common test condition result and also the, the implementation. So typically it takes multiple rounds of review and study to uh, finally get this proposal uh, adopted as a, as a candidate. So if there's multiple uh, proposals kind of focused on the same topic, then a focus group can be created to study the interaction between multiple proposals. So we encourage collaboration rather than competition. So a lot of times um, the final proposal could be a joint proposal between like among multiple member companies. Um, so let's, let's talk about a little bit about the uh, AM te common test conditions. So in, in terms of uh, test sequences, we have defined about 12 uh, classes which covers different uh, content type and different resolutions. Uh, for example, we have natural video with different resolution, uh, synthetic content such as animation, gaming, and also screen content. We also have HDR uh, content as well. And one unique class we added uh, is the user generated content, which is typically the um, content we are dealing with every day, uh, like generated by the end user with uh, or a lot of uh, compression artifacts in the, in the already initial upload already. So this is a unique um, type of class and it's also first time uh, introduced in the video coding standard development. So all those uh, sequences can be downloaded from this side. It's uh, free and uh, open to the public to use. Um, encoding configuration wise, all the traditional encoding configurations such as all intro, low delay, and the random access are all supported for different, uh, uh, targeted for different applications. One unique uh, encoding configuration we introduced is adaptive streaming uh, configuration. This is mainly used to follow the uh, convex based uh, dynamic, optimization, dyna dynamic optimization approach for the uh, uh, adaptive streaming usage. In this configuration, the same uh, 4K sequences in the A1 class are used and they are downscaled to five different uh, resolutions. So totally for each sequence, the six resolutions are used in the encoding. For each resolution, we use six QPs to encode and generate different bitstream. The downscaled video are encoded, decoded, and then upscaled back to the 4K resolution to calculate the quality matrix. So for each resolution, after we finish encoding, decoding, and generate the RD curve, we do some bilinear interpolation to uh, generate some uh, interpolated RD point to obtain a smooth RD curve as shown in this example. So after we get the RD curve for all the six resolutions, then we will generate a convex hole based on all those uh, real uh, encoded point and also the interpolated point. So after we get the uh, convex hole for two different coding tools, then we can calculate traditional BD rate uh, to evaluate the uh, effectiveness of the uh, proposed coding tool. So the uh, adaptive streaming configuration is very unique in a sense that it can evaluate the coding tool across multiple resolutions and much wider uh, bit rate range. So it's also close, very close to uh, the, the approach we use in the real production. So, um, at high level, we still focus on the uh, constant QP-based uh, encoding, and uh, uh, there is no battery control uh, algorithm enabled. Um, for the QP selection for different uh, uh, encoding configurations, a set of QP are carefully selected to make sure we cover the proper quality and uh, battery range. And for uh, random access and adaptive streaming configuration, we use traditional hierarchical B uh, GOP structure with uh, 16 frame uh, sub GOP and uh, five temporal layers. And a uh, fixed set of QP offset are used for, for frames at a different, uh, different layer. Here in this table is just an example of the QP assignment. Um, in terms of the quality and the complexity evaluation, uh, for quality metrics calculation, we use the uh, VMAF to uh, Developed by, developed by Netflix to calculate all the popular quality metrics, including PSNR, SM, VMAF, 
We also included the VMAF NAG metrics, which kind of uh, disable some artificial uh, boost uh, introduced by the pre-processing model. So recently, Google is also uh, evaluating the uh, newly invented CABI metrics developed by, developed by Netflix. This is a new matrix basically meant to uh, measure the binding artifacts. In terms of the complexity measurement, so for software uh, runtime uh, impact on both the encoder and decoder side, we use uh, uh, building time and the per of utilities, not only to get the user time, system time, we also measure the actual instruction, instruction count to check the uh, performance impact for a proposed coding tool. So, so far most of, most of uh, the proponent uh, provide not only the C implementation of the proposal, they also provide the CMD optimized code to maximize the ratio between the coding gain versus the complexity increase. So meanwhile, there is also discussion on going how to evaluate the complexity for uh, machine learning based coding tools. Basically, this is a, we need a different methodology because this is not, cannot be simply measured by uh, software runtime increase. Um, in terms of the uh, proposals that focus on the entropy coding and the syntax uh, coding, we also measure the weighted uh, symbol to bit ratio to evaluate the throughput impact for hardware implementation. Um, so now I want to give uh, some quick early preview of a uh, few coding tools that have been studied. The first one is the extended quantization. So, so in every one, there's uh, six lookup tables define the uh, uh, Q index to the Q step mapping for eight, 10, and 12 bit uh, coefficient and ACDC coefficient. So uh, when we compare with HVC, we found out that for the, when we use the maximum QP, the minimum achievable bit rate for every one is about 30% higher than that of HVC. So when we, when we plot the actual uh, QP to the Q step mapping in this for, of multiple standards in the same table, uh, you can see here on the X axis is a Q index of QP, on the Y axis is actual uh, Q step value. You can see that the the blue line is for HVC, and the yellow part is the extension by VVC. And the uh, brown, line, brown curve and the green curve is the Q step value for uh, AC and the DC coefficient in AB1. You can see that uh, the, in AB1, the maximum Q step value for AC coefficient is very close to that of HVC, but the Q step value for DC coefficient is lower than that of HVC, that, that is kind of the root cause why the minimum achievable bit rate of AV1 is higher than HVC. So in this new proposal, we unified the, the Q index to Q step mapping for all the uh, AC and DC coefficient and defined a clear equation for uh, Q index to Q step mapping. And we also extended the Q step range uh, to be the similar as that of VVC, as you can see in the, the green curve. So um, based on this uh, proposal, we have observed about 0.6% uh, gain for random access and 1.1% gain for low delay configuration and 0.4% uh, for all intro. Okay, so the next uh, coding tool I want to kind of over, uh, provide a high level overview is the extended recursive uh, partition. So uh, in AB1 for any uh, square partition, there's a uh, you can code the partition in 10 different partition types as shown on the left hand side. So uh, only the quadrate split the partition, uh, you can further split the, uh, each partition into smaller block, that is uh, recursive. So in this new proposal uh, for any square partitions, uh, we can code it into five different uh, partition types. There are either no split or Horizontal or binary split in horizontal or vertical directions, or ternary split in uh, vertical and uh, horizontal directions. A unique uh, improvement is that uh, for all those partition types, they are recursive, so which means they can be further split into the smaller partitions. So the only restriction is the maximum ratio between the width and height of a coding block is uh, one to four. 
So uh, this uh, proposal actually gave a uh, quite good gain. We see about 2.5% uh, for all intra and 3.4 for random access and 3.9 for low delay configuration. But the uh, encoding runtime increase is also quite big. So right now there's an uh, effort to further uh, optimize and improve the runtime for, for this particular proposal. So uh, next one is a semi-decoupled uh, partition. So in AV1, the uh, block partition type for the Kuwama plane is determined by that of Luma plane. So in case when the uh, texture of the Luma and the Kuwama plane share the similar uh, texture, then it makes sense to use the same partition type to reduce the uh, syntax overhead. But when the Luma and the Kuwama have very different textures, and it's better to use separate uh, partition. So with this proposal, uh, for every coded uh, partitions, we have a uh, a syntax element called shared depths, which for all the coding tree above this shared depths, the Luma and the Kuwama can share the same partition type. For the coding tree below this shared depths, uh, Luma and the Kuwama can use different, uh, different partition type. So as shown in this uh, example, here on the right hand side, the, the dash line, the, the solid line indicate that the Luma block and the Kuwama block share the same partition boundaries. And the dash line indicate that the Luma block and the Kuwama block can use different partition type. So th these two also gave quite a good coding gain. We see about uh, uh, 3%, almost 3% for all intra, and uh, 0.75 and 0.6 for random access and low delay configuration. Especially on the Kuwama plane, the gain is uh, it's much higher than this. So the last going to I want to mention is about uh, the optical flow-based uh, temporal motion vector prediction re refinement. So in this co going to for a particular intercoded block, we will first do the first pass motion compensation use the uh, initial motion vector coded in the B stream. So after that, we got the reference block and then we will calculate the numeric gradient to further refine the motion vector for the sub-blocks, then we will do the second pass uh, motion compensation, use the refined motion for the, for the sub-blocks. So both the uh, bidirectional and the unidirectional prediction are allowed with uh, any arbitrary temporal distance. So for this particular tool, we see about 2% gain in, in the random access uh, configuration. Okay, so that's all of my talk. I also have all the reference provided in these slides. They include uh, the current code base for the, for the uh, AOM video model and the latest research release is uh, 2.0 and also all the other tools used in the, in the common test. Um, yeah, thank you. That's all. Yeah. I'm ready for the, for the questions. We have one question. Yuri, please, yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I do have a question Can on. You turn on the mic. Hello? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Very nice talk. And I, I do have one, uh, just one comment on evaluation methodologies that uh, you seem to be using to uh, assess efficiency of codex in context of streaming. And based on what I understood is that you are looking at uh, upper boundaries or uh, what you call convex holes of uh, rate distortion characteristics and then you compute BD rate between those two. Well, in context of streaming, that's not correct. What happens in context of streaming is that you need to look at distributions of, uh, uh, of pool probabilities of each different renditions. And they will be very different in uh, different uh, uh, delivery scenarios. For example, if you streaming to TV sets, it is going to be the highest renditions that will be pulled with highest probability. If you're streaming to mobiles, you will be seeing uh, renditions in lower range dancing uh, as uh, higher probabilities. And if you're streaming to PCs, it will all depend on stretch factors of your web browsers and, and what window video is being rendered it as, as factors that would influence uh, that distribution. So what I believe is a m just more realistic and more fair, fair way of assessing performance is just to pick three different uh, possible applications with different distributions of probabilities of pool of different renditions and then uh, 
make assessment because this, if you just look at BDR, uh, BD rate, uh, it, it will just compute the average across entire range and, and just that might not be representative. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for the comment. Yeah, you are exactly right. So uh, this is a very different from uh, what we use in the real production. You know, in the real production for uh, at, the, at the player side, for every segment, you will receive different uh, resolution, right? So the, the actual quality observed at the, at the uh, client side is kind of a weighted average of uh, quality with different bitrate, uh, different resolution. Yeah, so this is uh, uh, you know, what we use in the real production. But for the uh, standard development, uh, this is uh, kind of, I see it's not perfect, but a little bit better than the pure just uh, single resolution random access configuration. Uh, in the sense that uh, when we calculate the metrics, quality metrics, we still focus on the single resolution stream. Um, because it's it's very hard to create a simulation environment to know, you know, based on the network bandwidth, what will be the eventually, or as you mentioned, what will be the final rendition that the uh, client side will receive. And every client could, could have different uh, uh, quality. So, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of the current limitation. Maybe we should discuss more. Yes, that's, I think, let's take this offline to the break. Thank you, yeah. Ryan. Thank you presentation and this brings us to the end of this session thank you for staying with us here next is the poster session which is just on the opposite here and also it is served with coffee break which is available in the demo rooms that is on this side here so please grab a coffee and then move into the poster area and keep discussing with the people here and I would propose we uh, uh, continue here, not 11.40, but uh, 11.50 uh, here with the main program for video coding tool, tools and optimization. Thank you and enjoy coffee break, posters and discussions. Uh, HDR video coding with MPEG-5 LCEVC. Yes. You have a clicker here and... minutes right should also show up okay here. I, I will try to be I will try to be yes. to do my best on that I'm not sure yeah all right okay hello everybody um, my name is uh, Lorenzo Ciccarelli I work as a principal research engineer in Vinova and um, thank you for the presentation thank you for the introduction to Christian and uh, today, um, I will talk about HDR video coding using MPEG-5 at CVC. So this uh, presentation is um, uh, presenting the result of a paper that we have presented, and it is uh, a summary of a series of tests we have done in the lab. And um, I would like to put you through all our uh, test and the, the test set and what we have done here. So this is, of course, not just my job. and. Uh, here, I wanted to thank the other member of the team, Amaya, Rick, and Simone. So the outline of this speech, I will put you through uh, a general scheme for MPEG-5 at CVC. Then we can talk about uh, the tools that uh, CVC is providing for HDR. And then I will describe the uh, testing setup. And uh, we will go through then the results and we draw some conclusion out of it. So first of all, we go for the general scheme of LCVC. Okay, so LCVC is um, an international standard. It, be, it has been published in October 2021, and for somebody who wants to have more details about it, I invite you to look at the ISO uh, document, which is the 23094-2, but this is a very dry uh, MPEG standard, so for somebody that wants a little bit more, you know, the basics of LCVC, maybe this slide can be useful. Um, LCVC is based on, uh, the concept behind LCVC is, uh, is that it's based on three layers. And uh, the base layer, the announce announcement layer one or sub-layer one, and the announcement layer two or sub-layer two. So how does it work? Let's follow it, uh, you know, the path that the images are going through the path, through the, through the system. So in general, an input sequence is uh, taken, is downscaled, 
and pass to the base encoder. Now, the base encoder is the base layer of LCVC. And uh, the particular thing about LCVC here is that the base layer can be um, any codec. And uh, LCVC in particular has been tested with uh, all the series of, HV of um, MPEG standard, uh, starting from AV AVC and up to VVC. And, but not just that, it has been tested with AVC and VP8 and VP9. And so let's say that the base, is, uh, the base encoder is generating a reconstructed image. This reconstructed image is then passed to the level one of enhancement. And uh, the uh, concept behind the level one is that it has the target to correct the impairment due to the, uh, base, encoder, uh, the base encoding, so the distortion caused by the base encoder. Now, this is done by uh, uh, comparing the input, down, the down sample input to the base encoder to the result, to the reconstructed image of the base encoder. Those residuals are taken, transformed, quantized, and entropy encoded, and they generate the first part of the LCVC bit stream. Uh, then these coefficients are inverse quantized, inverse transform, passed through an L1 filter, and uh, presented to an upscaler. The upscaler is upscaling the result in the image and present an upscaled image to the layer two uh, of enhancement. Here the residuals are calculated, so the difference between the upscaled image are calculated versus the input image, <coughs> and the, a certain residual are generated. Those residuals are then going through a temporal prediction, a transform and quantization and entropy encoder, generating the last bit of the uh, bit stream, LCVC bit stream. Now, the, uh, the, the target of the L2 is to correct the distortion that is caused by the downsampler and upsampler. So, having said that, uh, let's talk about the tools that LCVC are pro is providing to uh, better compress an HDR signal. So the first one I wanted to introduce is the ability of LCVC of working with different combination of the base bit depth and the base layer and the enhancement layer. So that means that you can have a base working, at, for example, at eight bit, but an enhancement layer working at 10. <clears throat> this is allowing basically uh, to enhance an encoder that is eight bit to a 10 bit. And this is very important, keep it in mind, because it will be the base of our setup. The second one is uh, the ability of LCVC in its main profile to, gen to work with uh, uh, images up to 14 bit bit depth. And this is covering most of the standard ADR, HDR that are in the market at the moment. There is also the possibility of having different uh, quantization for the chrominance, and this is important for HDR. You know that the quantization that is used for the chrominance has to be different in general, but again, with HDR, that is even more important. And finally, the last one is um, the user data. So the user data is an additional information that you can add to the transform at layer, at sublayer one, and uh, it, the LCVC is, uh, is uh, providing up to six bit of additional, ba additional data uh, to every transform at layer one. Oh, this is uh, uh, the way how you use this additional data. It's not, def it's not defined by the standard, but uh, a, an HDR, a LCVC encoder, decoder, as to be conformant, needs to know how to extract this information. Okay, so let's go through the testing setup. Uh, we have tested two setup. The first one is uh, the classical uh, setup you would use if you want to encode a enhance an HDR signal. So as you can see here in the input on the left, <coughs> you have a 10-bit input sequence, and this goes through this, the normal um, uh, diagram of <coughs> LCVC, and the base encoder is generating a 10-bit reconstructed image. The second one we have, uh, we have tried to test was uh, using one of the tools of LCVC, that is able to work with an 8-bit with a different uh, bit depth for the base compared to the enhancement. So what we have done on the second configuration is uh, having an encoder, namely, uh, for example, AVC, that is generating a reconstructed image at 8-bit, and, and then use the tools in LCVC to generate a 10-bit image to then fed feed the uh, layer one and layer two of enhancement. To do that, at, at, uh, after the downscaler, we have done a 
um, a conversion between 10 bit and 8 bit, and uh, uh, to, uh, to be sure that the base encoder would work in 8 bit. Now, this is not exactly a HDR to SDR conversion, but this is just to prove uh, the uh, flexibility of the standard. The only thing that we have added here, which is non standard, is um, a, de a debanding filter. The debanding filter is basically what you do, uh, you, what you use to remove the uh, impairment caused by converting 10 bit to 8 bit. Okay, so um, in terms of um, testing material, so we have been testing about 40 types of materials. Uh, ranging uh, from Q PQ and HLG, and then in terms of resolution, HD and UHD. For bit rates, we have used a uh, uh, range from 500K to 5 megabit for HD, and for UHD, we have covered a uh, range from 2 megabit to 16 megabit. Now, uh, we have done then an evaluation, both objective and uh, subjective. Um, the, the metrics we've used in terms of um, uh, objective metrics were VMAF, PSNR, and MSSIM. And MSSIM is taken particularly from the HDR tools. And this is to give us a wide range of result to see how the, the scheme performs in different conditions. Because we know that there might be a big variation between uh, objective metrics. So to try to cover all the case, we, we use different type of metrics. Then let's look at the result. So, the way how we um, uh, tested it was to uh, try to, uh, to work in two type of uh, settings. The first one we call ideal or more ideal theoretical because it's not uh, applicable in, in a real case scenario, is using as an anchor an X265 uh, in very slow preset. The LCVC is uh, enhancing a 8-bit X264 with a preset of very slow to 10 bit. Now here, as you can see, is like com comparing X264 with X265 at their best, okay? So the result uh, are not surprisingly that X265 wins. And uh, we know that between X265 and, and, and X264, there is a normally a, a, a benefit using X265 of about 40, 50%. And here you can clearly see that the result are are much, much less. So you can see that LCBC is already announcing somehow the gap between X265 and X264. But when then you talk about a different type of uh, settings, more uh, real, so when you try to um, normalize uh, in terms of complexity, so for example, you use in the second case, X265 in medium preset, but you keep the base to very slow, the picture changes. So you can see that now the uh, numbers are much more in favor of LCVC. And, and in some cases, you can over, e even see a benefit of using LCVC. Now, this is confirmed by the fact of, uh, you can see from these graphs. So this is Sunset Beach, HLG, UHD. You can clearly see that VMAF is preferring X, X265 native. Uh, however, the MSSIM is saying something else. Okay, so in the, in the MSSIM, same sequence is LCVC to win. And this is also representing across the board what is happening for this type of specific test. Uh, note that, uh, you know, in both of the cases, uh, the, especially in the first one, LCVC is three times faster than the native. In the second one, we try to compare at, same, at the same complexity. Now, if you do instead the second settings, so you are using a 10-bit base with a 10-bit announcement, and to do that, we have used, uh, again, uh, X265 very slow, and uh, we use the X265 10-bit as a base, always in, in very slow, to talk about the, you know, the ideal case, you can see that the, the results are completely different. You can clear a, a big benefit by using that CVC that is ranging up to 50% for UHD for PQ, and to 30 in sometimes for H a a a HLG. And the MSSIM, MSSIM has different values, but still confirming a benefit of using uh, LCVC. Now, if you then try to normalize in terms of speed, 
the picture is even better. So you can clearly see that also the MSSIM is getting better result and uh, mm, confirming that LCVC is, um, is, is, is producing a benefit and, and big compression uh, by enhancing a base at uh, uh, 10 bit. And uh, looking at some graphs here, you can clearly see the gap that is uh, uh, generated by LCVC, uh, and this is confirmed both in VMAF and in uh, MSSIM. Okay, so how, what we can summarize here. So in these tables, there are the same results that I showed on the slide before. So the first table is telling us that LCVC enables the feasibility of using a 10-bit HDR even if you have a base that is not able to do HDR. And uh, of course, the bit rate uh, penalties that you have is, uh, uh, is there, but is not uh, that, uh, that big that you would, you would expect because of the LCVC. However, if you look at the 10-bit base with 10-bit enhancement, you can see clearly that LCVC significantly enhance a 10-bit HDR base. And it is confirming more or less the result that we had uh, in SDR during the verification test in MPEG. Finally, I want to talk, about, talk you through the test that we have done by doing some expert viewing. So we know that the uh, metrics are not always saying the, the truth. So what we have done, we have set up a, a test bench using an HDR um, a monitor and uh, a play, playing out um, uh, the an HDR signal. And uh, we, in here, I am extracting just a, a bit of this um, uh, evaluation, comparing X265 10 bit with LCVC 10 bit, enhancing an 8 bit base X264, and then the LCVC 10 bit plus the base at 10 bit. Now you can clearly see that despite the metric saying that um, LCVC enhancing an 8 bit, uh, you have got the penalty in BD rates. The difference between X265 10 bit and X264 enhanced with LCVC are not that dramatic. And this is across the board, all the tests that we have done. But also, if you look at the last part, the last on the right, you can clearly see that LCVC enhancing an X265 10 bit is giving a better quality uh, compared to X265 10 bit native. I'm, I don't know how you can see on the screen, but I can see here very clearly, okay? I invite you to maybe look at the presentation later. Now, what is the conclusion here? Um, first of all, LCVC MPEG-5 with is the scheme itself is capable of using HDR native bit depth. Uh, it is compatible with SDR schemes. And uh, they have, there, uh, there are several tools that you can use to, uh, to further improve the HDR signal. And um, the experimental evaluation are confirming that the uh, HDR, the, that you can produce an HDR quality also starting from an 8-bit base, and uh, is also capable of reducing the average bit rate when you enhance a 10-bit base. And this is uh, going, going along a, a further reduction in complexity, uh, which is very important, which is the, part, the low complexity part of LCVC, of course. Now, we are, st we are continuing this study by applying a, a, the correct flow to convert HDR to SDR signal for the base by adding tone mapping. Because what is missing in this test is the tone mapping. And the result that we are getting now are quite satisfactory. So the quality of the base is much better when you use a tone mapping. And uh, so stay tuned, maybe on the next presentation we can present some result about this. So thank you very much. Questions. Thank you, Lorenzo. We have time for one question, if, if any. I would have one question about, maybe you can comment a bit on the deployment status of LCVC. Maybe you have some insights here. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I should have mentioned. Um, for this, I think it's better that you, that uh, any of you is interested in that, uh, goes to the booth that we, we have at 212 in the expo room and talk with, uh, with the guys there. We are demonstrating an UHD P60 X264 real time. And that's one of the deployment, one of the implementation, let's say, what we okay. say. And, uh, I, but I invite you to go there and talk with the guys there that can give you much more indication on this. Good, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.
Thank you, Lorenzo. And this is a good reminder to go also to the expo rooms and see the people there and see the demos there. And we move on to the next talk, which is about VVC in the cloud and browser playback. It works. It's a joint talk by Uh, Adam from Fraunhofer HHI and Christian from Bitmovin. And I think Christian will start. And you have a timer here. We have a timer. 18 Please. minutes to go. Perfect. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, yeah, let's go. Thank you. Thank you very much for attending. So, um, yeah, VPC in the cloud. Uh, quick introduction. I'm Ad uh, Adam is right here. Uh, Christian, that's me. So, Adam from Fraunhofer HHI and me from uh, Bitmovin. And um, so, uh, kind of the agenda, we can skip that. Um, basically, what we did, we did um, a, a collaboration between the between between us two. So we got talking, and um, and then basically uh, we figured out that the Fraunhofer HHI was developing this open source uh, VVC encoder, and uh, we had Bitmovin. We have this uh, highly flexible cloud-based uh, transcoding solution, and then basically the idea was, um, why can't we make a um, make it make some experience with this like put that encoder into the cloud uh, cloud solution and see what happens um, basically prove that it's a it's a viable thing to do that VVC works and that you can deploy it also in the cloud and that it's uh, it's already there and um, yeah so first of all I, I'm, I'm going to take the first part I'm going to go a bit into the details of the Bitmove in cloud encoder and how we added the VVC encoder into there and then Adam is going to uh, drill down a little bit more on the uh, coding performance, um, like like um, uh, quality, uh, things like that, and more on the on the specifics about the, the implementation of VVENC. So first, the Bitmoving Cloud Encoder. Um, you might know we have a um, uh, basically what we do for transcoding is that everything for us runs uh, cloud agnostic in the cloud, so everything is containerized and then running on different instances and, and different sizes in the cloud, uh, also in the spot market. And um, so basically, we have uh, one instance that is taking care of, that is running a, 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 a service that is doing, that we call the splitter, which is taking the input file and splitting it up into smaller segments on the time axis. Uh, these can be uh, four, seven, 30 seconds, one minute. It really depends on the config, so it doesn't have to align with like the dash segments that we output. Um, it can also be longer for quality purposes. Uh, and then basically, we have a range of uh, spot instances usually running that are doing all of the all of the transcoding. So they are running something we call the video transcode service, and um, so we're pushing all of the all of the transcodings, uh, all of these uh, segment transcodings there. And uh, with the nomenclature here, I just wanted to introduce that like the first number is indicating the segment on the time axis, and the second one is like um, indicating which of the renditions we're transcoding. Right. So that's another thing that we can parallelize upon because usually we have a whole bitrate ladder, so we're not encoding one rendition only, but it's usually a range of renditions that we're transcoding to. And um, so let's drill down onto one of these encoding jobs, and then basically what we're doing in there is, first of all, we're taking the input that we got from the splitter, we're doing a decode, and then depending on the config for the different, um, for the different entries in the ladder, we're doing scaling, of course, um, and then there's the encode that's coming up, so we're doing, uh, the, the there's, there's a core encoder that is running, after that, we do a muxing. It can be multiple output muxings, and then the final step is to upload this to cloud storage or a CDN that the, pro that the customer provided. Um, <laughs> I, I just wanted to mention this is absolutely an incomplete picture, so there's a lot of more stuff that is running in and around this um, de depending on the workflow that we do. So this is super incomplete, but this is the basic workflow that we, that we operate on. And then basically what we just had to do is replace this core encoder with the VV VVENC encoder. Uh, to enable VVC encoding. So that was, um, so, so how is that so simple? Uh, because at the core, we are using a C style library for all of our core encoders. And this is a super common thing. So basically all encoders that are out there have this. They are implemented as a library and they have a very common style of interface, which is usually, usually in C. Um, you have some way of configuring it and then you push frames into the encoder. Um, then you push at some point that this was it. Uh, and then on the other side, you're just pulling the encoded data out of the encoder. Very abstract, but it works basically like this for all encoders. And that was how we got this in so quickly. Um, I also did some, so <laughs> I also did a tiny, uh, tiny contribution at least to VVENC with that. I proposed like to change that a little bit and worked a bit on that um, to make it work in the end. And, and yeah, it, it works. So basically the results from our side are it works. 
in the cloud. We had very little problems, some, something here and there, but, um, but nothing too major. And if we did a comparison um, of VV VVC to something like X265 with a, with a profile, we could see that there was about 40% of bitrate reduction for HD content. Um, we saw that, the, that actually there was, a, it's a funny effect that the con uh, convex hull complexity is actually reduced because for VVC it often turns out that the highest resolution is actually also the best one, even if you're going down to low bit rates. So you don't need that many, um, that many steps and you don't need to, like if you're calculating the optimal convex hull, you don't need that many experiments around that or probing codes. Um, and then there's also, yeah, prediction continuity even for progressive streams, so that is, this is referring to something that is called um, AB, uh, adaptive resolution change in the bitstream, right? That's a feature of VVC where you can switch a resolution between, um, between, uh, between renditions and it doesn't have to be the same rendition. It can also be a different one and then there's scaling happening in the decoder. That's also a really cool feature. Um, yeah, there's also some limitations to the current state of VVENC. Um, we noticed that there's a pretty high memory consumption currently, uh, but I think the HHI guys are working on it to bring that down. Um, we didn't run into a problem in the cloud though, right? So we can just borrow more, we can just get more memory that's not that expensive and it's okay and it works. Um, only x86, 64 is um, um, working so far, but also not a problem for us. We only do that anyways. Um, and then yeah, with regard to the segment durations, like where you can place these CR, um, like these uh, random access points in the bitstream, there's still some limitations, but yeah. <laughs> also also being worked on from the VV Eng side at least. And then lastly, I just wanna, from the BitMoon side, just present some results that we got for the cloud cost. So we ran a certain configuration uh, for different uh, encoders, and then basically we just calculated the, uh, we just looked up how much money did we spend in the cloud for the encodes, added that up, and normalized it to the AVC cost. So this is like relative cost, so for AVC the factor is one. Then for HEVC, the factor is about 2.2. This is also what we charge to our customers. Um, AV1, we saw like a, a factor of 4.5, and for VVC, it was like a factor of eight um, compared to AVC encoding. So even though AVC, uh, VVC isn't that far along, the, the results are still impressive, right? So it's not a huge ad added complexity on top, and, it, and it's working already in the cloud. All right, and with that, I will hand over to Adam to talk more about the implementation, quality, things like that. All right, great, thanks. Uh, so I'm really glad to see those numbers. Like there was a lot of talk about uh, how VVC is super complex and you know, I, I'm very glad we reached like single digits and you know, we're in the ballpark there with, with other encoders. Uh, here just to recap, you can see a graph with uh, you know, different quality presets uh, for our VV encoder as well as uh, two curves for um, other open source encoders for open uh, state, uh, for other state of the art standards. So the AOM ENC and uh, X265. And basically the graph, it has you know, two axes. The one is encoding time, the other one is uh, the achievable quality within that time. And there's one takeout that I like, like for VV ENC, uh, at least in the open source encoder space, for the, like for a specific runtime, we provide the best quality and for a specific quality, we can achieve that actually in the lowest runtime, at least, uh, you know, uh, within the encoders that we present, uh, present there. Um, all right, now I want to dig a little bit deeper into the, the one point that Christian already made. We uh, measured, like we measured VVENC versus X265 and what we did, we wanted to have this cloud application. So we created a ladder manually, basically encoding every possible rendition, and then uh, you know just measuring which rendition is best at which uh, bitrate. And what we found out that you know when you um, compare the optimal ladder for X265 and the optimal ladder for VVENC, we achieve you know depending on which measure you uh, you use between 40 and 50 percent bitrate savings. Of course, as we already uh, saw in the discussions previously, you cannot really compare BD rates between ladders because it's also about how often you use renditions and so on. But you know, this gives you a ballpark. But one other experiment that we did, we create, like we compared this optimal ladder with a 1080p only encoding at like all of the bit rates, only 1080p. And as you can see, the BD rate deviation for VVENC is really small. It's like one to 3% depending on the on the quality measure, as well as for X265, this is the fourth column, 
uh, the difference is much higher, which means not using the optimal, uh, the optimal resolution for each rendition has a, much my, uh, has a much higher price for X265 than for BBNG. And while we do not understand it completely yet, it really looks like uh, you know, VBC and VBNG especially can extract those details, those important details much better without you know, uh, putting bits into computing those irrelevant parts of the video. But yeah, this requires a little bit uh, more research, so I'm very excited to see what, what we can find out about it later. Um, all right, so we did all of those encodings, and now, of course, we want to view the videos. How do we view the videos? Uh, Christian compiled a table with you know, expected decoder support for different uh, various standards. And while we do expect that VBC will be available uh, on Android, on Apple, on uh, you know, TVs, system on chips, uh, it's probably not gonna be available on the browser. Uh, so what we did, we tried to you know, create a workaround for this, uh, which we did by including a WebAssembly built into our VBDEC uh, decoder. Basically, we take the source code as it is, and we run it through a WebAssembly compiler, the, the C source code. And it really uh, performs very nice. It's around one half of the native speed. So if you would uh, run the native uh, build on the same machine, the WebAssembly build is around half of the, uh, of the FPS. Um, we have a demo website available, so you know, uh, you can ask me for a, for a demo or maybe you know just set up a demo we have a, also a github repository with the like with the javascript code that is required to s set this up and also on the right you can see we also have been doing steady progress with uh, vvdeck with re regards to performance also with regards to memory and just last week we uh, released a new version which also introduces uh, native arm support which we're very excited about. So maybe we can do like native uh, ARM playback soon. Um, one more thing I want to mention is while we were, you know, we're doing this development, of course, everyone is a developer. So the computers we're doing on, they are like, you know, best processor, maximal memory and stuff. So we don't always notice this stuff early on, like, you know, the decoder has a higher memory consumption. Once we started developing this uh, WebAssembly uh, decoding support, we noticed, damn, like we cannot do some stuff because the, the decoder actually uses too much memory. And you know, this is where the, um, where the circle you know, kind of closes. Through going to WebAssembly, we were forced to reduce this memory, uh, which in turn you know, actually improved the performance of the, of the decoder. So this was a very nice uh, sidetrack in the development. Um, and yeah, on the right here, you can see a, a screenshot of our demo. So, you know, uh, again, if you're interested to see, uh, please ask me or just uh, have a look at our GitHub repositories. Uh, all VPC functionalities are available, also including this um, adaptive resolution change without uh, prediction breaks. 4K would theoretically be possible, but you know, since it's only half as uh, fast as it would be uh, on a native build, uh, it might be too slow in the browser, and 1080p mostly works just fine. And actually, since there is not so much support for, for VVC, for me personally, like just setting up this demo on the local host is like the easiest way to, to view a VVC video right now. So you know, if everyone's inter anyone's interested, have a look. Um, all right, now to conclude and give you some outlook, uh, VVC today, as we talked with Christian, we you know, we have this free software available, VVNG, VVDEC. Uh, we have some uh, deployments of VBC, so it has been selected for SBTVD 3.0. There has been some test deployments on, over satellite and internet. You can have a look at the, at the Atimo, uh, Atim demos. Uh, Thibaut can explain to you what nice thing they're doing. Uh, and there are, you know, uh, end user devices are starting to pop up. So, you know, we had uh, TCL, show interest in uh, VBC at CES. We had some MediaTek announcements. There is some chatter that I want, don't want to go into. And what do we expect from uh, about VBC? Maybe coming year, maybe year after. So I do hope we get uh, some proper player support. Um, as Ian mentioned, we have this FFmpeg uh, fork that supports VBC, but of course it's unofficial. So I'm, I'm very much hoping it can be you know, supported officially sometime. 
uh, our web application. We're going to be developing this, and we hope to connect it with Dash so we can actually do progressive streaming. And of course, I'm very much excited to see all of those uh, encoding services, including you know, Bitmovin and uh, whatever other tests are coming. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Adam and Christian. And do we have a question? Oh, yes, Irash, please. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, so the question was what the what the segment length was, how we how we handle that internally in the encoder. Um, doesn't have to do that much with VVC because we're doing that for en any encoder. But um, yeah, basically it's uh, yeah we're splitting the video. It depends a bit on the configuration that the customer does. Usually the customer wants to have a um, HLS or Dash output, so that you have a certain uh, segment length, and then usually so the segment size is a multiple of that length. And um, yeah, we do. There's, there's some tuning we do internally on that, so it's intransparent, it's, it's basically, I mean, the user also doesn't, doesn't have to care about that too much. Uh, and then of course we optimize that a bit for quality and scalability in the cloud, right? We wanna keep both, we, want, we have a trade-off between them. Um, but for the quality, we don't see a huge impact, but a little bit, of course, on the segments if you, if you restart an encoder or if you, if you start it over again. But um, we also we also tuned the system a bit to also be resilient for short segments and on the on the edges to not to not give any visual artifacts or anything. So yeah. Okay. Thank you again. Okay. Thank you. And let's move on to the next talk. That is coming from Nelson from MediaKind about optimizing real time encoders with machine learning. And the stage is yours. You have a timer here. Just Hi, uh, I'm Nelson Francisco. I'm a principal video compression engineer at MediaKind, uh, and I will be presenting uh, this uh, optimizing real-time encoders with ML, which I co-authored with my colleague, Julien Letanu. So um, every 10 years or so, we have a new generation of video codecs we've seen with a clear aim of doubling the compression efficiency over the predecessor. But this all usually comes at the expense of a never growing set of encoding tools. So more prediction modes, more block sizes, more flexible block structures and referencing, higher accuracy for the motion estimation and motion refinement and so on. So if you are targeting real time applications where um, you are very limited or constrained on your uh, hardware resources, uh, this can be quite challenging. Um, especially because it's also accompanied by uh, an increase in resolution and frame rate and so on. Um, X264 and X265 try to deal with this with the concept of presets that you are all familiar. So you try to trade um, basically uh, compression efficiency uh, by disabling uh, or restricting some tools. Um, the presets um, Overall, they work, but they have some limitations, as you all well know. First, you have a very, um, well, you have some coarse granularity, so you only have a finite number of presets. Uh, sometimes you may be restricted to select a preset that doesn't fully use the potential of your hardware, just because the next preset of, um, with better quality will not fit or will uh, potentially uh, not run real time on your hardware that will require more expensive hardware, for example. Um, and the other limitation is that the presets are defined for um, generic content, so they are supposed to work on all kinds of content. And obviously, different types of content will have different requirements and will benefit more from different tools. Um, so the idea is if we can uh, tune some, somehow those presets to um, well adjust according to the video quality, you don't, uh, to the video content, you no longer have to deal with the worst case scenario. You don't have to define the preset based on the most difficult content that can uh, be presented to your system. So our uh, proposal was to use uh, machine learning for this, for this purpose, uh, not only to uh, optimize 
well, high-level decisions like how, how you're configuring your encoder, how you're limiting your tools, but also to uh, directly um, shortcut um, or, um, well, perform so low-level decisions. Uh, you will all be thinking that over the past uh, couple of days we heard a lot about AI and ML used for video compression. Um, and you see oh, how is that different, but you, you, you will uh, easily realize that um, those solutions can be very, very distinct. For example, yesterday we have Wave 1 uh, suggesting just a native AI encoder and all the encoder is replaced with AI uh, and starting from scratch. Uh, then you can go to another level that, for example, we heard in Yanni presentation, which uh, VVC is considering um, an extension where machine learning tools or AI tools can be included in your tool set. Uh, or we are taking it at an even lower level where we just stay in the standard, stay fully compliant. We are just using or leveraging AI and ML to perform local decisions to shortcut modes uh, or to define the encoder configuration. So with this, we can have a more efficient codec that maximizes the, the usage of the hardware resources and uh, improves basically the, the quality of the video that you can uh, deliver at a given cost point. So I'll start with the example on how we leverage ML to um, drive the whole, those high level uh, encoding strategies. So if we start, um, as I was mentioning before, you will realize that different kinds of content will have very different characteristics that um, basically benefit from different tools. So if you look for to this cartoon, for example, um, usually uh, you don't, well, you need a very high spatial allocation because you have artificial textures, very detailed with sharp edges. So any um, issues on the spatial allocation will result in severe uh, artifacts that will be very easily perceived by um, viewers. On the other hand, in this particular case, motion estimation is relatively simple because motion is, is simple, there's only a few number of uh, objects moving, it's easy to predict, but it has to be precise as well due to the lack of uh, spatial masking I was mentioning. If you move for sport, to sports, for example, um, you start having much more spatial and temporal masking. So you probably don't need to be as careful with your spatial allocation, but you need to be very careful with your motion estimation. So your mo motion estimations become very important in the quality of the video you're going to deliver. You have lots, you know, typically lots of elements moving in the picture, moving in different dire directions and so on. But uh, you probably can go away if the motion, you know, with the motion precision not being quite there thanks to the spatial and the temporal um, masking. Um, and if you move, for example, for, to news, again, um, spatial allocation uh, becomes very important, especially, uh, well, to, to have good quality in the face of the presenters, for example, and have sharp edges on text and minimize like ringing and all that kind of artifacts in text that will become very apparent to the viewers. So based on these observations, you will you know, easily conclude that the one size fits all presets may be suboptimal. So our idea was trying to optimize how the resources are used, which tools are used on each situation so that only the tools that bring the best benefit, that have the, the highest rate ratio between the compression efficiency and the computational costs are used and are prioritized. To do that, we developed a new um, block that we, we call preset manager or configuration manager that's based on some a priori information such as coding format, target bitrate and so on, and some, uh, well, information about our system, such as uh, the CPU um, capabilities and the, the, the time available to encode each frame. Uh, and based in information, we can get straight from the look-ahead encoder um, that will um, describe to some extent the characteristics of the input content. We can steer and define how our encoder, our main encoder, which is where the bulk of the complexity uh, resides, will be configured and will behave. 
by having a feedback loop, um, we can monitor how the CPU load is doing and with that readjust the preset manager so that all the resources are used. So the preset manager can readjust with this feedback loop, guaranteeing that all the resources are used in, in the best possible way. So in the simple example with the legacy model, with those fixed presets, uh, you will have you know, different types of content that will, could be presented uh, over time. In this case, you will have to choose a preset that works for your worst case scenario. That will be content D, which is sports, quite hard to encode. So that will dictate the maximum quality you will um, be able to achieve with a fixed preset in this hardware. For the content that require that is easier to encode and requires less um, processing, you will be basically wasting processing power that could be used to improve video quality. So by uh, readjusting the configurations on those cases and, uh, well, channeling it to the tools that bring the most um, impact on the video quality, you are basically boosting the quality of that other content. And over time, you know, on average, you're improving the quality of experience of your viewers. So the two big advantages is first, you can have a guaranteed density and by not having to, um, well, basically target or define your system for the worst case scenario, you can basically fit more channels on the same resources because you know that if content becomes very difficult, you may have to drop the quality a little bit, but you no longer fall into cases that you will be dropping frames of having to skip frames. Uh, on the, in the other hand, as I was um, mentioning earlier, in those cases where when, when given preset kind of doesn't fill your hardware resources, um, but the next preset won't fit, uh, you kind of can generate intermediate points so that uh, you are maximizing your infrastructure usage effectively. Um, another um, advantage is um, operational because you, well, the operator no longer has to pre-decide which preset is going to use for the system. You have a system, you let the encoder run and it will self-configure to achieve the best quality possible on those resources. So that takes the responsibility out of the operator. So for an example, as a quick example, we um, used um, this um, ACT approach uh, in uh, ABR encoding with uh, several, um, well, with, with several um, profiles uh, in a ABR lather where the ACT was applied only on the 1080p, so the top profile. And both the legacy that was using fixed presets and the new adaptive presets will run exactly on the same uh, number of virtual CPUs. Uh, we achieved an average uh, saving of 90% um, to achieve the same, um, well, video quality, which in this case is measured through SSIM. So that is um, the results for the tests in a wide range of content, ranging from sports to movies and so on. And on some specific content we've seen, we observed gains of up to 40%. So next, I'm going to give an example how we further used machine learning to optimize low-level uh, decisions. And on that, the example I will give will be for uh, CTU splitting decisions. So as you know, for example, HEVC allows uh, many different block sizes. So each CTU is recursively split, meaning that you will have to optimize different block sizes uh, in order to, to, to decide which one is the most efficient representation for the block. So that means computing uh, predictions and transforms over several block sizes. If you could determine uh, beforehand which blocks are unlikely to be used, you can just um, shorten wealth, not compute the modes that you believe won't be useful. So. You could try to get some heuristic, but it becomes very difficult because when, by looking at those two images, you will probably um, realize that oh, blocks with high textures and high uh, sharp edges are much more likely to be split, but you still have the legs of the player um, in your left that um, are not being split just because they're predicting very well from another frame. Uh, and you have blocks in the grass that are being split, although they look very similar to the blocks nearby. So clearly there's also a dependency with the prediction quality that will be also have a dependency on the frame types. 
Uh, other than that, from those two images, you also realize that there is a big dependency on the QP. Um, you know, if you're uh, aiming more aggressive or higher compression ratios, you will, you will be uh, splitting less because you're more cared about compression, uh, uh, about bitrate, and not as worried about distortion. So in our approach, we used a three-step, basically, where uh, the training is performed off, um, offline. So we started with this very large um, data set that we encoded at multiple KPs, uh, multiple configurations, uh, using a full RDO. So, uh, and the encoder will be basically dumping those STC metrics or spatiotemporal complexity metrics to files, as well as the optimal segmentation generated by um, the full audio encoder. So we, in this case, we could use, for example, convolutional neural networks to try to extract the features. But because we were targeting real live applications, real time applications where um, complexity is very important, we decided to reuse metrics we already had available and that were computing in small blocks and that we could aggregate such as intra-complexity, which is basically the residue of the intra-estimation, uh, inter-complexity, gradients, or um, motion uh, indicators such as motion vector costs and entropy. So given those spatial temporal complexity files, we tried to, well, we train the deep neural network to infer how the block will be split, or each CTU will be split, uh, using as a ground truth the optimal segmentation obtained with a full audio uh, encoder. And after training this deep neural network, uh, we just implanted it in the encoder. Um, so it's relatively lightweight and it can run um, real time on CPUs just by um, optimizing it with some SSM, SMD uh, instructions. So in this case, the content arrives, the look ahead computes the metrics, passes it to the, the, the AI processor that will uh, infer how CTU should be split, and then this will shortlist the modes to be applied um, on the main encoder. The beauty of this all is like neural networks are a probabilistic on principle. So um, basically what the neural network will return you is the probability of splitting or not splitting a given CTU, and then what you you can do with this is, you, you know, you can use it in the way uh, that mostly favors you. So you can use like a single decision threshold that just says, okay, if the probability of splitting is high enough, I will just try the splitting uh, option. If it's low, I will just try the non-splitting option. Well, not having to compute the other one. Or you can use a dual decision threshold where you will uh, be splitting a CUs where you are very, well, your neural network is very confident should be split and not splitting a CUs where your neural network is very confident it shouldn't, it, it shouldn't be split. But you can create that gray area where you still try both options. For example, if the neural network thinks oh, there's a 50-50 chance of this CU to be split, you can still try both options. That means you won't be saving as many uh, resources, but you uh, are much likely to incur on, um, well, uh, efficiency degradation due to uh, non-optimal decisions. And you can see how this can tie with the previous um, ACT, because if you have more resources, you can in increase the, the, the width of this uh, area where we try both options. And you know, if you start being very constrained on resources, you can shrink this area and converge to a single decision threshold. So um, this presents some uh, results for, um, well, that, those are average results for a test set composed of uh, several 4K 60 frames per second. Um, uh, sequences so that were encoded in CPU in real time. So it's you know in, it's a quite a challenging application uh, if you are re well rest if you are limited on the hardware resources you are uh, using. Uh, and when I refer hardware resources, this can be uh, in the cloud. I mean, this is targeting the cloud as well, and that's why we were so uh, focused on trying to get the inference to run in, on CPU. So we become completely. Um, well, we don't have, we don't need a specific hardware anymore and makes the solution much more cloud agnostic. 
So you can see that the machine learning guided methods achieved best results than the reference that used a full audio. And you'll ask, oh, why is that? Well, because we basically could reuse the computation that was saved by not performing some of the splitting, method, the splitting modes to enable other tools. In this case, the 64 by 64 CUs were disabled in order to be able to run real time. While with using ML, for example, we could enable 64s by 64s. So we have more options. We have potentially a suboptimal uh, decision on the other CU sizes, but we gain that extra option that brings um, compression benefits. And on the right, you'll see the complexity normalized to the complexity of the reference encoder. So you can see that in all cases, or on all this range, which is basically the usable ranges in, in real applications, that's the higher will be around 40 or 50 megabits per second. You see that you have a complexity is lower than the reference encoder. So you both saved computation and improved the quality. So this same approach, exact same approach, can be applied then to other areas like um, or other decisions like estimate likelihoods of interest and intra modes, so you don't need to, to, to compute them all or you can uh, exclude some, to shortlist the re direction on inter predictions or uh, to estimate skips, for example. The advantages, low cost uh, deep neural networks uh, can be implemented in CPUs using just SMDs quite efficiently because they're not very big. Uh, again, we, we um, prioritized uh, the low complexity over accuracy. Uh, we prefer to have a slightly lower accuracy in something that could run real time, um, good enough. Um, and uh, it effectively uh, optimizes the video quality and the hardware resources usage. Where does it work better? Well, the more complex your data is and more varied, the more adaptation you have. So, and it works better also when you are able to, to combine both those high level and those le level decisions. And that is all, thank you. Thank you, Nelson. I guess we have time for one question. Then I have one which is about the real time. So what, what do you mean by real time? Do you have any measures here? Uh, well, real time in this case is being able, well, let's say if your input is free, 60 frames per second, is that you're guaranteeing your, in, your, your output is encoded at uh, 60 frames per second. Did, did you test any maximum frames? Like? Uh, that will be obviously hardware dependent. You can increase your resources to achieve higher frame rates, for example, but. Uh, Good. Thank you. Thank you. And this concludes this session. Thank you for being here. And now I will hand over to Alex for the next part, which is the demo session. Alex. Okay, so apologies for not having sli uh, slides for this one. Our Wi-Fi is uh, not always working. So we introduced a new, uh, a new component uh, during this uh, Malhai uh, Malha video. So we now have uh, uh, an expo component, and as a result, we have uh, several interesting, de uh, interesting demos. So th there are six of them uh, in rooms 207, uh, two, uh, 208, and uh, 210. And uh, wanted to, intru uh, to introduce uh, the innovative companies that are uh, showing them, and uh, let uh, let them spend uh, a couple of minutes explaining what uh, what these are about. So uh, first, I wanted to inv uh, to invite uh, Atem to speak. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Thibaut Biatek, I'm with uh, ATEM Innovation Department. Uh, I would like to tell you a few words about the demonstration we have in room uh, 210. So basically we have two demonstrations for which we would like to invite you. Uh, the first one is about the end-to-end -end live uh, production and transmission that is achieved in uh, uh, this room here. 
so basically, we demonstrate uh, a live uh, encoding and feed, uh, and feed to uh, AWS encoding platform where uh, we achieve both uh, AVC and live uh, VVC encoding in uh, low latency. Um, <coughs> in the room 210, we have a downlink with some devices that are, that are capable of uh, showing you uh, a live VVC uh, playback. So that's for the first demo. And the second one is about one of the posters we have. Uh, it showcases uh, how VVC, uh, DVBI, and multicast ABR can be used together uh, to deliver video services over uh, mobile devices. Um, so please uh, join us in room uh, 210 for uh, discussing those demo. Thank you. Continuing in the alphabetic order, so next is uh, Dolby. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. So I'm JC Moiser from Dolby. Uh, we have a demonstration in room 208, uh, right across the right across the hall. A pretty exciting demo, and uh, I'll get to it. But first off, I want to I want to thank you know uh, NBC and Comcast. I think all of us still marvel at the presentation they made yesterday about the uh, the workflow they rolled out for the Olympics, and that was quite the amazing feat to pull off. And I want to thank them for that. But more importantly for us, at least for Dolby, um, they we are really happy that they trusted them and, and partnering with us to not only build a really scalable workflow, but build a workflow that is also scalable in terms of bringing uh, advanced quality of experience such as Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. So long story short, the demo across the hall is essentially the Olympic experience uh, in Dolby Vision and Dolby Atmos. You will be able to experience that, uh, being able to compare you know, standard uh, HDR di distribution versus Dolby Vision distribution and Dolby Atmos. So pretty exciting stuff across the hall. Thank you very much, and we invite you to go, uh, uh, to go and have a look. Thank you very much. Uh, continuing next is uh, Alicard. Hello, colleagues. My name is Victoria Tuzawa. I'm a business development manager at Alicard. Well, first of all, I would like to thank um, the whole team for organizing this event because it's like it's long awaited after COVID. So we are here together in person. Well, um, like a few words about Elecard. We have a 32 year experience in digital video, but um, today we are here to meet our colleagues and to share our expertise. Today we are mainly focused on video analyzers. You can test it out uh, in the room 210, so welcome. And about uh, video analyzers, we have two types of video an analyzers. The first one is file-based uh, to check corrupted streams and to check video encoding quality and um, uh, compliance check. We support the latest uh, video formats and um, uh, also the latest um, information, the, the latest implementation that we have is HDR representation. So please welcome to to, to check it <laughs> with us. Um, and uh, the second type of analyzer that we have is for is, uh, live stream and real time video analyzers called Bora. Uh, Bora is uh, mainly software, uh, has this mainly software uh, nature. 
so it consists of uh, two parts. The first one is Bora Props, and the second one is Bora Software Server. The so Bora Props are installed across your distributed network. It gathers information, send it to the Bora server, where you can uh, see the, uh, the representation of what is happening in your uh, distributed network. It monitors QS and QE parameters. So please visit us at, uh, at the room 210. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next comes Harmonic. So hello everyone, so you probably see my face a lot uh, this week, um, but I want to share a few demos we have. So of course, on our small table, we're a big company, but we're on a small table. And uh, just want to share with you, we don't have a booth at NAB, but we take the time to come and visit people here. So anyway, Harmonic will show, uh, is showing actually our VOS 360 platform. So it's a cloud native, a public cloud that is uh, powering the number one uh, in terms of number of subscribers uh, in, the, in the world. And you will see a very interesting demonstration for those who are uh, interested by redundancy. We have a cloud geo redundancy running live out of a tablet. So you can talk to our sales team. And of course, you will also, if you want to know more about the Comcast and BCU deployment that is displayed on the Dolby Vision, Dolby Boost, you'll see also our engineers here that can talk to you about what we do. And I'm also very happy to share the fact that we power the Vinova demonstration with uh, UHD LCEVC. I see people still skeptical, but one day you will love it. Thank you very much. Now to, some, uh, to something completely different. So uh, liquid. So this is uh, something that is other than encoding and uh, also pretty exciting. I just have one slide. I'll show it really quick. I just want to thank everyone for their time. Oh, you can't so sense. Okay. We're in the area of disrupting uh, the data center, essentially. You can think about Liquid as kind of taking what hyperscale companies have done in terms of uh, cookie sheet oriented kind of provisioning of cloud services uh, and bringing it into the on-prem environment. So if you've got any PCIe devices, GPUs, Blackmagic cards, uh, NVMe devices, we can essentially put them on a PCIe fabric and build a bare metal machine that accelerates your workload. So, you know, I encourage you to come over to our booth over in meeting room 210, uh, take a look at the, the idea of composable disaggregation we're already kind of revolutionizing the industry, jumping beyond hyper-converged. NVIDIA is embracing us, so uh, just take a look. You'll be, I think you'll be impressed with what we've been able to, to do over the last three to four years. So I just want to thank Alex and everyone else for giving us a chance to present uh, to this audience as well. Thank you. So thank you so much. and. Uh, Next presenter is uh, Avino. And, uh, oh. Okay. Thank you, Alex. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, so um, you'll find us in one of the rooms here. You won't see the Vinova logo. You'll see a bright LCVC logo. What we're showing for the skeptics in the audience, you know who you are. It's a live 4K P60 LCVC uh, demo. Fundamentally, LCVC, for those of you who don't know it, is one of the MPEG standards. It's slightly different, not only because it has the longest acronym, but because it's an enhancement. So it works enhancing other standards. And in this case, we're showing it on a harmonic XOS platform enhancing AVC. So doing 4K P60 with AVC at uh, anything between 10 and 15 megabits a second, we show it on the 65-inch uh, TV. 
And it's also low complexity, so in terms of decoding, we can run the decode uh, uh, partly in software, so we're showing it on a numlogic power set of box. Um, again, decoding live 4K P60 on a big telly. Again, as soon as you see, as you enter the room, follow the kind of like big red logo of LCBC and you'll see the demo. Thank you very much. Thank you, and last but not the least, uh, video clarity. Hi, my name is Blake Homan with Video Clarity. Thanks everybody for sticking around and listening. Thanks, you, thank you, Alex. Um, video Clarity, we manufacture uh, video quality test and measurement solutions for broadcasters and equipment manufacturers. We've got our Clearview system here in room 210 and it, we, it's a full reference measurement system, so you can take your source video, compare it to your process video, get perceptual metrics, as well as visual assist for subjective viewing. We've also got our newest addition, which is the ability to um, QA Dolby Vision enhancements. So you can look at the source asset on one monitor and the Dolby Vision on the other. So come on by and take a look, please. Thanks. Again, I want to, uh, to thank everyone who is showing a demo here and uh, invite everyone uh, who is here in the room to go, and to go and visit. Thank you so much. And uh, now the most important part, lunch. So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the after lunch session. There is no better uh, time of day to discuss congestion control than the after lunch session. I'm filling in for Professor Michael Shapira and Ravid Hadar, who unfortunately couldn't travel uh, this week. And we are going to talk about uh, network congestion control and its impact on video streaming QE. So first, video streaming QE, we are all aware of the, how they are measured, rebuffering ratio and rebuffering events the average ABR bitrate uh, for the session, which uh, reflects the picture resolution, and of course, time behind live, that is very important for real time uh, and sports streaming. Uh, startup time is all, also there, but in this presentation, I will talk about the first three. So what's the role of congestion control in ABR streaming? So, uh, the content sits at the edge cache of the CDN, and the task of the congestion controller is to stream it in an optimal way through the last mile network to the end devices. The last mile network is the most complicated part of the network, the ISP network, which is uh, the most chaotic and most congested part of the network, and we also include in the last mile delivery uh, the cellular networks, the Wi-Fi network at home, so the congestion controller needs to track the optimal sending rate in which to send, to send the data packets. Now this is, tracking the optimal sending rate is a bit challenging because it changes all the time as the network congestion uh, changes along the time. Now if you send too fast, the data packets will be dropped or queued and, and the result could be a rebuffering at the client. If you send too low, then the user will uh, get standard def definition and not HD. And the task of the congestion control controller is even more challenging because the ABR decision uh, is taken at the client. So whatever the congestion controller is doing, the client will decide independently which quality to send. Now, uh, in this discussion, we are talking about HTTP streaming over TCP. So we will discuss three different approaches for TCP congestion control. So uh, as you remember, uh, I'm sure standard uh, legacy TCP, TCP Reno in uh, congestion avoidance it grows its rate linearly, linearly, 
and then encounters a packet drop and then drops the rate and continue to grow linearly in a kind of a sawtooth paradigm. The first congestion control that we are trying to talk about is cubic. Cubic has a more aggressive uh, behavior. It grows exponentially uh, across uh, the, the point in which it last drops its rate. So whenever it encounters a packet drop, this is uh, noted as W max, and then it grows exponentially. When it's, it's far away from w, w max, it grows fast. When it goes closer to W max, it grows uh, more carefully. But of course, cubic is still a loss-based congestion control. It doesn't consider latency at all. The second congestion control we're going to talk about is BBR. Uh, that was developed by uh, Google Engineering. BBR looks at the network as one bottleneck link, and it tries to reach the optimal operation, operating point on that link. Beyond the optimal operation point, increasing the sending rate does not increase the delivery rate, and the RTT inflates. So what BBR is doing in congestion avoidance is every few RTTs it increases its rate in 25 percent and if the delivery rate doesn't grow accordingly it then drops it, its rate in about 50 percent to drain the network from excess packets. Now BBR is a more sophisticated more intelligent um, algorithm than cubic it considers delivery rate it considers a latency to make its rate adjustments decision. The last uh, algorithm that I'm going to talk about is PCC, which stands for Performance Oriented Congestion Control. PCC is a total different beast. It is utility-based algorithm, and it tries to maximize the utility function. It divides the time to micro, micro experiments. Each, each experiment is uh, one or two RTT long. It tries a specific sending rate and collects the feedback. The feedback in terms of delivery rate, loss rate, latency, and so on. And for each such an experiment, it gives a utility grade that signifies how uh, happy it is from the results of this test. The nice thing about the utility function is that it can incorporate elements that are important for the service itself. For example, uh, if you are very latency sensitive, then you can give uh, a bigger way to increase in latency and so on. However, PCC doesn't assume anything on the network. It tries and see what its experiments yield. The second component in PCC is the online learning rate control function. So it tries R1 and gets utility grade, grade U1. It tries R2 and gets utility grade U2. And then using an online learning function, it decides what would be the next rate to try. And of course, taking into account that it wants to maximize the utility function. So let's, let's look at some, some results. So first, we benchmark, benchmarked BBR version 1 versus cubic in three different countries. And what you see here is the summary of uh, the, um, uh, the throughput benefit of BBR over cubic. And very surprisingly, it seems that BBR was worse in almost all the cases, both on fixed and on mobile, except uh, in one mobile uh, network in one country. This is pretty surprising because BBR is, is considered much more uh, aggressive and it is used today by many leading streaming networks. On the other hand, it's not so surprising because in the literature um, there are several weaknesses of BBR that are mentioned and you have the references um, here in the slide. So uh, and the weaknesses of BBR are talking about uh, networks with high jitter and deep buffers. 
And this is what we tried, we tried to simulate in the lab. We build a network emulation of a network that has a very significant uniform jitter and deep buffers, but no intrinsic uh, packet loss. And what you, what you see here is the achieved ABR bitrate of the three uh, congestion control algorithms. As you can see, PCC and Cubic were able to, at some point, uh, reach the maximum ABR quality and stay there uh, in a very stable way, while BBR was really struggling. BBR is the, uh, is the bottom, line, bottom line graph, and we see that BBR achieved very, very poor quality, and this could be attributed to the high jitter uh, that um, uh, confuses the way that BBR is is um, calculating the bandwidth delay product and adapting its rate. The next, uh, the next uh, ex experiment, again with a network uh, emulation, we tried the three algorithms in a very, very dynamic network. This network changes its parameters every five seconds. Uh, segment size, by the way, here was two seconds. So every five, five seconds, it chooses uh, latent, specific latency and uh, packet loss and bandwidth out of the uh, domain, out of the domains that you see on the upper uh, right side. Uh, it was a streaming of dash traffic uh, to a Shaka player, and what we can see on the upper on the upper part of the slide is the achieved the achieved ABR rate uh, as a function of the time. We see that Cubic is performing very, very poorly. This could, at, could be attributed to uh, the existence of um, a packet loss. Even 1% of packet loss on average can kill Cubic. BBR is doing uh, much better. BBR is almost loss agnostic. Uh, until the loss gets to a very high level, BBR doesn't uh, look at loss at all. So BBR. Uh, could achieve, achieved the maximum uh, quality most of the time, uh, and PCC did even better, did even better, and except for two drops, held the maximum uh, ABR quality along the experiment. Below, you can see the rebuffering events and the length of the events on the same experiment. Uh, not surprisingly, Cubic had many, many, many uh, buffering events. Uh, BBR had uh, less events, but we can still see some rebuffering events that were extremely long. In the middle, you can see almost eight second uh, rebuffering event. In this case, PCC uh, performed pretty well. It had two rebuffering events, and they were pretty, pretty short. So uh, let's quickly discuss uh, time behind live or glass-to-glass -glass latency. This is um, uh, an analysis that was provided by uh, Akamai, and we can see the, co the main contributors to the glass-to-glass -glass latency, from the encoding and packaging to the first mile upload, CDN propagation, uh, the last mile delivery, and last but not least, the player buffer. Now, as you can see, the, the uh, latency that is attributed to the player buffer is very, very significant. But this is actually a safety net for the network behavior. Okay, the player keeps, in this case, 18 seconds of video to compensate for, uh, for, rainy, for rainy seconds of delivery. So when the network is problematic or the congestion controller doesn't do a good job and doesn't provide uh, the right delivery rate, the player would still have 18, 18 seconds to play before it's getting uh, to a rebuffering event. So when we are discussing low latency delivery, we must uh, decrease the player buffer, or otherwise the glass-to-glass -glass latency uh, would be still significant. And 
reducing the player buffer is always a short blanket. Okay, you, re you reduce the buffer, you reduce the safety net. This could result in higher rebuffering ratio and lower bit rates. So, uh, and, this, and in this experiment, we try to see um, how the different congestion control controls uh, are coping with a smaller uh, uh, player buffer. On the right hand side, this was a 16 second player buffer, and on the left hand side, it's the eight, it's an eight second player buffer. As you can see, with 16 uh, seconds buffer, and again, this is a, an experiment over quite a d dynamic network with HLS streaming. With a 16 second buffer, rebuffering numbers were uh, pretty uh, sustainable, but when we decreased the player buffer to eight seconds, uh, cubic and BBR grow rebuffering ratio to a less acceptable uh, numbers while PCC could still sustain a relatively low uh, rebuffering ratio. And this is something we all need to take into account when we are uh, discussing a low latency solution. So uh, reducing the segment size is, all, is only a part of the, of the solution for, for low latency. Um, What's next? So what we would like to do next is first to uh, incorporate BBR version 2 uh, in our testings. Of course, HTTP version 3 over quick is also of interest. And uh, we are doing this as part of the Streaming Video Alliance uh, quick POC. And uh, everybody who is uh, interested in, in quick is uh, invited to join us in this uh, POC. Uh, we are going to test the um, low latency packaging impact on, on, the, um, on the quality result. And of course, uh, 5G is also a very interesting um, medium to test because in 5G, on one hand, you have the, the promise of very high bit rates. But on the other hand, the high peaks of bandwidth are uh, changing very, very frequently. And some uh, algorithms like BBR also have problems with very low latency because it messes up the calculation. So while 5G is promising, it's pretty challenging with respect to congestion control. And this is what we are uh, going to uh, test uh, next. Um, if you are interested in reading more about uh, congestion control, we have published a free ebook on our website, and you are uh, welcome to uh, download it. And uh, with this, I'm happy to get any questions. Thanks. I can maybe answer that because it was my data. Yeah. So, okay. just, do you want me to answer it? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So this is this is old data from four years ago. So this is not doing chunk-based transfer. We were trying to allocate for standard segmented media. If I had a monolithic six segment, this was also data which was Akamai putting RTMP in and synthesizing HLS out of it. So you had to accrue a whole segment's worth of data on the input side so that you could generate the segments on the HLS. So that's the reason for the six second CDM propagation. I actually wanted to point it out. Today, if you're not synthesizing anything, there's no ways we're taking six seconds to deliver anything. So the, the, the six second segment moved the network very quickly. So that's an artifact of dynamic uh, packaging that was happening in the network at the time. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Don't think it worked. Well. Um, have you done any work on congestion control across multiple networks? Uh, I often find I have to disable the Wi-Fi on my phone because the five, four or five G is now faster. Have you done any work on being able to mix those to improve quality of experience, especially when Wi-Fi is congested? Because lots of phones assume Wi-Fi is the pro is superior, where it is, as we can see today, not necessarily is. Thanks. So, so. We've done lots of testing uh, on real networks as well uh, on simulated emulated networks. 
we haven't done switching between networks in real time. So this is something uh, it is worthwhile exploring. Okay, I don't see another question, so thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so our next talk, I believe, is Thierry Fautier on improving streaming quality and bitrate efficiency with dynamic resolution encoding. I don't think he needs further introduction, so welcome, Thierry. Thank you. Clicker. Where's the clicker? Hello, everyone. So I hope uh, you will discover, uh, learn uh, new topics today. So I'm going to talk about dynamic resolution encoding for those who know about this technology has been uh, heavily deployed on VOD with uh, Netflix, of course, always the same people. And here we are going to show you how this is possible on live services. So we'll go from th uh, some forwards. Uh, what is the live dynamic resolution encoding AI model about? What are the use cases? How do we measure the quality when we invent something new? What is the standards aspect of it? And also, how do we test this on real device? Because we also want to make it work, and what is the outlook? So basically, if you look at this picture, you have multiple uh, content. You see three different content. And what we figure out is, depending on the complexity of the content, we see there are some bit rates which are more adapted to the content. And at the end of the day, what we don't want to do for a given profile is to always encode at the same bitrate. We want to be able to modulate the bitrate. So you see on the right side, we decide that for some of the content at 8 megabit, we'll have to go at 2.5K to 1440p uh, resolution. Then some of the content is going to be at 4K and some extreme case, like you can imagine for sports, you will have to reduce the resolution. And of course, we don't do that per sequence, but per per video file, but per video sequence, which is a few seconds. So basically, we smooth the bitrate and uh, we smooth the resolution based on the needed bitrate requirement. And therefore, we can uh, preserve a high quality uh, picture. So this is what you guys should all, and guys and girls should all have read in 20, December 2015. This was the first publication of Netflix. And the second one was saying, Instead of doing that per title, they do that per sequence, segments, or whatever chunks of video. So that's what people are doing for video today on VOD. So what we are going to talk here is the live equivalent of dynamic resolution encoding based on, you are going to love it, AI model. So this is how we do it. So basically, you have a library of test files, you encode this library at multiple resolution, and you generate, using AI technique, a prediction model. This takes a lot of CPU, and we have the cloud for that. It's compute intensive, but small piece of software. What is beautiful here is when you run this on live signal, you are going to encode on the once, meaning you don't have to do in the Netflix way all the possible combination, but just one, and the reason you do it once is because you have learned so much offline on your test sequence. And the other goody of this type of solution is that you do not add any additional CPU and you do not add any additional delay. And this is, also po this is only possible because we are using AI techniques. You cannot do that using traditional approach. So what are the use cases for this type of technology? So basically, we are looking at our multiple profile, and we see how using dynamic resolution encoding, DRE, how we can select adaptively the different resolution for a given bitrate we have on the profile. And this is what 
we do in addition to using our content aware encoding so you know our iq is quite popular for live services so we have already bandwidth reduction with the content aware encoding and then on top of that we are able to cascade the benefits of the dynamic resolution encoding which means higher quality of experience and you will see also some bitrate saving using this DRE technology. So that's the result, so you'll get multiple uh, possible. We can also apply, so, sorry, you can also apply that for broadcast application. It's not only for OTT. We are also able to demonstrate, provided that the player is able to cope with a transport stream changing resolution. For those who have gray hairs, you know that this was defined in 1995 in MPEG, change of resolution in MPEG-2, and in 2022, we still have device who are still not able to dynamically change the resolution. So instead of doing a nuclear war at DVB, we decided not to <coughs> go after the transport stream world, but we are very motivated on the ATSC-3 on one hand, and of course in Brazil, you will discover this is the new application we can target with this type of technology. So basically, DRE smooths the bitrate requirements, can increase the number of channels in a transponder, but also uh, is a, a way to go to much aggressive bitrate like in, in Brazil. You'll see what we do in Brazil about this. So let's look at real test case. So we have done two test cases. One is 1080p AVC, the most deployed format, I think, after MPEG 2 SD, of course, but we try not to go back in the past. We try to go to the future. So we have taken four megabit different test sequence at multiple resolution, 1080p, 720p, and 540p. And then we have used VMAF to measure the quality of the produced picture. So we have tested on very representative content. So one is Regatta, the one we produced for Ultra HD from. One is a 4K land speed. One is the bike sequence we have produced. One is soccer. One is uh, some kind of documentary, and the last one is River Plate, which is another sequence, uh, sports sequence, uh, soccer sequence. All that was down converted to BT709 in order to use the VMAF uh, measurement. So what have we done? So you see here, it's a bit difficult to read, but on different sequence, you see difference, different pi, meaning that the, bit, the resolution selected by the VMAF selector was completely different from one sequence to the other. And this is what we have done. So we have calculated the VMAF score for all the, the sequence in average. What was the best VMAF gain? You see, we could go up to plus 13 points. And what was the associated VMAF, VMAF score of the selected uh, resolution? So you see that sometimes we go lower, but in general, we are quite happy with the quality we have produced. So to summarize, quality is good for the sequence, except for Regatta and Venice, which can be judged as fair. We are not sure it's 100% quality preservation. Uh, lower resolution helps, of course, to reduce uh, including blocks and distortion for the most complex scenes. We didn't see any bad choice of resolution, so I must give some kudos to, to VMAF, except on one sequence. We didn't see any perception of resolution on all the sequence we have tested. And the estimated bit rate, so from two sequence, uh, we got 20%, and one sequence we were able to save 30% of bit rate without any visual impairment. Second one, a bit more difficult, is HCVC 4K. Here we have put the bitrate. I know yesterday we were talking about uh, Olympics at 18 megabits per second. Here we put the bitrate very low. And the reason why is because we wanted to trigger the resolution change. If we put the bitrate at 10 or 12, we will probably stay always on the 2160p60 resolution, which means that the harmonic encoder can go way lower than 18 megabits. So what you see at NBC is uh, the Formula One of encoding is like very high bitrate. So again, VMAF, and we test uh, on the same sequence down uh, converted to BT709. So here you see the split also very different from one sequence to the other. And this is the result, the VMAF score. 
as you can imagine, in static scenes, 4K always selected. In very fast motion, you go down to uh, 1080p, e even also 720p, which is still considered as ultra HD resolution. So to summarize here, quality is good on all the sequence, except on regatta, which can be judged as fair. The DRE gain is perceived in complex sense, scenes and on grass texture for football sequence. No bad choice of resolution. No perception of resolution change. And the bitrate saving here is more consistent, so 20% for Venice and regatta, and 33% on, on the rest of the sequence. So the additional benefit besides the fact that we reduce the bandwidth is we can also save on the CPU. I know it's green is getting more and more uh, popular. And you will see also some comparison with other techniques used for VOD is quite drastic. So 25%, 15 to 20% on what we do if we do, uh, do not apply to DRA. Very important, we have tested this technology across multiple ecosystems, so transport stream, DVB, dash, route, ATSC3, traditional dash, and HLS with fragmented MP4. So you see that on TS we are not doing good without big surprise because the seamless switch is not supported by any, not, not many devices can do a seamless switch. ATSC3, we found one TV, the Sony one, which was out of the box able to support the resolution change. Dash, we support Dash DS and Chaka player. And HLS, we have tested on some device and uh, for HEVC, we're able to do that on uh, Chaka and iPad. So it's quite positive, except the transport stream, which is not a big surprise. So let's look at the standard. So first of all, you probably have read that, Thomas. You remember this diagram? Brazil, yeah? So the small corner saying, hey, DRE has been uh, selected to, together with our CVC, our friends of Vinova. Uh, you can use that technique to produce VVC 4K bitrate, and you will all understand that the target for VVC in Brazil is quite aggressive. Four megabits for 4K, I uh, think we need a lot of tools to put a high quality <laughs> Soccer game in four megabits. I see some people laughing, but I think we'll be able to make it. And we will do some testing, field testing on, in Brazil. Of course, they're asking us to do 4K real-time VVC plus DRE plus LCVC. Uh, I think this will take a bit of time until we can do that, but at least there is some uh, motivation in Brazil. So in DVB, as you know, there is the new VVC standard, so TMAVC has produced his uh, blue book, and we are starting to look at how VVC could support this functionality, and we started interoperability with the VVC players, and for Dash, it's easier because we know it works, so it shouldn't be a big surprise. ATSC3, we are going to present that at PT4, so the innovation group of ATSC, and go also do some demonstration at uh, NAB 2022. So, Harmonic is using AI technology, as you can imagine, doing this by hand is quite complex and we were quite happy to get awarded an Emmy in 2020 and this is a typical work we have done at Harmonic, how to do AI and apply it for live video. Second is what do we do in AI? So if you have to summarize, I know some people are taking pictures. This is a good summary because it gives you in one slide where do we stand today in all those techniques. So IQ is the content aware encoding of harmonic up to 40% deployed, largely uh, massively deployed. And the density using legacy techniques about 3x because people in content aware encoding in VOD, they are testing a lot of different combinations. Dynamic encoding style, this is similar to what was presented by MediaKind, about 15% uh, bitrate saving, not much uh, saving otherwise. Dynamic resolution, we can save between 20 and 25%. And on the, compared to doing nothing, is about 15 to 20%. But if you have to encode all the different resolution, it's going to be 3 to 4x more efficient than the classical approach done today for VOD. 
And we also do, as we do for the resolution, we do that also for the frame rate. It's called dynamic frame rate encoding. And here you have lower bitrate saving, but uh, also very interesting uh, saving on the CPU side. So the takeaway, dynamic resolution encoding complements our already popular IQ technology by smoothing the peak bitrates. It's quite interesting in terms of bandwidth saving, especially it applies to existing codecs like AVC and HEVC, and especially if it can work on the billions of already deployed devices in AVC and HEVC. We also get some CPU savings, so we are compliant with the new green uh, expectation from the, the planet. And of course, we see that quite fitting OTT uh, application and broadcast interoperability more challenging, but we're quite uh, excited to take a TV set, ATSC3 TV set, and make it work. That's it. We have five minutes of questions. And I, I want to thank the team who has been working on that. So Xavier Duclos was in my team based in France. He has been doing this work and also presented that to Brazil, get selected in Brazil. So maybe uh, I should give him a medal of, uh, and he's fighting DVB with very nice people around him. So. I think we have a question over there. Please. Can you please uh, announce your company name so that I know who is asking the question? Oh yeah. Uh, my name is Christos uh, from Netflix. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about the video analysis component that you showed uh, a little bit earlier in the presentation. I'm yes. curious, you know, what that does that box entail? Uh, because it seemed like you also use this uh, in the online scenario, right? You also have to extract, I guess, some features. Yes. So the, in, the, in yeah. the final product, this will be part of the encoder. What we did here was done after the encoding, we do the VMAF analysis, but what we are building is a equivalent of VMAF inside our encoder, so we'll get probably different, uh, different results from the, the VMAF score, but our goal is to be very close to that in terms of uh, performance, and the selection criteria will be similar. So video analysis means, uh, it doesn't mean low level features, it means uh, perceptual quality metrics. Yeah, yeah. Like so we'll have a model equivalent to the VMAF model into our products that will provide a similar decision we have already some prototype uh, developed. Okay, so VMAF, we know it's not real time, so we know it's not possible to put that in a live system. So there will be no latency in the final product. I guess, so as you said, it's a uh, low cost mapping. Uh, it's a? It's a low cost mapping of, from VMAF scores into some quantity which you characterize as video okay, analysis. Okay, okay. Wait, wait, I'm going back to my presentation. P, 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 P. So what we do here, yeah. So basically here so we'll have, oh, sorry. Okay, can somebody switch it? Can you switch it slide, slide? Because I got Netflix with uh, hunting me down, so. Yeah, it's live. Okay, so basically what you see here in our video analysis, we'll have uh, our secret source and the, and the way we are going to measure in the, the prediction model, we'll have the measurement equivalent to what VMAF is doing offline, but it will be in line. So this will be no delay and no impact on the CPU when you encode the content. Got it. Yeah, thank you. Our holy grail is to go to a customer who has a good old harmonic encoder and to plug our software, and it doesn't have to bring new infrastructure. So it's a ISO CPU, ISO delay. Got it. It's thank not you. there yet, but it's a first presentation we make in public, and this is what we presented in Brazil. So you have to wait for next year to see a demo on the we have one question. One more question here. Terry, thank you. Uh, I have two questions, but they're small. So how dependent are you uh, on the upsampling filter on the device in your analysis? Because you assume something, but the upsampling is done by a TV set and yes. so on and so on. So yes. that could create artifacts or at least some different quality as you have predicted. Yeah, but when you do ABR today on a device, the, the device is also doing his upsampling. It's true, but it's, in this case, it's not done that frequent properly because it seems you're doing a 10 
second sequences, so you're doing it quite frequently. Yeah. And that was the other question. So yeah. how frequently are so you doing are, this? So first of all, we have tested on consumer device like TV, mobile, and uh, tablets. And we have not seen on, let's say, hours of watching, we have not seen, because the algorithm doesn't switch very often. It switches when there is a cut from the director or when there is a, in the scene when you see very, a big change in the, mo in the movement in front of the camera. That, that's how the two big changes. So we don't change every two or 10 seconds. It's changing on, I would say, 20, 30 seconds. Okay. So it's, it's, we have not seen visual impairment okay. ourselves. Next question. Yes, second question. No, that was the second one, how frequent it's happening. So that was Depen it's, it, So to be very fair, it depends on two things, content and the type of algorithm you put. If you put very aggressive algorithm which tries to change all the time, then you might be in trouble. So we have an algorithm which tries to be a bit conservative in order not to see this fluctuation, but you have to watch the demo. It, you, we, we didn't bring it here because yeah. we wanted to make it light, but it's very impressive. And you have to trust people who test in Brazil. They are not uh, stupid, uh, making a lot of tests. Mo more to come. Okay. Can we have one, one quick question? We're out of time. For Thank, uh, thanks, yeah, uh, very quickly. Thank you, Terry. Um, question about this slide, actually. Um, if, do you do one learning for all types of content, or do you do a training that is specific, let's say, to football? And yeah. if you do football, what happens at halftime? Yeah. So we have done the training, and we did this project initially uh, with Sky. I don't know if the Sky person is in the room, but we have done that on a lineup of 250 channels. So this is not specific to any content. Okay, so it's one, it's the one VMAX training code for we provided here is for five sequences because I cannot give you the <laughs> 250 channels 24-7, but the learning process is happening on real content. And for this presentation, we decided to focus on five HD and five UHD, but in the real life, we, we teach oh the system on a lot of content. Okay, thank you. Very intensive in terms of CPU. Okay, thank you, Terry. Right, our next talk has an intriguing title, Incapable Capabilities Less and More. Two speakers who also have Emmys and don't need introduction, Thomas Stockhammer and Cyril Concolata. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Will. So uh, Thomas and I will talk to you about something that is uh, Important to us, capabilities, and the title of this talk is Incapable Capabilities, but less is more. And we'd like to start with a, a conversation. So, Thomas, j'ai plein de contenu super, des films, des, des séries. Qu'est-ce que tu voudrais voir? Serious? Ich verstehe kein Wort. Was sprichst du mit mir? Ich verstehe dich nicht. Okay, maybe, can we negotiate in English? That I think would be better. Let's try like this. Okay, so I was saying, I have plenty of content, great shows, great series, and so on. What would you like to watch? Well, you know, I have a Snapdragon, so give me what you have, and I pick what I like to have, so send it over. Okay, but, you know, I prepare lots of content in lots of, with lots of parameters, resolutions, and everything. If I give you everything I have, it's going to take a while, it's going to cost to the network, so can you be more specific? Okay, UHD and HEVC, how about this? Uh, UHD, yeah, but can you do AV1 on Snapdragon? Surreal, next question, please. <laughs> okay, 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 so what about audio? Do you want to watch it in German or, or in uh, English? Do you want subtitles? you want closed captions? Do you want what? Surreal. These too many questions. I want to keep this for myself, so a bit more privacy, please. Okay, okay. So, um, so okay. I'm, I'm going to send you a short list of what I can do just for you, right? It's not, don't share it with others. It won't work for the others. Just for you. Okay, let, let, let me read the list. Okay. 
Okay, so, okay, I think I got it. So I take the SV, SD content, and ABC, that's safe. So, so, so you're saying we've been talking for like minutes for in the end sending you ABC and maybe AAC? That's what we negotiated about. I think we can do better. Yeah, okay. we, sh we probably should do better, yes. So, yeah, this, is what, this was to illustrate the problem that clients and devices are facing every day, you know, this round trips, negotiation. And uh, Thomas and I have been studying that for, for a long time. Uh, so, Thomas, you want to? So, so, basically, capabilities are something that is basically used if you uh, go into this more modern media delivery. And I think we're talking about this all the time. So, we have significantly richer content option formats, codecs, languages. You have personalization. You create metadata. A second is really the, you, you want to bring it to any device and a lot of services are now you bring your own device so it's no longer basically you have something set up box or something being developed specifically for the service. You run in apps and browsers and everything is connected through the internet so you get content anywhere at any time. And then you have different players, you have content providers, they want to reach many users on, on any device with the best, best quality and also user preference. You have a user who wants to get new content and new experiences. So I want to have my UHD, my HDR experience. And then you have also technology providers, device providers who want to put differentiating technologies into the markets. And that basically results in these challenges of we need to negotiate and agree on capabilities. So the first thing is we need to speak a common language that we agree upon and that language needs to be understood on both ends. So uh, where is the next one? like this. So I put this also into a diagram and this is more like there's many devices and basically we're going to the internet and then you have this rich amount of content from different types of different formats, different um, type of immersiveness and so on and so on. And then you also have the, the issue of that as a, as a content provider, you need to provide scalability. So you want to offer contents to hundreds of thousands um, different device types with cost consciousness and highest quality. So Cyril, maybe you can talk a bit more what we exchange. Yes. Um, so this, this is work we, we started maybe, when was that, two, three years ago at MPEG, right? We tried to identify what was needed, what, what, was the, what were the characteristics of content that would be needed by devices to determine if they would be, they would be capable uh, of playing a piece of content. And we tried to identify five categories. Um, Pre-processing is the first category, right? It's, it's, it's not related to media itself, it's more about file formats, what are the file formats that the device supports, um, things like encryption modes and parameters. For example, do you support CNC or CBCS? Um, then we identified capabilities in terms of decoding. So obviously, can you decode uh, AVC main or uh, AV1? Um, can you do uh, time text? If you do time text, can you do image or do you do text? Then we identified post-processing uh, capabilities around, uh, for example, 3D displays and, and uh, how you can pack data, uh, unpack data, unpack images. Then there's rendering, the rendering itself. Can you do HDR? What kind of HDR? Can you do spatial audio? And so on. Um, and then in terms of uh, the, the last component of the, the capabilities are the capabilities of the user, right? Can the user understand uh, French or they can, can understand English? Do they have impairments that, and, and they need accessible uh, content? So we try to summarize that in a document in MPEG that's called Advanced Signaling of MPEG Containers Content. But then the question is, how do you represent and exchange this information between devices? Uh, and and we, we I try to find four uh, places where this information could be conveyed. Uh, could it be in the protocol headers when you're doing your adaptive streaming or you're doing your exchange? Possibly, yeah, but do you want to negotiate, send all this information for in every single request, make a request for every single piece of content that you you're going to download or you're going to in inspect? Probably not. Do you want to have that in, in elementary stream themselves? Um, there are tools like SCI messages and SCI of SCI. So the, but it, it's too late in the process, right? You want that very early uh, before you, you actually process the elementary stream. Should it be in the manifest, the dash or HLS manifests? Yeah, probably. And, and there are MPEG defined two 
um, codec uh, two uh, MIME type subparameters, the profiles, um, the profiles parameter. Uh, but uh, in practice, this one is not used. And uh, even if it were used, the profiles parameter needs brands and brands translated to all the previous capabilities I, I indicated. But there's no standard mapping from a brand to all these parameters. Um, there's another parameter, an another MIME sub subparameter called the codex parameter that you may be familiar with. It's in Dash, it's in HLS. Um, that, that's, that's a good start, but it's, today it's not st structured in a way that you can represent pre-processing, decoding, post-processing, rendering, and so on. It, it, it needs to be reworked a bit, and, and m more modern codecs uh, are trying to do that. The, the next question, you might think, hey, okay, I'm c I could download just the initialization segment and have everything in the initialization segment. Yeah, that's true, but the initialization segment contains a lot more information than just the information to decide on whether you can play content or not. So you're gonna be downloading useless data. So the summary is that there's no unified representation for this information um, and, and no consensus today on where to put it. So at the moment, it's still a mix and applications have to um, get the data from different places, convert from different, to and from different representation, and, and worse, they have to guess what's missing. Right? If you get just a codex parameter that doesn't contain any HDR information in it, you have to guess what it's about or download more. So um, what we basically look into, um, what is a, a suitable method and what, what needs to be represented. So. I took the CTA wave model, you have a content that has encoding, DRM, it might have other properties, and then you have a device platform that is abstract, that could be your browser, that could be an Android platform, and typically you have APIs um, that you can ch um, exchange media and throw in content, but you have also a preceding negotiation on what can you support, right? So the basic idea is you have some CMF content, um, potentially in different versions being subsampled, being with different encoders being presented, different frame rates, and so on. And so you would add all of this information to the manifest and you create a CMAF header. That's kind of uh, provided to the device. And then you have an application, like a media player, be it Dash.js, or be it some other application that now needs to use all of this information, needs to run a capability checking on the device, and basically do some magic to figure out what content I'm playing. And that should obviously happen fast because you don't want to wait. It should also be resulting in something good, something the user expects, the content provider expects. So now going into the manifest, basically we talked about this. There's multiple information you can use. Uh, there's profiles parameter in Dash, there is MIME types, there's container profile that allow you to say this is a CMF content, this is CMF media profile. There's a codex parameter as we spoke. You have descriptors from what is called co uh, uh, CICP uh, for uh, allowing to exchange information on signals. You have the initialization segment, you have information about content protection. So now what we did in CTA Wave, we looked a bit on what capabilities can you use, for example, in HTML5. Um, and so there is basically three or four methods. You can use the is supported type or can play type together with profiles or codex parameter. And we know that uh, what fails and what works, so that comes a bit later. What you can always do is you take the CMAF header or the init segment, put it and try if it starts decoding. But that might result in a failure. So it's kind of a poor man's approach, trial and error, right? So you cannot do this all the time. That might also result in, in problems. There's a new uh, functionality developed, uh, media capability APIs, and we will come back to, back to this in a second. And there is also for EMEs, yes, similar APIs that allows you to negotiate on content uh, decryption and counter protection. There's a couple of issues in all of this. So first off, mapping of manifest to capability. So you have a manifest information, how can you map it to a capability? So somebody needs to understand and translate if they are not identical. You also want to once away say, can you play HDR together with AV1, together with VVC? So you need to combine, it's not necessarily trivial, to have these combinations. You get unclear answers, so there is not like a yes or no, you get a maybe or a probable, and we have a bit more later. What does support actually mean? Does it mean I can play it back and it's working well? Is it, is it good? What is the, the quality? Have I been tested against this? And then there's slightly different ways to do it in the web, so 
Uh, I looked up the Android ways of doing APIs. So everything is slightly different. So there's quite some complexity of setting up content, of building manifests, of writing applications on different devices. So as said, media capabilities is an opportunity and Cyril will give you a couple of introductions and findings. So yeah, media capabilities is a, a draft uh, at, w at W3C today. I, I took a snapshot uh, last month. Um, or actually two months ago. Uh, it's an evolution of previous APIs. I don't know how many of you remember the uh, is type supported or can play type APIs where you would get a response that would be maybe, probably I can support that, right? How good is that? Um, so it evolved into this API called, uh, in, in this case that's decoding info. And decoding info takes a set uh, of parameters. Um, so for a video it would be the mime type, width, height, bit rate, frame rate, and a few other parameters. And it, it, it will return supported, a Boolean, right? It is supported or it's not supported. And, and hopefully when it says it's supported, it's really supported. And it also returns two other parameters. Is it smoothly supported? And now we'll see what, what it means. And is it power efficient? Are you gonna drain your battery if you do use that or not? So um, the question now is, when you get in CMAF a table like this one, Right? The first challenge is how, how are you going to convert this table into, um, into the, the calls to the API? Right? They're, they're not speaking the same language. You have to do conversion. And, and, and we, Thomas and I, we believe there's work to be done here because at the moment it's really tedious. Like every application will have to onboard all the tables and the logic to convert. So there's, there's room for improvement here. Um, I, I started playing with the uh, Media Capabilities API and I created a small web page that you can access. Uh, you'll have a link in the slides. Um, and, and it allows you to select uh, various parameters like uh, the codex parameter, the bitrate, the height, and, and HDR parameters. And, and then it tests that on a, a set of 16 by 16 resolutions. So from uh, zero, 00 to a maximum resolution that you choose. And it, it, it will tell you how supported is this resolution and with all these FPS and codex parameter. And, and you will get uh, an indication whether it's supported, power efficient, or smooth. And I, I'm sorry, I'm bad at UI designing. I coded that with red, green, and blue. So if it's supported, it's red. If it's efficient, it's green. If it's smooth, it's blue. So if it's all good, it's white. If it's all bad, it's, gr it's black. Um, and, and that's how it, so I tested on, on three browsers on my, uh, my Mac. Um, and I think in this case, uh, that was on a f actually on my phone, uh, using Chrome on my phone uh, for AVC. So it was power efficient and up to some resolution, but uh, otherwise it was not. It was uh, not smooth at all, uh, sorry, smooth all the time. So it, it's important to understand how smooth works. Uh, because today I think it's still it's in, in its infancy. Um, browsers, and it's valid for, Chrome, for Firefox too, they collect data. They say, oh, if the majority of devices with this chip, this, these pr parameters, these characteristics can do it smoothly, then I'm gonna say it's smooth. But they're optimistic in what they're doing. They will tell you it's smooth even if it's not smooth because they haven't tested it yet. Right, so you can trust when it says it's non-smooth, but you cannot trust when it says it's smooth. And uh, the way they define smoothness is if you drop more than 5% of the frames when, when you play a session. So this is an example here of the image on the, on the right on, the, on my phone. Uh, the next thing on Firefox, um, I'll, I'll skip the, the details. Um, an interesting case was Safari with VP9, because here you had the interesting uh, curves showing that smoothness and power efficiency were actually dependent on the number of pixels uh, to display. So if the image was taller or, or flatter, they would, that makes sense, right? They would, they would be able to handle that. But other I couldn't see that same pattern on other devices. So I encourage you to look at uh, this web page and report any interesting results you have. Thank you, Cyril. Uh, so what we came up based on this one, um, there's a couple of recommendations. So this is the same slide before, just uh, doing a couple of 
uh, strike through. So we don't believe these profiles parameters in Dash, for example, are helpful for negotiation capabilities. Obviously, the MIME type is important because that tells you this is CMF, ISO BMFF. The container profile, you basically are good to know that it's CMF structure, so that's a combination. Uh, the codex parameter is quite important and it's useful because that is understood by devices and, 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 and uh, browsers. Um, you can use descriptors and CICP information for this translation, but you need a translation here. Uh, you can use the initialization segment for, and you need it anyways, to, uh, but uh, you, you might use it for negotiation if you get an inconclusive answer, and obviously you need the counter protection information. In addition, soft information included, such as the number of pixels, the frame rates, and so on. They can be used to get information what we saw. Is it power efficient? Can you do it uh, on software, and so on, and so on. Um, when you now use it in a media player, like a Dash.js, what is helpful is to use this is supported type. is broadly supported. Uh, you can use this uh, append header. The media capabilities is not yet something we're saying it's ubiquitously available. It's something probably which will come. but. Um, and the EME APIs are also available. So what, what is good, it's um, you basically know it's SEMA, if you know it's, you can work with the mind tab and the codex parameter, the EME APIs, um, and media capabilities should be introduced, but it's not ubiquitously available yet. I have one more slide which basically talks a bit about support, what does it mean? And basically we heard about this 5% drops and so on and so on. We have done a much more rigorous test framework um, in CTA Wave that basically allows you to test devices for the support of uh, different uh, media profiles because we're working in the CTA Wave CMF context. And what you would get there is basically test content and a test framework that you can run uh, on testing devices. And along with this comes an observation ability where you're putting cameras against this, you can check frame drops, smooth playback, and so on and so on. And if you want to attach new content, you get a, a pool of basically of a mezzanine content that is well prepared and has some look like, as you see below, it has barcodes included there. You encode into specific parameters and you get a set, for example, for a media profile, let's say for uh, ABC media profile, an HEVC, an AV1, and you basically expect that then you can run a full test framework against a device to understand, am I supporting this? And supporting means different functionalities. So you test, for example, random access, switching, and so on and so on. So that framework is uh, publicly available now. We're populating this more with content. And there's an open invitation to basically add additional content that is prepared according to this guidance into this framework. Uh, I have another slide that I'm not going to spend time on because we're running out of time. But that is basically someone who is having a new technology, what they need to do in basically creating the capability. There's quite some work based on all of this, and maybe this can be pruned eventually. Recommendations will be stay for is I think we need to uh, be sure that we provide extensive and consistent information in manifest and CMF headers, and they should not contradict. Uh, we need to basically make sure that this signaling framework for capabilities is simple, compact, uh, but also extensible to new codec. So there's a couple of recommendations here that basically goes ahead this. We need to have a simple mapping to the device APIs. Uh, and then we need to also work on the correct implementation of capabilities. And we hope by having a bit of a guidance here that we find the right uh, organizations and the right companies to document this, because I believe that will help into the future. Thank you, and thank you for Cyril of setting up the talk. Yeah, Christian, question. Yes, thank you very much for the interesting talk. I guess you remember, Cyril, we had some Euro European projects long time ago on adapting content to device capabilities. So, so I'm, I'm happy to see this uh, here, but I'm also wondering if, if there are any plans to communicate these device capabilities also back to the server, or is there any way on how you can do this in an interoperable way? without touching all these old standards we have done a long time ago. Uh, we touched a bit about this question in, in our conversation, right? The, if, you, if you're in a closed environment, you can do that, right? But the question is, when you're in an open environment, do you want to communicate 
all the capabilities of the, cl of the client or the user to the server at the risk of tracking users and, and risking privacy issues and fingerprinting. Um, so there's the question of technically can you do? I, I think we could possibly in, in either reuse old technology or, or invent an existing technologies, but there's also the question of should we do that? Or should it be more client driven, just like Dash is more client driven and not server driven? That, so that's, there's a. So uh, along the same lines, it seems this is a multi-dimensional problem. You have vocabulary problem, dictionary, having the same dictionary. Uh, API for device capability, uh, how to carry or negotiate information between server and, uh, and client, and also a stage, a staging the information. It's not just the carriage of it, whether you do it once or whether you do it in steps and so on. So it seems is a big problem. So what do you think we should solve first? I so I don't believe we have a solution because that would be too trivial. I think what is dangerous to say, we're adding more and more capabilities, right? So there's the idea of, okay, let's create another parameter and then we solve that capability problem. I think we need to think hard and we need to understand like what Cyril did. What do browsers do? How do they use these parameters? And then we need to basically focus on uh, really doing simple right things. And I, I believe it's not that you say this is an organization MPEG or uh, CTA Wave or Dash AF. No. It's the people need to make sure that we consolidate here. But and maybe there is a simple solution along the line you said. The first thing is fixing the media capability of specific agent. Now, at least at the device level, you c at the application in the device, you can uh, reliably talk to the device and know what capability it has. If that language is fixed, then you come about the common vocabulary between server and the client. Then you come about then delivery of method of it and in for the different delivery uh, methods like Dash versus RTP and so on are different. And then you come about a staging of it. But the first, thing, we don't even have a simple thing working, which is the media capability API. I, I think the most important part is the model. These five steps, pre-processor, decoder, post-processor, and so on. I, if we agree, if the industry agrees that this is a model that is scalable, and I believe it's scalable, it can be future-proof, then we can decide on the language, and, and, and it, it's an implementation issue. But if the model is I not shared, no, there's I, no. I think there has been challenges, or at least disagreement, between WD3C guys, who did the media capabilities, and we from MPAC, Dash, IF, and so on, that they are not leaving in that type of information to be checked. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. I think that conversation is good for the, the party tonight, so I want to thank these guys. We're running out of time. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move into our final session for this section. And the speaker, I believe, is Namajit Barman. And the subject is Evaluation of MPEG 5 Part 2 LCEVC for Gaming Video Streaming Applications. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Navjit Burman, uh, currently a principal researcher at Brightcove, but this work was done in my earlier capacity as a lecturer, assistant professor at Kingston University, together with my colleagues uh, from TU Berlin uh, and, and my PhD supervisor, Professor Maria Martini. Uh, this work is about evaluation of the MPEG-5 Part 2 LCVC codec, uh, specifically for gaming video streaming applications. Uh, so the major objectives of this work are uh, twofold. Uh, first one is the evaluation of the codec on gaming content, and the second one is uh, comparing the compression efficiency with two base codecs. Uh, uh, for compression standards S.264 and HEVC. Uh, we have seen this already uh, in the afternoon presentation uh, about the LCVC decoding workflow. So just to summarize, uh, what we basically have here is uh, encoded video stream at the base resolution along with enhancement data. And then uh, what you can do is you can basically decode the baseline video stream and then apply the two levels of enhancement to obtain the output video at full resolution, so uh, supposedly at very good quality. 
so this is again uh, just a demonstration of what go and, uh, goes inside the this one. Uh, let me. I don't know if if I you can't see. Okay. Uh, so you have the uh, base picture, and then you have two enhancement layers. Uh, enhancement layers of layer one and two, uh, which basically applies. <coughs> Uh, uh, scaling techniques and 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 or temporal buffer uh, compensation to to get the combined picture output. So a few of the advantages for LCVC are improved video compression efficiency uh, compared to the base codec at full resolution, and this is the primary uh, objective that we will be evaluating: reduced overall co encoding complexity and backwards compatible with existing ecosystem of devices. So no new chipsets are required. So what we did for that is that we gathered uh, 14 uh, reference gaming video sequences from uh, a data set which has been designed by my colleagues again at U Berlin called the Cloud Gaming Video Data Set. It's uh, available as an open source data set. So if you're interested, you can go and have a look. Uh, <coughs> the videos here are at uh, full HD resolution of uh, 1920 cross 1080 p of 60 frames per second and 30 seconds duration. Here you can see some of the uh, sample screenshots of the games that we have used here. So these are just six out of the 14. What you can see here is that we have used uh, very abstract games, such as Beach World and Worms, to more complex games, such as Fortnite and Overwatch, and to some famous games, such as League of Legends, which is uh, one of the most famous games streamed on Twitch, for example. Uh, here you can see the uh, spatial information versus temporal information plot. Uh, so those of you who are not familiar, it's in the ITUT recommendation 9010. Uh, what you b basically it depicts is the uh, content uh, complexity, uh, very roughly the content complexity of the videos. Uh, if you have very high SN and very high TI values, it uh, usually indicates that the content is uh, hard to encode. And if you have it slow, it's, it's easier to encode, so very roughly demonstrating the content complexity. What we can see here is that the games that we have selected as part of the cloud gaming video data set uh, comprises videos from different complexity classes, right? So, so that's the uh, uh, application. So any application streaming videos, you will expect something like that, uh, where you have videos from both uh, low and medium and high complexity. Coming to the encoding setting summary, uh, we have 30 seconds video duration. Uh, of native resolution 1080p, and we use five bit rates, uh, 800 up to 6,000 kbps. Uh, we don't change the frame rate, it's maintained at 60 fps. Uh, we use the FFmpeg as the, uh, our choice of encoder, and the encoding mode, mode is CBR, uh, which is the recommended mode again for, uh, stream, uh, for uh, gaming video streaming applications. The compression standards, what we have evaluated uh, in this work is S.264, S.265. LCVC S.264 is the one corresponding to LCVC using S.264 as the base codec. And then we have LCVC S.265, which is again LCVC using H.265 as the base codec. We have used two preset settings here, medium for S.264 and LCVC S.264, so, so the same for across the both same native base codec, and uh, very fast for the S.265 and LCVC is .265, and this is again uh, adhering to the recommended settings that are usually used in uh, both passive gaming video streaming applications, such as Twitch, uh, and, and also for cloud gaming applications. So coming to the results part, uh, I will show you some quality bitrate curves. Uh, so first we have here X264 versus LCVC X264. Uh, on the y-axis, you have the VMAF scores, and on the uh, x-axis, you have the bitrate in kilobits per second. Uh, we have, again, four sample videos here, visual, which is, again, a low-complexity game. And you can see here that even at very low bitrate, it reaches saturation values uh, of, of uh, 100 VMAF score. And then we have complex games such as Maple Story and R R5 Apex, uh, which are uh, quite complex. And you can see that even at very high bitrate, uh, they are not achieving uh, very high VMAF scores. Uh, but what is interesting to note here is that LCVC actually outperforms X264 uh, in terms of VMAF score, uh, looking at the quality bitrate curves. Similarly, X265 comparing, compared to LCVC X265, we see similar behavior. But here, what we observe is that uh, the quality gap actually decreases, uh, for at least for the uh, highly complex games. Coming to the BDBR analysis, so 
we have BD rate savings here in terms of VMAF. Uh, we are not presenting them for PSNR, but again, all the results and, and the files are available as an open source data set. So if you are interested in learning more, uh, please feel free to contact me. Uh, so in the first one, we have here LCVC X264 versus X264. <coughs> and what we can see here is that in terms of VMAF, uh, we have a 42% bitrate savings for LCVC X264 when compared to base codec X264. Uh, moving on, uh, sorry. Uh, when comparing LCVC X265 to X265 as the base codec, what we observe is here is again that LCVC X265 uh, results in, in quite good bitrate savings of almost 38.86 percentage. Comparing X265 now with LCVC X264, so, so one generation codec apart, uh, we can see that except for a few games, uh, overall LCVC X264 results in, in, in almost 13.64% bitrate savings when compared to X265. However, uh, it is important to note here is that X265 was run in the very fast preset mode, while LCVC X264 was in the medium uh, preset mode. Comparing just the base codex, uh, our native uh, codex implementations, X264 versus X265, we see that the X265 results in almost 30% bitrate savings, which is similar to some results that we observed from our earlier works. Uh, looking into now the subjective quality part, so, so just looking at the frames, what we see here is one of the complex games uh, that I mentioned earlier is Fortnite. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the X264 in medium preset at 3 Mbps, and on the right-hand side, you can see uh, one frame for LCVC X264 uh, at, at the same bit rate of 3 Mbps. Uh, what you can see here is again highlighted by the red circles here that the details in LCVC X264 are, are quite uh, better compared to what we can see for X264, where especially at these places, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, picture is quite blocky. Moving on to another high complexity game, we, what we have here is Tekken. And if we look at, uh, look at the one on the left hand side for X264, we can see that uh, the scratches on the chest and all are actually missing for the X264 version when compared to the LCVC X264 at the same bit rate. Moving on to low complexity games such as League of Legends, uh, it's, it's, uh, the quality gain is not very obvious, but when, if you look closely, you can definitely see some improvements for the LCVC X264 version. Uh, but again, it's, it's not as uh, highly visible as, as compared for the high complexity uh, games. And, and similarly for, for another low complexity game, Worms here. To further quantify the subjective results, what we decided to do was, was to do subjective test. Uh, the subjective test was done by an independent lab, uh, Vaptec, in, based in Italy, uh, which is also in, uh, involved in some of the uh, standardization test activities, right? Uh, so the test, uh, for the test, what we did was we selected uh, five co very highly complex games, right? Uh, Black Desert, Dauntless, GTA 5, Overwatch, and Tekken. Uh, the test uh, followed a methodology, ITUT uh, recommendation P809, which is the recommended test methodology for uh, gaming uh, quality evaluation. Uh, we had a pre-questionnaire where, where we collected demographics data. And if you are, again, interested in further details, please feel free to contact me uh, for all this data. Uh, the instruction for the test was given to the test subjects. We had 16 uh, test participants. Uh, the scale was 1 to 7, extended scale, uh, again, uh, recommended by the ITUT recommendation. Uh, and following uh, the environment where, where there is no distraction and, and we have gray screen and all. Uh, what we did here was we showed two videos, uh, video A uh, followed by three second gray screen and then video B. Uh, uh, the videos were from the same family of codecs, but the order could have been changed. So for example, if video A is X264, the corresponding video B would be LCVC X264, and, but, but the order can be different. And then the test participants uh, were asked to rate the videos uh, on two different scales. So this allowed us to collect ratings for both videos uh, independent, uh, separately uh, to see the MOS ratings. Uh, we used 3H uh, viewing distance, and the uh, monitor used was 24-inch uh, gaming monitor, which is, again, uh, mostly uh, very commonly used by gamers. 
now looking at the bar plot, so we have on the y-axis mean opinion score, and on the x-axis we have bitrate in, again, kilobits per second, uh, with 95% with confidence interval for X264 versus LCVC X264. What we can observe here is that LCVC actually, uh, X264 outperforms uh, uh, X264, uh, the base codec, for across all bit rates, uh, the, the savings is quite high at the lower bit rate range, so from 800 to 3000 kbps, while it, it decreases a bit at a higher bit rate, but it's still outperforming the base codec. Uh, moving on to the X265, again here, what we observe here is that uh, for 800 and 1500 kbps, LCVC X265 actually outperforms uh, X265, but at higher bit rate, the confidence in travel uh, starts to overlap, but uh, just looking at the mean, they, it actually outperforms the, the base codec. And again, this is, this is something what we observed also during when we checked the VMAF scores, right? The quality gap decreasing between the two, two codecs. Uh, here we have, again, Pearson linear correlation coefficient scores, which, which shows how, how well the objective metrics are re relating to the uh, uh, MOS ratings. We have your full, full reference metric, PSNR, uh, VMAF, SSIM, MSSIM, and one no reference metric, uh, NDNet Gaming. Again, this is a deep learning based metric which was uh, proposed by my colleagues at TU Berlin, uh, and it's, it has been trained on, on gaming content. Uh, again, it's available on GitHub, so if you're interested in evaluating. What we can see here is that uh, uh, the, the correlation score for, again, VMAF is, 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 is uh, quite high, uh, uh, and, and overall it, it does outperform the other full reference metrics, as, as my previous studies have also shown. Uh, however, NDNet Gaming, uh, again trained on VMAF scores actually, and, and especially trained for gaming content, almost reaches uh, the same performance of 0.88 correlation. Uh, it must be noted again here is that uh, NDNet Gaming is actually a no reference metric, while the other four are full reference metrics. Uh, looking at different family of codecs, uh, what we see here is the LCVC uh, family of codecs. The correlation values are a bit less, uh, and, and the same can be observed for when we are looking at the X265 family. However, uh, more or less, uh, the trends are, are consistent with, with uh, different codec groupings. What is very interesting to note here is that, especially for gaming content, where you have uh, sudden spikes in high motion, uh, because of, of the player action, like, like you are shooting and then you are running, so, and then, then you, you hide somewhere. So in this kind of uh, scenarios, uh, the quality can vary quite a lot. Uh, and here, what we are showing here is on the y-axis and the net gaming uh, quality scores from one to five. And on the x-axis, we have the frame numbers. Again, the other additional plots are available in the data set. Uh, on the red, you can see the quality score for LCVC X264 while for uh, native X264, uh, it's, it's shown in blue color. Uh, what we can observe here is that LCVC X264, the quality variation is quite less as compared to that of the native X264 uh, uh, qualities. Uh, the, this variation is, is more or less observed for across all content, and uh, this decreases uh, when considering the case for LCVC X265 and, and, and X265, and that's why the uh, observable subjective score uh, gap is, is actually not that high. Uh, to com conclude, uh, in terms of BDBR analysis, uh, LCVC definitely outperforms both the base codecs uh, when, when compared uh, to the respective families. Uh, uh, in terms of PSNR, again, the results I have not shown here. LCVC X264 outperforms X264, while X265 actually outperforms LCVC X265, but again, it's, it's uh, already well known. Uh, that a scalable codec such as LCVC doesn't perform that well for, with, with PSNR scores. So, uh, and and it's, it's, it's similar case when you are considering other uh, super visualization based uh, enhancements, right? Uh, in terms of, again, VDBR using VMAF, LCVC X264 medium preset that we saw outperforms the X265 in very fast preset mode. Uh, and, and X265 in general results almost 30% bitrate savings. Uh, in terms of MOS scores, LCVC X264 outperforms X264, uh, while with very high, good uh, significant savings at, at lower bit rates, so less than 3,000 kbps, the, the uh, results are, are, are quite promising. Uh, while for X265, uh, at, at very low bit rates, it, it performs quite well, but at higher bit rates, the uh, confidence intervals uh, starts to overlap. 
Uh, something we have observed over this work that the actual bitrate savings can be a bit uh, uh, misleading. And if you are interested in, in learning more about that, please attend my session tomorrow uh, on, on revisiting BDBR for codec compression efficiency. Uh, there are certain limitations to this work. So uh, what we observed is that for the high complexity games that we have considered, we have not reached very high subjective ratings. So uh, considering the high frame rate and high complexity of games, we should have probably considered more higher this one, uh, uh, bitrate ranges also. Uh, they, again, the subjective test was performed only on very complex games. If we are considering a mix of low and medium complexity games, the uh, results uh, and the figures that we have obtained might change. Uh, and again, which is a limitation of most of this codex, is that only we are considering here only one uh, resolution, which is the native resolution. So if we are considering uh, a Dash uh, or, or HLS-based streaming applications, uh, the, the results might be quite different. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, the team at Vinova, uh, especially uh, Gwendolina, who has been very helpful with us. Uh, helping us with, with setting up all of this, and the team, uh, Florian, Lorenzo, Harry, Lorenzo, and Simone, uh, for, for, for all their help, uh, especially with providing the SDK. Uh, again, the references are here, so the Cloud Gaming Video Data Set, uh, the tool for SITI calculation. Uh, there is an ongoing activity also on SITI, which, which have shown that many of the open source implementations are not that correct. Uh, and, and to that end, we have uh, one MATLAB-based uh, implementation here, so if you are, uh, which have been verified against the Python and the and the actual results. So if you are uh, uh, planning to use it, please please feel free to uh, use the tool provided here. Uh, the data set again, the the results files, uh, ratings, and much more uh, detailed results are available in the as part of a data set. Uh, so if you are interested, please feel free to contact me. Uh, that's all for my talk. Uh, thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for the great uh, presentation. Uh, I have t two short questions. The mm -hmm. first one is like uh, about the video streaming. Uh, I want to ask like if you when you want uh, when you want uh, when you use one request, can you? With one request, can you receive one layer, or you can receive multiple layers? Sorry, I, I didn't get your question. Is it related to like in um, when you sh uh, stream the video, mm -hmm. you need to send the request to the from the client to the server? Right? No. So the enhancement stream again. Uh, the team at Vinova might correct me if I'm wrong. The enhancement stream is sent together with the base codec uh, uh, stream. So so it's 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 not. Requested per se, per se, and again, this is uh, this is not encompassing a, a streaming solution. It's just uh, uh, coding and decoding at the uh, local device. So, so there is no actual transmission of streams here. But uh, as far as I know, the streams are already the enhancement streams are part of the uh, full bit stream syntax that they have. Ah, okay, I Correct. see. Uh, okay. So, uh, the second question is like, uh, what is? I see that there are many advantages of the um, uh, LCEVC, and what do you think um, is the um, disadvantage of this uh, codex? I would not say disadvantage, but again, this is something. If you remember the talks from yesterday, uh, most of the uh, scalable codex, like like the ones we saw uh, from the talks uh, during the startup session, where you are using super resolution and all. Uh, they are limited at very at the native resolution, so so uh, that's one of the I would say limitations of of this codex because once you go into typical adaptive streaming based scenarios where you have 360p, 480p, 720p, and 1080p, uh, the results might change because this is uh, again limiting yourself to the native uh, resolution in this case for 1080p. But once you go into multiple resolution bitrate pair, uh, the results the results might be quite different. Okay, thank you. Welcome. One addition. So one additional question. Mm -hmm. So, in uh, in your setup, you used uh, fast presets for uh, both X264 and X265. Was there any reason for that? So, so for we use uh, medium preset for X264 and LCVC X264, and because again, that's uh, given that the how do I say maturity of the codec uh, and 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 the 
uh, recommended settings also on Twitch and other uh, cloud gaming streaming providers. Uh, they they already use medium preset, so we try to replicate what ha what is actually used in the industry. So so this is trying to replicate more or less uh, practical application scenarios. Very fast preset we use for X265 because of, because it's more complex and and in order to uh, reduce the latency, uh, we use it, it in uh, a very fast preset mode. But again, we, we keep the same preset mode for the same fam uh, codex, right? So X265 and LCVC X265 both have very fast preset. So, and, and medium preset for X264 and LCVC X264. Underst uh, understood. So the, quali the quality in very fast is much, much lower than uh, uh, in any decent preset. Sorry? So the quality is not that great in that preset, so it's... Yeah, yeah, I, I know, but, but given that uh, what we are considering here is cloud gaming uh, streaming applications where uh, if you have seen the talks from previous, this one, uh, latency is a very big issue, and, and we want to uh, adhere to that, so that's why we have used it in this mode. So again, this is not, I would say, a uh, traditional codec comparison work. It's, it's more like to see if you just plug and play this into a re very real, uh, realistic, uh, say, say, in open broadcaster software, how it will perform, right? And there are many tuning parameters you can, you can adjust, like even for, for, for less complex games, you can actually go to into, uh, say, slower preset modes as compared to, say, say complex games. Uh, but, but again, these are very widely used recommended settings uh, in the gaming, this one, applications. Understood, thank you. Well. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're out of time there, but I, I believe Alex Galati is going to uh, give us some instructions for the remainder of the afternoon, so we look forward to that. Alex? So, as a, uh, as a reminder, we have a social event today. It's not, uh, it's not here, it's at uh, Mayor Wolf. Just go, uh, Google it. Uh, Google it. But overall, this is uh, I-25 and uh, Colfax about a mile away from here. Uh, you do have to, uh, uh, to get tickets. If, you're, uh, if you see uh, that uh, you're asked for a code, the code is MHV attendee. The code is basically used as means of uh, base control not to get uh, random people in there. Uh, and uh, la uh, lastly, a lot of people uh, notice that there are, pro there are problems uh, in payment. It looks like um, you can try on mobile device and uh, this, uh, fails le uh, this fails less or less frequently. So again, apologies, we have an alternatively gifted uh, registration vendor. Uh, we won't have it next year. And now to something far, uh, far more interesting, Thomas. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm not talking again, but I'm here to introduce Cyril. So we're handing on the torch. Uh, so I'm, I'm not going to introduce Cyril Langsy, but I would have a letter here I wrote for him five years ago to the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services that has like seven or eight pages. But at the end, it says, based on all of this information, I have provided this letter. I can say with absolute certainty that Dr. Concolato is an individual of extraordinary ability and he has my full support to give us the Emmy presentation tutorial number two on the ISOFAR phone. Welcome, Cyril. Uh, we're looking forward to it. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, you put the bar high. Uh, where are the slides? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay, I have them. Can you put them on the screen? So I, I don't know how long I have. It already says 20 minutes. I prepared for more than that. We'll see what, how it goes. Uh, yeah, so I want to give you, I, I've been asked to give you an introduction to ISO BMFF and CMAF, but I feel that the audience knows quite a bit already about that. So maybe just a show of hands. How many of you have looked into an ISO BMFF file and kind of know what's inside? Okay, maybe less than a half, so it could be interesting for those who don't, and maybe, I hope, for those who do, you still learn something. So, yeah, thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. I work for Netflix for a team called Encoding Technologies, um, 
And I will talk to you first about the ISO-based media file format, which is uh, formerly known as the uh, ISO IEC 14496-12 standard. Um, and it's called, it's an ME tutorial because uh, in 2020, uh, the group in MPEG, chaired by the esteemed David Singer here, uh, received this ME. And unfortunately, uh, because of the pandemic, it was never uh, celebrated properly. I hope we can do that maybe tonight with those who want. Um, so maybe uh, starting with a, a, a timeline, I, I try to dig into the history of ISO BMFF. Um, I don't know if you can read it, but let me explain. Um, if you don't know, it started in 1997. Uh, MPEG issued a call for proposal for something they called an intermedia format. And uh, several technologies were evaluated, um, and uh, the one that was selected uh, was uh, QuickTime. So QuickTime served as a basis. And then it was published initially as something called MPEG-4 Systems Part 1. So it was not the same number um, for the standard. And since then, um, it evolved quite a bit. Uh, the major milestone was in 2004 when it got split from this MPEG-4 system specification to become it, its own specification. Uh, and now it became 14496-12. At that time, it was also a shared uh, standard with JPEG for the storage of motion JPEG 2000 uh, streams. And it also uh, coincides with the, the time where AVC was uh, published to the first edition and, and also the storage of AVC uh, in 14496-15. Uh, so that was a long time ago. Uh, fast forward to now and to the Emmy. Uh, uh, we are now at the seventh edition of uh, the, this ISO standard. It grew from, I counted, 55 pages in the first uh, uh, version to 250 pages now. So that's quite a complex uh, specification. There are lots of tools. Um, and I mentioned uh, some of the specification down there that, uh, at the bottom of this slide that are relevant, but I want to highlight also that there's a, what I call a whole galaxy of derived specifications that base uh, on, on this standard. And that's probably why also it was recognized as a, as a key technology. Um, there's the part 14 of the MPEG-4 standard, which is really the so-called MP4 format, so, and particularly for the carriage of uh, MPEG-4 audio content. There's part 15 for the carriage of NAL unit uh, f uh, uh, streams, part 30 for the carriage of time text. Uh, there's common encryption, there's CMAF, there's the image file format that derives from that, and so on and so forth. So, and of course, there are other uh, standard, uh, standards organizations that uh, use that specification for like 3GPP, W3C, DVB, ATSC, and uh, AOM. Um, if you're interested and you, you want to uh, participate to the standard, uh, you're welcome. You could start with contributing to some uh, uh, of the tools that are needed, uh, conformance and reference software. Some streams are available, some software is available, but you're always welcome to participate here. And you, if you intend to use that uh, standard in your products and you develop proprietary extensions, you're, you're, happy, you're f free to do that, but there's a mechanism uh, within uh, that uh, is put in place, it's called the MP4 registration authority that you should use to register your private extensions to make sure that they don't clash in, for example, in naming with other companies or SDOs. Uh, so maybe a quick overview of what you can do with an, an MP4 file, um, and maybe also the reason why it was awarded the SEMI is th the diversity of use cases it can address. Uh, from recording on your phone to editing on an, an editing um, device to linear playback or interactive playback where you seek forward and backward to um, all the streaming or download approaches you know today. This is to, ex to say that the reason maybe uh, some say this ISO BMFF is complex or is too heavy is probably due to this diversity of use cases so you cannot have um, but you, ha you cannot have all the use cases solved and ha at the same time have a uh, small standard. So it's hard to do that. Um, so let, let me start with the basic concept. Um, those who have looked into a file, you know uh, the, that everything starts with a box. 
Um, that's the, the name of the basic structure in, a, in an MP4 file. And uh, uh, essentially a file is a sequence of boxes. Nothing is contained outside of these boxes. So you can walk, you can parse a box, go to the next one and to the next one and to the next one. And you're sure you're gonna reach the end of the file like this and you, you will be able to parse everything. Uh, the simple, so a box is what? A box is a length, a type, and a, pay, a type specific payload. So it's very simple. It's the basis of plenty of other formats than MP4. Um, it's extensible. It has been proven to be extensible. Um, and the simplest file you can find out there is a file that has three top level boxes. One is called F-type, one is called move, and one is called MDAT. And I'm gonna dig into those boxes a bit more. Uh, but know that the complex part is really the move box and that the media data is stored in the MDAT box. And I, I mentioned here two possible layouts of top level boxes depending on how your file was created, if it's ready for publication or if it's just been recorded. Um, and, and I'll dig into a bit deeper into that. But um, how, first, how you identify an, an ISO BMFF file, that's not uh, a very simple task, unfortunately. Uh, you can, of course, look at the extension, the file extension, but there are so many that it's not so straightforward. MP4, M4A, M4S, 3GP, FLV, F4V, ISM, sorry, not, not FLV, F4V, ISM, and so on. There's no magic number, so you cannot like start parsing the file and say, oh, there, it starts with these sequence of bytes and it's, it's an MP4 file. There's something similar. Um, in most of the files, the, uh, there's a box that is required at the very beginning, that's the F-type box. Um, and uh, so if, if you skip the first four bytes in the file and find then the next four bytes being the, le the ASCII code for FTYP, you can be uh, pretty sure it's an, F uh, an MP4 file. But there are cases of files that don't have those uh, or that have different um, boxes at the beginning. So that's a bit tricky. You can also rely on the MIME type. There are three MIME types for MP4. Video MP4 when it contains a video component. Audio MP4 when it contains no video component but on a, an audio component. And then application MP4 when it contains no audio nor uh, a, a video component. Um, and we talked about with Thomas with the codecs and profile so we can, I can skip that. So, when I was asked to make this presentation, um, I thought, how, how should I start? It's a 20-year-old uh, technology or more. People know about it, and uh, Iraj told me, oh, you should try to find a different way to present things, and so I tried. I tried to present it from the ground up, right? Instead of like going top to bottom, as we usually go, there's a file, there are tracks, there are things in the tracks, and so on. I, I want to start the other way. Let, let me know if it works. So assuming you want to store um, a set of video frames, here are four video frames in, in an MP4 file. There are plenty of uh, additional information that you have to store about those frames to make it easy for players and editors and tools to consume that. And uh, first, these frames, uh, we would call them samples in MP4, um, and they should not be confused with audio samples, or, or unfortunately, that's the same term. Um, and, and what you need to store, there are, again, various properties. So the first one you have to store is the sample order. Because you're editing the file, so you may be messing up with the order of the samples or order of the frames, so you want to make sure that the decoding order is pro properly provided. And in ISO BMFF, that's done with um, first providing a decode time for each frame. So here, the first frame starts at decoding time zero, then the second at decoding time one, and so on and so forth. So there's a box that would give you how to translate these numbers, these integers, into um, seconds or uh, real, real time. That's the media header box. And I'll, I'll skip how it's coded, but it's, it's, there's a specific coding to make it uh, smaller. And, but all of these information is stored in a, a box called the time to sample box, STTS. Now a player, it needs to know that the frames are in order, but it also needs to know the time associated with the, sorry, the size, and where are these frames in the file. If it wants to skip and like just extract frame number three, it needs to know where frame number three starts. So uh, you need to store size, sample sizes, and sample positions. So here I put uh, random values here almost. And 
the way it's done today is you can store a size in a box called sample size box. Actually, there are two variants if you want to use 32-bit or 64-bit sizes. So that's, that's straightforward. For position, it's a bit different because um, if you were to store the position of every single sample, you'll add eight or 64, uh, 32 or 64 bits to each frame. That's a bit of a, an overhead. So in, uh, in MP4, there's this construct of chunks where you group chunks together with the assumption that um, the the, the samples within a chunk are stored contiguously. There's nothing, so at the end of a sample starts the next sample and so on and so forth. And so instead of storing the position of each sample, you will store the position of the first sample in a chunk and then how many samples you have in the chunk. And you can determine the position of a sample within a chunk by accumulating the sizes of the previous samples in the chunk. And there are two boxes for that, the sample to chunk box and um, the uh, uh, chunk offset box and its 64-bit uh, counterpart. So that's how a file would look like. Here in this case you have uh, blue chunks and orange chunks uh, and you see the gaps between the chunks. Um, so in this case that's uh, audio and video. Uh, it's not single, tra the blue I think is audio and the orange is video. So that's how you achieve interleaving by uh, having chunks that are uh, alternating. Players also need uh, uh, additional information like where can I start playing this stream? Can I jump into one hour into the movie and start playing? Um, so you need to know random access information. And the way it's done in, in, in MP4 is by providing, a, the simplest way it's done is providing a Boolean for every single frame that's a random access. So you would code that just providing the number, the sample number of all the samples that are random access that can be decoded immediately. And that's, that's an, an addition, another box called uh, STSS. Um, bear with me, there are still a, f a few more boxes, but then we'll have all the, uh, the basic boxes. Uh, so with what we have so far, we have for each sample, we have its size, its position, we have uh, its, its timing, we have uh, um, uh, whether it's a random access point or not, but when you want to like instantiate a decoder, there are more information. Like, when you want to start playback, there are more information that you, than that that you need. And in particular, you, you want you want to know the codec. What what is the codec I, I, that I will decode? What is the width and height for a video uh, stream? What is the aspect ratio? What is the color space? What is the HDR information? What and so on and so forth. And in MP4, um, th this concept is um, uh, referred to as a sample description. So a sample description is all the properties associated with a one or more samples that are meant to be s rather constant, long, long, long time, l longer time frame. And for every sample, you would provide an index into a table, and that table gives you uh, each entry in the table is a set of property that are meant to be constant or that are meant to be constant for at least some time. So that index is the sample description entry and the box that contains that is the sample description box, the STSD. So the STSD is, so you have samples, they change every frame, the payload is different and the STSD covers multiple contiguous samples and then it changes. So this means that in a, when you store that in a file, you could potentially change the codec. You could potentially change the resolution. There's no restriction for that in ISO BMFF. We'll see that CMAF has some restrictions for that, but practically in ISO BMFF, there's none. Um, maybe I'll skip that one. Uh, you know there's frame reordering and there's another box to store frame reordering. It's called a uh, composition offset box, CTTS. Um, I'll go quickly f with the remaining boxes that I wanted to present. Uh, there's a box that's not well known, um, maybe less used also. It's the uh, subsample box. It, it decomposes a sample into subsamples. It provides basically bind ranges into individual samples to tell you how a sample is formed. So if you take an AVC sample made of NAL units, you could say, okay, the first NAL unit starts at zero and ends there, the second one starts there and continues, and so you could locate 
SCI messages, or you could locate PPSs and so on. Uh, the next one is probably very imp more important. Um, sometimes you want to associate data with every single sample, but that this data is not meant to be processed by the decoder. Uh, in the previous talk with Thomas, I mentioned post-processing or pre-processing, and those entities, they may need additional information that varies from sample to sample. The concept in ISO BMFF for that is sample auxiliary information. So sample, sample auxiliary information is attached, can be attached to every sample. And, uh, but it's not meant to be consumed by the decoder, by the same decoder. So they ha there's a four character code to identify the type of sample auxiliary information and you may have multiple sample auxiliary information attached to a, to a frame, or to a sample. In practice, it's used for encryption, for example. Initialization vector, uh, byte ranges of encrypted content inside the sample, that's how it's conveyed by uh, sample auxiliary information. And there are two boxes, SAIZ and SAIO. Last but not least, uh, there's another use case. So we saw that uh, sample has, every single sample has different information, carries different information for the decoder. We saw that you can attach uh, ad more data to be consumed with, by other entities, that's the sample auxiliary information, but it also varies. The, the coding in ISO BMFF is not made efficiently, uh, it's not taking any, it's not um, removing redundancies between two sample auxiliary information because they're meant to be very different from sample to sample. Um, and, and the sample description is meant to be long running. But what if you have a property that is shared by several samples in the stream, but they're not contiguous. Maybe the first frame and the 10th frame and the 20th frame have the same properties and all the other frames have, a, have another property. So the, 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 the tool set in ISO BMFF for that is the notion of sample group, sample groups. And there are two boxes for that. There's a sample group description box, which provides a description of parameters that are shared by multiple samples. And then there's the sample to group box that tells you, okay, for sample one, sample one belongs to group one. Sample two, uh, in my case, sample two also belongs to group one. But sample three belongs to group two, just like sample eight, in this case, that also belongs to group two. It's, it's heavily used. Uh, and it's, I would say the, the tendency in design of new codecs is to rely more and more on this tool. So the, even in the past, people would add boxes to the sample description and then they would realize, oh yeah, but what if this changes? Uh, we would have to create a new sample description index and the sample description is linked to the codex parameters, so that creates all sorts of problems. Um, so yeah, this is a tool to, to remember. Um, so essentially, if you have to remember something, is that in an MP4 file, the information attached to samples is a large table. It's a large table, um, but every single piece of information in this table is coded in a separate box, and the, each box exploits redundancy or not, and codes th to the best possible way uh, this information. And all these uh, rows and all these columns in the tables are combined in the sample table box. So that's essentially a the more interesting part of the hierarchy of boxes in an MP4 file that you, you need to look at. When you, when you inspect a file, there are plenty of boxes, we'll see a bit more later, but these are the boxes that are relevant if you want to find the information you need. And so if you've heard about an, an ISO BMFF track, like in CMAF we talk about tracks, a track is simply a concatenation of sequences that have uh, one or more um, sample descriptions. So, um, but they have to share the same media type. So I told you, you can, in, a, in a track, you can change a codec, but you cannot switch from a, video, a set of video samples to a set of audio samples in the same track. You could change from AVC to AV1 theori uh, theoretically, but uh, that's it. Uh, I'll, I'll skip that one. Now, again, building from the ground up, so we have samples, samples are grouped into, into sample descriptions, sample descriptions are grouped into tracks, and now, in, in one file, you may have one or more tracks. 
And the key point, and that, that's called a movie or a presentation. And the key uh, thing that the movie or presentation provides is synchronization, right? You, if you put multiple tracks into the same ISO BMFF file, it's because they are synchronized. You assume there is some synchronization. They, they share the same timeline. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll won't go into many details of this one, but um, there's a tool that I think that's probably the tool that creates that is the, uh, the origin of uh, all the bugs of all the implementations in MP4. Uh, it's the edit list. Yeah, agreement in the back. Um, so edit lists were introduced when, back when QuickTime was created, and the idea was to be able to edit files on the fly. You know, remove parts, reshuffle parts, and so on. Um, so it's it, you have this very complex nonlinear mapping between the track order, the track times I presented earlier, and what's finally being presented. Um, now in practice, uh, and in particular in CMath, this is highly restricted to just shifting a track forward or backward to align audio and video together. But in, in theory, you could do crazy things, really crazy things. Uh, the additional thing that the movie or presentation provides is uh, links between tracks. Um, people were talking about LCVC earlier. If you want to store LCVC in an MP4 file, you'd have two tracks. You have the basic AVC track and you have the additional track that's scalable on top of it. So you need to link the two tracks together. If you're doing um, stereoscopic video, you, need, you, you may have tracks that are not dependent on each other but they're grouped, semantically grouped together. Right? There's the left view and the right view, for example. So you can, co you can indicate th this, this grouping. Um, and also, you, you can also store in one single MP4 file all the tracks that participate in your Dash or HLS session in the same file and provide all the information that you would have in a manifest. How, how do these tracks relate? They are, are they alternate of each other? And if so, What's the quality of one? What's the quality of the other? What's the bit rate of one? What's the bit rate of the other? And so on. So the structure in the end of an MP4 file is really a complex uh, hierarchy of boxes. I told you it starts with the move box. Well, I, the, the, the hierarchy starts with the move box. We saw at the bottom here the sample table and, and its subsamples, but there are a few mod boxes that are less, less important here. I cannot talk about MP4 without talking about movie fragments, but movie fragments were not initially part of the MP4 standard, right? They, they were introduced very, uh, not late, but uh, after probably, uh, I, don't, I don't remember, maybe 10 years after or something like that, and the use case was not Dash. The use case was, oh, we have this camera, it records in MP4, but A, the move box is getting too large after a long time, and B, when we crash, when the camera crashes, we, we lost everything. We store the data, but it's garbage. We have to reparse everything. Isn't there a way to flush this smooth structure from time to time to disk so that we don't lose everything? And the way the design was made, it was reused afterwards for Dash and CMAF and HLS. But it's an afterthought, but it's, it's, it works, it works. So the idea is really that. It's, you, you flush the move content. So the move is replaced by a move, the track is replaced by a track. The chunks are replaced by runs. The concepts are exactly the same. The terminology is slightly different, but the concepts are the same. And, and obviously, we had to deal with legacy uh, devices, that, and all legacy devices needed a move box. If they don't see a move box, they will complain. So you, we, we, the, the move box was kept. So the structure is this one, right? You, you start with an F-type, you have a move. The move has an indication that the file is extended by movie fragments. That's the MVEX box for the extension. Then you have potentially data, because if you have a legacy device, you want the, that device to be able to at least read something and show maybe a 20-second clip instead of showing a two-hour movie, right? And on, after that, you flush. You flush a move, you flush the data associated to the move, and so on and so forth. I, I insist on that because that's different from Dash and, and HLS and CMAF. In Dash and HLS and CMAF, the header does not describe any sample. Everything is zero size. You have no, no duration, no size. The header is empty, basically. But in, in theory, it's possible to do non-empty headers, even if it's not, that's not used today. 
Um, I think I mentioned that the, the ISO standard has this table that shows the correspondence between what's in non-fragmented file and how you can recover the same information in, a, in, in fragmented file. Um, what's also interesting to note in, in fragmented files is that this information that we would have had in the sample table is now located in multiple places. It's located in, um, you have default information that is in the, in the move box or in the MVEX box. That's a default. And then the default can be overridden by the local movie fragment. So for example, you could say, okay, my default duration of each sample is, I don't know, 40 milliseconds, but then locally in this fragment, I'm gonna do a 20 milliseconds uh, frames. Um, and so you have this cascading of defaults. The default can be at the top level in the, movie in the movie header. It can be locally in the movie fragment header, or it can be very closely for each sample. You can override these defaults. Um, I had prepared some slides for the image file format because it's taking uh, relative importance these days with uh, Heath and also AVIF. I will probably skip them and concentrate because I have two minutes left. Just to show you that the structure of an AVIF, fi AVIF file or HEAF file is uh, quite different, but not so different. Right? It's different because there's no move. The move is replaced by a meta box, but it's not incompatible. So you could have a video track, a video file that contains at the same time an image, and that image is used as a thumbnail, you know, for uh, on your drive or, or by the player before it starts playback. By, as a poster image for uh, HTML5 uh, sites. Um, okay, so quickly, CMAF. Sorry. Sorry. Yes. Sorry, okay, I'll take five minutes. Thank you. I think you've heard about CMAF today, right? Uh, and yesterday. Um, so I'll, I'll focus maybe on, on uh, some important concepts and uh, we can discuss the details uh, offline if you want. The promise of CMAF, you know it, the promise of CMAF was to remove the duplication of content on CDNs or origins and, and avoid this TS on, wide side, on one side and MP4 on the other side. I, I, talking to a few people here in this room, uh, we have to be fair, the promise is not fully fulfilled because of this encryption issue. Uh, we still have CBCS, NC, NC flavors. But I, I think it's going in the right direction. And hopefully in the future, at least for new codecs, it's, it's the case, right? Uh, somebody mentioned that AV1 recommends using CBCS, so there's just one storage for, for AV1. Um, CMAF is a, a constant, in constant evolution. Um, where at, at the moment, the second edition has been published. But there's gonna be a third edition coming soon this year. Um, and, and basically, what changes from edition to edition, it's addition of uh, support for new codecs. Um, it started with SHVC, then we had XHEAC, then we have uh, additional profiles for HEVC, we have VVC, EVC, and, and, and now people are asking for 4K profiles of HEVC and so on. The, I would say the core uh, technical components of CMAF haven't changed from the first edition, or slightly changed, but not much. So what, what is in CMAF? If you download the standard and you, you, you read it, you'll find a few things. You'll find a set of constraints that are applied on ISO BMFF. I told you ISO BMFF was defined a long, long time ago for plenty of use cases, but in the case of uh, CMAF, we have very narrow, uh, uh, and a very narrow use case. And, uh, the way a CMAF file is identified is by the presence of a brand, and actually there are two brands, but let's forget about the, the second one. The main brand is CMFC. If you find an F-type box in the file and it contains this brand CMFC, you know it's a, a CMAF track, so that's how you identify it. And there are lots of restrictions, but uh, I think one of the restrictions is uh, that the data has to be uh, from only one track, you cannot have audio and video in the same uh, ISO BMFF file if it's CMAF compliant. If it's theoretically possible in ISO BMFF, but not in CMAF. Um, I told you that fragmentation in, in, in general allowed having move uh, data, ha ha allowed having samples described in the move. 
That's not the case in CMAF. Uh, yeah, there, there are plenty of, uh, and the way CMAF specifies that is by defining different type of objects. So there's a CMAF header, there's a CMAF track. So the CMAF header is essentially the move and it puts constraint on the move. The CMAF tracks or CMAF track file, the difference is VOD or on demand, but it's essentially a header followed by movie fragments and the movie fragments are, are constrained into CMAF fragments and you can combine CMAF fragments together in the CMAF segments that you could then uh, uh, point to from a dash manifest, for example, and then you have CMAF chunks for low latency aspects. CMAF also puts restriction on how you do encryption, for example, on the initialization vector size and so on. Um, so I, I'll, I'll skip that one, that's just what I s described. You have chunks that uh, contribute to fragments, fragments to contribute to segments, and then they form tracks or track files. The, slight, the, the only difference between tracks and track files, uh, uh, not the only difference, but one um, important difference between track files and tracks is that in track files, you're in the video ca VOD case, so you put an SIDX box in it. Uh, that's, for example, what we do at Netflix. We use this track file approach. Uh, but CMAF is not only constraints on the um, structural constraints on the ISO BMFF, it's also a set of media profiles. So we're, we're constraining what you can do in video streams, we're constraining what you can do generally in the audio streams, in time text streams, in meet, meet, metadata streams, and then specifically for a, every single codec. The idea is to reduce the, the variations and to increase interoperability. It's not always perfect, but it's, it's really going better with this. Um, examples here of uh, media profiles for AVC and AAC, you see where we're saying the levels has to be this, the uh, uh, color space information has to be that, the max frame rate, and so on. And finally, uh, I think uh, Zach touched on that in his presentation. Uh, CMAF is about defining an abstract model for uh, adaptive streaming that's at, at the same time independent of Dash and HLS, but mappable to Dash and HLS. And this, this uh, CTA wave uh, interoperability specification tries to uh, explain how to do that. Uh, but, but the idea is that you have a CMAF presentation, which is a collection of uh, switching sets. Switching sets are equivalent of uh, adaptation sets in Dash. Uh, each switching set has one or more tracks in it, and, and then the tracks can be on demand, live, made of fragments, segments, low latency chunks, and so on. And I'll stop here for questions. Thank you. Hope you understood something. Thank you, Cyril. Thank you. <laughs> so let's check any questions. Wow, it's all clear to you? <laughs> so all right. I have questions. Go ahead. That's what I'm here for. So Cyril, assuming, uh, assuming Assuming maybe you would be the new, ch you would be the chair of the file format. Mm -hmm. What would you do next? Would you do new features, or would you simplify, or would you uh, fix a few bugs, or would you work on other topics? So, what do you think is what? What is the future for the file format? I think you have to study what was done in the past and there are mistakes that were made, but there at the same time, there, uh, the success was based on the, uh, how it evolved. So you have to accept new features. Even if, it's, even if it's a pain to add new features and implement them and test them and so on, you have to, you have to accept them because you don't know what's gonna be the next killing application for, uh, for this format. So I would still, obviously welcome new contributions. But I would fix some problems that exist. Uh, first problem is interoperability, testing, conformance, software. I think we have been loose in accepting technologies that have not been implemented and tested and, and demonstrated as interoperable. Um, and then maybe, I, I, can, I, I don't know, it's difficult to simplify the standard. Um, in the past, Dave Singer has brought forward uh, MP5, which was a drastic, Limitation, uh, simplification, is it time to do that? I, I would lean on the industry to tell me if it's time to do that, but if people think it's time to do that, we, c we can certainly start that. Christian. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the tutorial. 
Um, I wonder if you can give an overview about how many boxes do you have in the <laughs> ISO-based media file format and how many are actually used? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't have the answer. I, I actually tried to do that, but because uh, of the, I, I can give you that, that answer. I'll put that on the uh, uh, Slack channel. Uh, and I'll, I'll put the ratio of the boxes that are actually used because there are not so many. Um, out of those I presented, I think all of them are used. Maybe the subs box is less used, but all, of, all the other ones would be used. But I, there are loads of boxes I didn't mention. Like, I didn't talk about hint tracks. Hint tracks had been introduced by Apple. And I, I don't think they're used anymore. Maybe wrong, prove me wrong if you use that. Um, so yeah, uh, maybe that's a simplification. You know, moving technologies that are not used into a separate standard that people don't have to look in t at it. Make it easier for people to implement and know what's useful to implement. Any more, any more questions? No. So again, Cyril, thank you very much. Very interesting. And the slides will be available. And I believe this closes the sessions and talks for today. But there is more posters. But I maybe not even authorized to say something. So. Yeah, that's fine. No, please, go ahead. <laughs> that's true. So it's not the end yet. Uh, th there is a continuation of the poster session that we had uh, earlier just across this room. And then I think the social starts at 6, Alex. Yes. Coaches at 6. OK, so we're getting closer to beer, which is good news. Thank you again. This session is closed. I see you over there or at the social. Bye-bye.